Chapter 12 Visum Ineptio The first hurdle James, Ralph and Zane faced in capturing Jackson's briefcase was simply finding a case similar enough to make the switch. It was, as Zane had suggested, a fairly basic black leather case, rather more like a doctor's bag than a briefcase. They studied it carefully at dinner on Monday evening, as it sat between the professor's black boots beneath the faculty table. It had two wooden handles at the top, a hinged brass catch, and was indeed rather beaten and scuffed. They were dismayed to discover that it had a small, tarnished brass plate riveted to one side, with T. H. Jackson engraved on it. While it was, in most respects, an almost entirely unremarkable bit of luggage, the boys soon discovered that there was not, in fact, one exactly like it to be easily found. Plenty of students and faculty had leather cases and portfolios, but they were all either too narrow, or the wrong colour, or of a rather different size or shape. By Tuesday night, they had still not found a case they could use to perform the switch. Ralph suggested that they might have to wait until the next week to perform the switch, but James was insistent that they keep trying. We don't know when they're planning to bring all the relics together, he explained. If we wait too long, they'll try it, and then we won't have access to any of the relics at all. They'll figure out they don't work and then hide them or destroy them. Ralph and Zane agreed, although it didn't get them any closer to finding an appropriate case to use for the switch. Then, Wednesday morning, the day of the technomancy class, Ralph came to the breakfast table with a manic glint in his eye. He plopped down across from Zane and James and stared at them. What? James asked. I think I found a case we can use. James's mouth dropped open and Zane audibly gulped the coffee he'd been sipping. What? Where? James asked in a harsh whisper. He had decided that they were going to have to wait after all and had been simultaneously worried and relieved. Now adrenaline shot through him. The rather wide-eyed paleness of Ralph's face indicated he was feeling the same thing. You know my friend Rufus Burton? James nodded. Yeah, another first-year Slytherin. Greasy-haired kid, right? Yeah, well, he collects rocks and stuff, calls himself a rockhound. Has a whole bunch of polished little stones arranged on a shelf by his bed, crystals and quartzes and moon sapphires and all that. I listened to him talking about it last night for almost an hour. Well, he brought all his rock hunting tools along with him to school, of course. He's got a little hammer that's a pick on one side, and a bunch of little scrapers and brushes and loads of these little cloths and polishing solutions. All right, all right, Zane said. We get the picture. Guy's a geek with tools. I'm spellbound. What's the point? Well, Ralph said, unperturbed, he carries all his tools and gear around in a case. He had it out on his bed last night. And it's the right size and shape, James prompted. Ralph nodded, still wide-eyed. It's almost perfect, even has a little plaque on the side. It has the name of the manufacturer on it, but it's in the same place as the little plaque on Jackson's case. The colour's different and the handles are ivory, but other than that... So how do we get it? James asked breathlessly. I've already got it, Ralph answered, seeming rather amazed at himself. I told him I wanted a bag to carry me books and parchments in. Told him a backpack didn't feel very, you know, slithering. He said he knew just what I meant. He said he'd got a new tool case for Christmas so I could have his old one. That's why he had it out. He was taking everything out of the old one to put it into his new case, which is bigger and has an hard dragon skin cover. Watertight, he told me. Ralph was beginning to ramble. He just said you could have it? Zane asked incredulously. Yeah, I've got to tell you, it freaked me out a bit. I mean, isn't that just a little too, I don't know, a little too much of a coincidence? Zane nodded. James grew thoughtfully determined. Where's the case now? Ralph looked a little startled. I brought it up with me, but I hid it in one of the cubby holes under the stairs. I didn't want anyone to see me with it in here, just in case. Good thinking. Come on, James said, getting up. You still want to go through with it? Ralph asked, following reluctantly. I mean, we were going to wait until next week anyway. That was only because we didn't have a choice. Well, Ralph muttered, there's always a choice. I mean, we don't have to do it this way, do we? Couldn't one of us just hide under the invisibility cloak and make the switch when Jackson's not looking? Zane shook his head. No way. There's too little room in there. Jackson would run you over doing one of his laps. If we're going to do it, this is the only way. Look, I think we're meant to do this, James said, turning to face Ralph and Zane when they got to the doorway.
If there is such a thing as destiny, then that's what put the case in your hands last night, Ralph. We can't miss this opportunity. It'd be like... like spitting in destiny's face. Ralph blinked, trying to envision that. Zane scowled thoughtfully. Sounds serious. You two still with me? James asked. Both other boys nodded. The case was still in the cubbyhole beneath the main staircase, and it was as similar to Jackson's as Ralph had described. It was a ruddy red colour, and much more scuffed from having been dragged through the dirt and rocks, but it was exactly the same size and shape, with a matching brass catch in the centre. Ralph had already stuffed his dress cloak into it, and when James opened it to check, it looked almost exactly the way the cloth inside Jackson's case had looked when it had come open that day in Franklin's classroom. Let's take it to the boys' bathroom in the upper cellars, James said, preceding the other two down the staircase. It's just down the hall from Technomancy. Do you need anything special, Zane? Just my wand and my notes, Zane answered. Horace Birch had been more than happy to explain the Visum Ineptio charm to Zane, but there'd been no opportunity for him to practice. Further, the charm would only work, if it worked at all, on anyone who didn't know the charm was in place. The result was that neither James, Ralph, nor Zane would know if the charm was working. They'd just have to trust Zane's spellwork until the switch had been accomplished and Jackson picked up the fake case. Only then, one way or another, would the effectiveness of the charm be shown. In the boys' bathroom, James plopped the case on the edge of the sink. Zane dug in his backpack for his wand and the bit of parchment he'd scribbled the Visum Ineptio incantation on. He handed the parchment to Ralph. Hold it up so that I can see it, instructed nervously. His hand was shaking visibly as he pointed his wand at the case. After a moment, he dropped his arm again. This is all screwy. Ralph's the wand master. Can't he try it? Horace taught it to you, James said impatiently. It's too late to show Ralph the wand motions. Class is in fifteen minutes. Yeah, Zane protested. But what if I can't get it to work? If Ralph gets it right, you know it'll be good enough to fool anybody. And if he gets it wrong, James insisted, we'll be picking bits of leather off the walls for the next hour. I'm standing right here, remember? Ralph said. James ignored him. You have to, Zane. You can do it. Just give it a go. Zane took a deep breath and then raised his wand again, pointing it at the bag. He looked at the parchment as Ralph held it up. Then, in a low, sing-song voice, he spoke. Light immortal speeds the eye, for understanding's vanity. Discordia, the fool's ally, make expectations guarantee. Zane flicked his wand in three small circles and then tapped the top of the case with it. There was a popping sound and a very faint ring of light appeared, emanating from the wand's tip. The ring grew, slipping down over the case. It grew fainter until it vanished. Zane let out his breath. Did it work? Ralph asked. It must have, James said. It looks the same to us, of course, but something happened, didn't it? The charm must be in place. I hope so, Zane said. Come on, we have to get to the classroom before anybody else gets there. They ran through the corridor, Zane and James watching for Professor Jackson and Ralph carrying the fake case with his winter coat draped over it. This looks stupid. Ralph rasped. I look about as casual as Grop in a tutu. James shushed him. It doesn't matter. We're almost there. They stopped outside the door to the technomancy classroom. Zane peered in, then turned back to James and Ralph. Plan B, he said under his breath. There's somebody in there. A Hufflepuff. Can't remember his name. James leaned around the corner of the door. It was a boy he vaguely recognised from Muggle Studies class. His name was Terence and he glanced up as James was looking. Hey, Terence, James called, grinning. He sauntered into the room. Behind him, he heard Ralph and Zane whispering. He tried to drown out their voices. So how was your holiday? Travel much? I guess, Terence mumbled. This is going to be harder than expected, James thought. So where did you go? I took the train to London, saw the family and everybody. Had loads of fun. You go anywhere fun? Terence turned in his seat. Went down a cork with my mum. It rained most of the trip. Saw a flute concert. James nodded encouragingly. Fortunately, Terence was seated halfway from the front, turned around towards James. 
Out of the corner of his eye, James saw Zane near Jackson's desk, positioning the fake case. Terence started to turn back towards the front of the room. A flute concert, James blurted loudly. Cool! Terence turned back. No, he said, it wasn't. Zane stood up, giving James the all-clear signal. James saw him and sighed with the relief. Oh, well, sorry to hear it, he said, backing away from Terence. Anyway, see you around. Zane and James took their planned seats in the front row. It was a small classroom, and Jackson's desk was only a couple of feet away. James scanned the front of the room, pleased to see that nothing seemed disturbed. He waited until a few more students came in, laughing and talking, and then whispered to Zane, Where is it? It's in that little corner by the blackboard. I left the cloak folded a little so it doesn't drape onto the floor. I just hope old Stonewall doesn't trip over it when he goes behind his desk. James looked into the corner that Zane indicated. It was just a shallow alcove formed where the cupboard next door butted into the room. It was unlikely that Jackson would venture there, but not impossible. Sometimes he doesn't even go behind his desk at all, James whispered. Zane gave a little lift and drop of the shoulders, as if to say, Here's hoping. A few minutes later, Professor Jackson strode into the room, carrying his ever-present leather bag. James and Zane couldn't help watching intently as he draped his cloak over the desk and settled his briefcase into its accustomed space on the floor next to his desk. "'Greetings, class,' Jackson said briskly. "'I trust you all had an instructive holiday. One can only hope you haven't forgotten everything we worked so hard to instill in your heads prior to the break. Which reminds me, please hand your essays to the left and then to the front. Mr. Walker,' I will collect them from you once you have them all. Zane nodded, his eyes bulging a bit. Both James and Zane had their wands slipped up their sleeves. If Jackson noticed, they'd just say they were carrying them that way in honor of their favorite technomancy teacher, since Jackson himself carried his in a small sheath sewn into his sleeve. Thankfully, Jackson seemed a bit preoccupied. I will be grading your essays tonight as usual, until then, let us take a sneak peek, as it were, into your cumulative understanding of the subject. Mr. Hollis, please favor us with a short definition of Hechter's Law of Displaced Inertia, if you please. Hollis, a red-cheeked first-year Ravenclaw, cleared his throat and began to offer his explanation. James barely heard him. He looked down at Jackson's case, sitting tantalizingly only a few feet away. James thought he could probably kick it if he wished to. His heart pounded, and he was filled with a horrible, icy certainty that the plan couldn't possibly work. It had been ridiculously foolhardy to think they could pull such a caper under the prow nose of Professor Jackson, and yet he knew they had to try. He felt vaguely sick with anxiety. Jackson began to pace. Unnecessarily verbose, Mr. Hollis, but relatively accurate. Miss Morganston, can you elaborate a bit regarding the transference of inertia between objects of different densities? Well, different densities respond to inertia differently, based on the proximity of their atoms, Petra answered. A ball of lead will be launched in a single direction. A ball of, say, marshmallow, will merely explode. Jackson nodded. Is there a technomancic workaround for this? Anyone? Miss Goyle? Philia Goyle lowered her hand. A binding spell coupled with the inertia transference spell will keep even low-density substances intact, sir. This has the added benefit that low-density projectiles will travel much farther and faster on a given factor of inertia than a higher-density projectile such as Miss Morganston's lead ball. True, Miss Goyle, but not necessarily beneficial. Jackson smiled humorously. A feather shot out of a cannon still won't hurt. The class laughed a little at that. Jackson was just beginning his second circuit of the room. Then, suddenly, Ralph was at the door. Excuse me, he said in a strangely gurgly voice. Everyone in the class turned except James and Ralph. I'm sorry, I seem to have a dose bleed. Ralph's nose was, indeed, bubbling blood at an alarming rate. He held his finger beneath it, and it was coated and slimy with blood. There was a chorus of oohs and ahs from the class, some amused and some disgusted. Zane wasted no time. 
As soon as he heard Ralph and saw that Jackson was turned away, heading up the right side of the classroom, he whipped his wand from his sleeve. Wingardium Leviosa, he whispered as quietly but as forcefully as he could. The invisibility cloak became visible the moment it whipped up, floating off the fake briefcase in the corner. Zane held it there as James fumbled his own wand out. Behind them, they heard Jackson speaking to Ralph. Good heavens, boy, hold still. I'm sorry, Ralph stammered. I meant to get a cough lozenge, and I ate one of those weirdly dosebly nuggets instead. I have to get to the hospital wing, I think. James pointed his wand at the fake briefcase and whispered the levitation charm. The case was much heavier than anything James had levitated before, and he wasn't very good at it under the best of circumstances. The case scuttled on the floor, dragging by a corner. He moved it as close to the real case as possible, knocking the real case aside and partially under the desk. He gasped and then caught his breath. Behind him, the students were laughing and making disgusted noises. Good grief! You don't need the hospital wing, Jackson said, becoming annoyed. Just stand still and move your finger. Ralph began to sway on his feet. I think I'm a hemophilian, he yelled. That had been Zane's idea. You're not a hemophiliac, Jackson growled. Now, for the last time, hold still. James flicked his wand, trying to move the real case around the fake one. It was imperative that he move it into the corner and hide it under the invisibility cloak Zane was still levitating. The real case was stuck, however, wedged under a corner of the desk. James concentrated mightily. The briefcase levitated under the desk, pushing the corner of the desk up with it. James grimaced, lowering his wand, and both the case and the desk clunked to the floor. Nobody seemed to notice. Zane was looking at James wild-eyed. James made a grimace of helplessness. Desperately, Zane made to lower the invisibility cloak onto the real case where it was wedged under the desk. Somehow, however, the cloak had also become snagged, caught on a coat hook next to the blackboard. Nothing was going as planned. If anyone turned around now, there would be no hope of covering their tracks. James couldn't resist glancing around. Ralph's nose was still pattering blood. Jackson was half-squatted in front of him, one hand on Ralph's arm, trying to pull Ralph's finger away from his nose, the other holding the hickory wand at the ready. The entire class was watching in various shades of amusement and revulsion. Drat it, boy! You're making a mess! Move your finger, I tell you! Jackson exclaimed. James tried to free the real briefcase by working it back and forth with his wand. He was sweating and his wand hand was slick. The case finally came free just as James heard Jackson say, Artemisai! Oh! Ralph said rather unnecessarily loudly. There! Yeah! That's much better. It would have been better a minute ago if you'd have listened to me, Jackson said crossly, poking his wand back into his sleeve. The scene was over. Zane gave a final yank on his wand. The invisibility cloak popped loose from the coat hook and dropped to the floor in a heap, which promptly vanished. James had no time to hide the briefcase. He sensed the class turning back towards the front of the room. Please go and wash yourself, young man. Jackson was saying, his voice becoming louder as he dismissed Ralph and turned towards the front of the room. You're an awful sight. People will think you've been mauled by a quintiped. Under his breath, he added, Nosebleed, Nugar. Desperately, James stashed his wand back up his sleeve. Zane, in an act of pure split-second inspiration, shot his legs forward from underneath the desk. He grasped the real briefcase between his ankles, then yanked it back beneath his own desk. James heard the scuffling as Zane tried to stuff the case beneath his chair, using only his feet. Jackson stopped next to Zane, and the room became very quiet. James tried not to look up. He had the strongest sensation that the professor was looking down at him. Finally, helplessly, he raised his eyes. Jackson was indeed looking down the length of his nose, his gaze moving thoughtfully between Zane and James. James's stomach plummeted. Finally, after what felt like an eternity, Jackson continued to the front of the room. Honestly, he said to the class in general, the length some of you will go to skip a class. It astounds someone even as cynical as myself. At any rate, where were we then? Ah, yes.
The class wore on. James refused to meet Jackson's eyes. His only hope was to get out of the classroom as quickly as possible. There was no way to collect either the real briefcase or the invisibility cloak while Jackson was still there. Just possibly, however, Jackson wouldn't see his own case stuffed beneath Zane's chair. Everything rested, of course, on the effectiveness of Zane's vism ineptio charm. James looked down at the false briefcase sitting on the floor, approximately where the real one had been. To his eye, it looked completely fake, its leather a different colour, and its brass plate reading Hiram and Blatwatt's Leathers, Diagon Alley, London, instead of T. H. Jackson. Jackson had obviously sensed something, but if the charm worked, there was still the slightest chance they could pull it off. Class finally concluded. James jumped up, herding Zane ahead of him. Zane shot him a look of pure consternation, his eyes darting towards the base of his chair, but James pushed him onwards, shaking his head minutely. The class pressed towards the door, and James and Zane, having been seated in the front row, were stuck at the rear of the small throng. James was terrified to look back. Finally, the wall of shoulders and backpacks broke apart, and James and Zane tumbled into the hallway. "'What are we going to do?' Zane whispered frantically as they trotted down the corridor. "'We'll come back later,' James said, struggling to keep his voice low and calm. "'Maybe he won't see anything. He was packing up the essays when we left. "'If we just hang back here around the corner, we can watch—' "'Mr. Potter,' a voice said imperiously from behind them. "'Mr. Walker!' The two boys stopped in their tracks. They turned very slowly. Professor Jackson was leaning out of the door of the technomancy classroom. I believe you two may have left something in my classroom. Would you care to come collect it? Neither answered. They walked heavily back the way they had come. Jackson disappeared into the classroom again and was waiting behind the front desk when they got there. Come closer, boys, Jackson said in a breezy voice. Just right here in front of the desk, if you please. Placed on the desk in front of Jackson were both the real and fake briefcases. When James and Zane got to the front of the desk, Jackson spoke again, this time in a low, cold voice. I don't know who's been telling you stories about what I keep in my attaché, but I can assure the both of you that yours is neither the first nor even the most creative attempt to find out for certain. James raised his eyebrows in surprise, and Jackson nodded at him. Yes, I have heard the tales that some of my students have invented. Stories of horrible dormant beasts, or doomsday weapons, or keys to alternate dimensions, each more terrible and mind-boggling than the last. Let me assure you, though, my terminally curious little friends. Here Jackson leaned over his desk, bringing his nose less than a foot from the two boys' faces. He lowered his voice further and spoke very clearly. That which I keep hidden in my attaché is far, far worse than even your fevered imaginings can contrive. This is not a joke. I am not making idle threats. If you attempt to meddle with my affairs again, you will likely not live to regret it. Am I making myself perfectly clear? James and Zane nodded, speechless. Jackson continued to stare at them, breathing through his nose in obvious fury. Fifty points from Gryffindor and fifty points from Ravenclaw. I'd give you both detentions, except that might lead to questions about this case of mine that I do not wish to answer. Therefore, let me finish by saying, my young friends, that even if you do not so much as look at my attaché ever again— I can still choose to make your lives extremely interesting. Please do bear that in mind. Now, he stood back, lowering his eyes, take this pathetic little ruse and be gone. With palpable disgust, Jackson shoved his bag at them with the back of his hand. The fake bag remained sitting in front of him. He laced the knuckly fingers of his right hand through the ivory handles and hefted it. The brass plate that read Hiram and Blatwatt's Leathers, Diagon Alley, London, glinted dully as Jackson moved around the desk. Neither James nor Zane could quite bring themselves to touch the case in front of them. 
Well? Jackson demanded, raising his voice. Take that thing and be gone! Yes, sir, Zane stammered, grabbing the professor's bag and pulling it off the desk. He and James turned and fled. Three corridors later, they stopped running. They stood in the middle of an empty hall and looked at the bag Jackson had insisted they take. There was no question about it. It was the professor's own black leather briefcase. The nameplate shone clearly, T. H. Jackson. James began to grasp that somehow, amazingly, they had succeeded. They had captured the robe of Merlin. It was the Visimineptro charm, Zane breathed, glancing up at James. It had to be. Jackson knew we were up to something, but he didn't expect that. James was completely bewildered. How, though? He had both bags right in front of him. Well, it's pretty simple, really. Jackson assumed we were trying to swap the cases, but that we hadn't gotten around to it yet. He found the case under my chair and believed it was the fake one. The Visum Ineptio charm on the fake briefcase worked on both briefcases, letting him see what he expected to see. That's how it preserved the illusion that the fake case was the real one. Understanding dawned on James. The fool the eye charm extended to the real briefcase, making it look like the fake one, since that's what Jackson expected. That's brilliant! James clapped Zane on the shoulder. Nice one, you goon! And you doubted yourself? Zane looked uncharacteristically humble. He grinned. Come on, let's go find Ralph and make sure he's okay. You really think you needed to eat two of those nosebleed nougar? You're the one that said we needed a diversion. James stuffed Jackson's briefcase under his robe, clutching it under his arm, and the two boys ran to find Ralph, stopping only long enough to collect the invisibility cloak from the floor of the empty technomancy classroom. Five minutes later, the three boys clambered up to the Gryffindor common room, rushing to hide Jackson's briefcase before their next class. James buried it in the bottom of his trunk, then Zane produced his wand. Just learned this new spell from Jennifer, he explained. It's a special kind of locking spell. Wait. James stopped Zane before he could cast the spell. How will I get it open again? Oh, well, I don't know, to tell you the truth. It's the counter spell to Aloha Mora. I wouldn't think it'd work against the owner of the trunk, though. Just anybody else. Spells are smart that way, aren't they? Here, Ralph said, crossing the room. He opened and closed the window, then stood back. Try it on the window latch. You don't need that open anyway. It's dead cold out there. Zane shrugged and then pointed his wand at the window. Collo Portis! The window lock clacked shut. Well, it works all right, Ralph observed. Now try to open it. Zane, wand still raised, said, Aloha Mora! The lock jiggled once but remained locked. Zane pocketed his wand. You try it, James. It's your window, isn't it? James used the same spell on the window lock. The lock unhinged neatly, and the window swung open. See? Zane grinned. Spells are smart. I bet old Stonewall could tell us how that works, but I'm not going to be asking him any more questions, I'll tell you that. James closed his trunk with Jackson's case inside, and Zane performed the locking spell on it. On the way back down to their classrooms, Ralph asked, Won't somebody else notice that Jackson's carrying a different briefcase? What if one of the other teachers asks him about it? Nothing's going to happen, Ralphinator, Zane said confidently. He's been carrying that thing long enough that everyone expects to see him with it. As long as they expect to see his case in his hand, the Visum Ineptio charm will make sure that is what they see. We're the only ones that'll see that it's your buddy's old rockhound bag. Ralph still seemed worried. Will the charm wear off over time? Or will it work as long as people think that the fake case is the real one? Neither James nor Zane knew the answer to that. We just have to hope it lasts long enough, James said. Chapter 13 Revelation of the Robe That evening after dinner, the three boys ran up to the Gryffindor sleeping quarters again, pausing only when James noticed the staring woman in the background of a painting of some maidens milking a pair of ridiculously plump cows. He berated the tall and ugly woman who was dressed like a nun, demanding to know what she was looking at. 
After half a minute, Zane and Ralph got impatient and each grabbed one of James's elbows, dragging him away. In the sleeping quarters, they clustered around James's trunk while James unlocked it and pulled out Jackson's case. He set it on the edge of his bed and the three of them stared at it. Do we have to open it? Ralph asked. James nodded. We have to know we have the robe, don't we? It's been driving me crazy all day. What if I was wrong and the thing in there is just some of Jackson's laundry? I can't help thinking that he's the sort that'd carry around a totally meaningless briefcase just to get people talking about it. You should have seen how he was this morning when he thought he'd caught Zane and me. He was really mad. Zane plopped onto the bed. What if we can't even open it? Can't be that much of a lock if it popped open that day in DADA, James reasoned. Ralph stood back, giving James room. Let's get it over with then. Try and open it. James approached the case and tried the lock. He'd expected it not to work and was prepared to try the assortment of opening and unlocking spells the three had collected. Instead, the brass catch on top of the case popped open easily, so easily, in fact, that James was momentarily sure it had clicked open a split second before he'd actually touched it. He froze, but neither of the other two boys seemed to have noticed. Well, Ralph whispered, Zane leaned over the case. The mouth of it had come open slightly. Can't see anything in there, Zane said. It's too dark. Open the rotten thing, James. It's yours more than either of ours. James touched the case, grasped the handles, and used them to pull it open. He could see the folds of black cloth. A vague, musty smell wafted from the open case. James thought it smelled like the inside of a pumpkin a week after Halloween. He remembered Luna saying the robe had once been used to cover the body of a dead king, and he shuddered. Zane's voice was low and slightly hoarse. Is that it? I can't tell what it is. Don't, Ralph warned, but James had already reached into the case. He pulled the robe out. The cloth unfolded smoothly, spotlessly black and clean. There seemed to be acres of it. Ralph backed further away as James let the robe pool on the floor at his feet. The last of it came out of the case, and James realized he was holding the hood of it. It was a large hood, with golden braids at the throat. Zane nodded, his face pale and serious. That's it, no doubt. What are we going to do with it? Nothing, Ralph answered firmly. Stick it back in the case, James. That thing's scary. You can feel the magic of it, can't you? I bet Jackson put some kind of shield charm or something on the case to contain it. Otherwise somebody would have felt it. Go on, put it away. I don't want to touch it. Hold on, James said vaguely. He could indeed feel the magic of the cloak, just as Ralph had said, but it didn't feel scary. It was powerful, but curious. The smell of the robe had changed as James pulled it out. What had at first smelt faintly rotten now smelled merely earthy, like fallen leaves and wet moss. Wild, even exciting. Holding the robe in his hands, James had the most unusual sensation. It was as if he could feel, in the deepest pit of his being, the very air in the room, filling the space like water, streaming through cracks in the frame of the window, cold like ice-blue vapour. The sensation expanded, and he sensed the wind moving around the turret that housed the sleeping quarters. It was alive, swirling over the conical roof, channeling into missing shingles and exposed rafters. James faintly remembered children's stories about how Merlin was a master of nature, how he felt it and used it, and how it obeyed his whims. James knew he was tapping into that power somehow, as if it was embedded in the very fabric of the relic robe. The sensation grew and spiralled. Now James felt the creatures of the deepening evening, the pattering heartbeats of mice in the attics, the blood-purple world of the bats in the forest, the dreaming haze of a hibernating bear, even the dormant life of the trees and grass, their roots like hands clutched in the earth, clinging to life in the dead of winter. James knew what he was doing, but didn't seem to be operating his own arms. He raised the hood, turning himself into it. The robe slid over his shoulders, and just as the hood settled over his head, hiding his eyes, 
James heard the alarmed and warning cries of Zane and Ralph. They were fading as if down a long, sleepy tunnel. They were gone. He was walking, leaves crunched under his feet, which were large and shoeless, tough with calluses. He breathed in, filling his lungs, and his chest expanded like a barrel. Big he was, tall with muscled arms that felt like coiled pythons and legs as thick and sturdy as tree trunks. The earth was quiet around him, but alive. He felt it through the soles of his feet when he walked. The vibrancy of the forest streamed into him, strengthening him, but there was less of it than there should be. The world had changed and was still changing. It was being tamed, losing its feral wildness and strength. Alongside it, his power was dimming as well. He was still unmatched, but there were blind spots in his communication with the earth, and those blind spots were growing, shutting him off bit by bit, reducing him. The realms of men were expanding, scouring the earth, passing it into meaningless plots and fields, breaking up the magic polarities of the wilderness. It angered him. He had moved among the growing kingdoms of men, advised and assisted them, always for a price, but he hadn't foreseen this result. His magical brothers and sisters were no help. Their magic was different than his. That which made him so powerful, his connection to the earth, was also becoming his only weakness. In a cold rage he walked. As he passed, the trees spoke to him, but even the woodsy voices of the naiads and the dryads were dimming. Their echo was confused and broken, divided. Ahead of him, revealed only in the moonlight, a clearing opened, surrounding a stony depression in the earth. He descended into the center of the depression and looked up. The glittering night sky poured into the bowl-shaped clearing, painting everything bone-white. His shadow pooled beneath him as if it were noonday. There was no place for him in this world any more. He would leave the society of men, but he would return when things were different, when circumstances had changed, when the world was again ripe for his power. Then he would reawaken the earth, revive the trees and their spirits, refresh their power and his with it. Then would be a time of reckoning. It might be decades or even centuries. It might even be eternity. It didn't matter. He could stay in this time no longer. There was a noise, a scuffle of clumsy footsteps nearby. Someone else was there in the clearing with him, someone he hated but whom he needed. He spoke to this person, and as he did, the world began to dim, to darken, to fade. Instruct those that follow. Keep my vestments, station and talisman at the ready. I will await. At the hall of Elder's Crossing, when my time of returning is come, assemble them again, and I will know. I have chosen you to safeguard this mission, Ostromadux, for as my last apprentice, your soul is in my hand. You are bound to this task until it is complete. Vow to me your oath. Out of the descending darkness, the voice spoke only once. It is my will and my honor, master. There was no answer. He was gone. His robes dropped to the earth, empty. His staff balanced for a moment, then fell forward and was caught in an eerily white hand, the hand of Ostromadox, before it could hit the rocky ground. Then even that scene vanished. The darkness compressed to a dwindling point, the universe leapt up, monstrous and spinning, and there was only oblivion. James forced his eyes open and gasped. His lungs felt flattened, as if he hadn't had breath in them for several minutes. Hands grasped him, yanking the hood back and pulling the robe off his shoulders. Weakness stole over James, and he began to collapse. Zane and Ralph caught him awkwardly and heaved him onto his bed. What happened? James asked, still dragging in great gulps of air. You tell us, Ralph said, his voice high and frightened. 
Zane was stuffing the robe roughly back into the briefcase. You put this crazy thing on and then pop! Off you went! Not what I'd have called a wise choice, you know! <gasps> I blacked out? James asked, recovering enough to get his elbows beneath him. Ralph said, Blacked out nothing! You up and disappeared! Poof! It's true, Zane nodded, seeing James' stunned expression. You were clean gone for three or four minutes. Then he showed up. Zane indicated the corner behind James's bed with a worried nod. James turned, and there was the semi-transparent form of Cedric Diggory. The ghost looked down at him, then smiled and shrugged. Cedric seemed rather more solid than the last few times James had seen him. Zane went on. He just appeared through the wall as if he had come looking for you. Ralph here shrieked like, well... I'd say like you'd just seen a ghost, but considering we have breakfast with ghosts most mornings and a history class with one every Tuesday, the phrase doesn't seem all that impressive anymore. Ralph spoke up. He took one look at us, then the briefcase, and then he just sort of thinned out. Next thing we know, you're back just where you'd been, looking white as a statue. James turned back to the ghost of Cedric. What did you do? Cedric opened his mouth to speak, tentatively and carefully. As if from a long way off, his voice seeped into the room. James couldn't tell if he was hearing it with his ears or his mind. You were in danger. I was sent. I saw what was happening when I got here. What was it? James asked. The experience was murky in his memory, but he sensed he'd remember more when the magic of it wore off. A threshold marker. A powerful bit of magic. It opens a dimensional gateway designed to communicate a message or secret over a great time or distance. But its strength is careless. It almost swallowed you up. James knew that was true. He had felt it. In the end, the darkness had been consuming, seamless. He swallowed past a hard lump in his throat and asked, H How did I get back? I found you, Cedric said simply. I dipped into the ether where I have spent so much time since my death. You were there, but you were far off. You were going. I chased you and returned with you. Cedric, James said, feeling stupid for putting on the robe and terrified at what had almost happened. Thanks for bringing me back. I owed you that. I owed your father that. He brought me back once. Hey, James said suddenly, brightening. You can talk now. Cedric smiled, and it was the first genuine smile James had seen on the ghostly face. I feel different, stronger, more here somehow. Wait, Ralph said, raising a hand. This is the ghost you told us about, isn't it? The one that chased the intruder off the grounds a few months ago. Oh, yeah, James said. Zane, Ralph, this is Cedric Diggory. Cedric, these are my friends. So what do you think is happening to you? What's making you more here? Cedric shrugged again. For what seemed like a long time, I felt like I was in a sort of dream. I moved through the castle, but it was empty. I never got hungry, or thirsty, or cold, or needed to rest. I knew I was dead. That was all. Everything was dark and silent, and there didn't seem to be any days or seasons. No passage of time at all. Then things began to happen. Cedric turned and sat on the bed, making no mark on the blankets. James, who was closest, could feel a distinct chill emanating from Cedric's form. The ghost continued. For periods of time, I started to feel more aware. I began to see people in the halls, but they were like smoke. I couldn't hear them. I came to realize that these periods of activity happened in the hours of the day right after my time of death. 
Each night I'd feel myself awaken. I noticed the time because that was the thing that meant the most. The sense of minutes and hours passing. I searched out a clock, the one just outside the great hall, and watched the time go by. I was most awake throughout the night, but by each morning I'd begin to fade. Then, one morning, just as I was thinning, losing touch, I saw him. James sat up straight. The intruder? Cedric nodded. I knew he wasn't supposed to be here, but somehow I knew that if I tried, I could make him see me. I scared him away. Cedric grinned again, and James thought he could see in that grin the strong and likable boy that his dad had known. But he came back, James said. Cedric's grin turned into a scowl of frustration. He came back, yes, I saw him, and I scared him off again. I started to watch for him in the mornings, and then one night he broke in through a window. I was stronger then but I decided someone else needed to know he was inside the castle. So I came to you, James. You had seen me, and I knew who you were. I knew you'd help. That was the night you broke the stained glass window? Zane said, smiling. Kicked that guy through it like Bruce Lee? Nice! Who was he? James asked, but Cedric merely shook his head. He didn't know. So it's almost seven o'clock now, Ralph pointed out. How are you making us see you? Isn't this your weakest time? Cedric seemed to think about it. I'm getting more solid. I'm still just a ghost, but I seem to be becoming sort of more of a ghost. I can talk more now, and there is less and less of that strange nothing time. I think that this is just how ghosts are made. But why? James couldn't help asking. What makes a ghost happen? Why didn't you just, you know, move on? Cedric looked at him closely, and James sensed that Cedric himself didn't know the answer to that question, or at least not very clearly. He shook his head slightly. I wasn't done yet. I had so much to live for. It happened so fast, so suddenly. I just wasn't done. Ralph picked up Professor Jackson's case and threw it back into James's trunk. So where did you go when you popped off, James? he said, heaving himself onto the end of the bed. James took a deep breath, collecting his memories of the strange journey. He described the initial feeling of holding the cloak, how it seemed to allow him to sense the air and the wind, then even the animals and the trees. Then he told them about the vision he'd had of being inside Merlin's body, in his very thoughts. He shuddered, remembering the anger and bitterness and the voice of the servant Ostromadox, who vowed his oath to serve until the time of reckoning was come. He recalled it vividly as he spoke, finishing by describing how the blackness of the night had wrapped around him like a cocoon, shrinking and turning to nothingness. Zane listened with intense interest. It makes sense, he finally said in a low, awed voice. What? James asked. How Merlin might have done it, don't you see? Professor Jackson himself talked about it on our first day of class. He was getting excited. His eyes were wide, darting from James to Ralph to the ghost of Cedric, who was still seated on the edge of the bed. Ralph shook his head. I don't get it. I don't have technomancy this year. Merlin didn't die, Zane said emphatically. He disapparated. James was puzzled. That doesn't make sense. Any wizard can apparate. What's so special about that? Remember what Jackson told us that first day? Apparition is instantaneous for the wizard who's doing it. Even though it takes a little time for the wizard's bits to fly apart, then reassemble at a new place. If a wizard disapparates without determining his new center point, he never reapparates at all, right? He just stays stuck in nothingness forever. Well, sure, James agreed, remembering the lecture, but failing to see the point. 
Zane was nearly vibrating with excitement. Merlin didn't disapparate to a place, he said meaningfully. He disapparated to a time and a set of circumstances. Ralph and James boggled, considering the implications. Zane went on. At the end of your vision, you said Merlin told Ostromatics to keep the relics and to watch for the time to be right. Then when the time came, the relics were supposed to be gathered again at the Hall of Elders Crossing. You see? Merlin was setting up the time and circumstances for his reapparition. What you described at the very end, James, was Merlin disapparating into oblivion. Zane paused, thinking hard. All these centuries, he's just been suspended in time, stuck in everywhereness, waiting for the right circumstances for his reapparition. To him, no time has passed at all. Ralph looked at the trunk at the end of James's bed. Then it's for real, he said. They could actually do it. They could bring him back. Not anymore, James said, smiling mirthlessly. We've got the robe. Without all the relics, the circumstances won't be right. They can't do anything. As soon as James had heard Zane explain it, it made perfect sense, especially in the context of the threshold marker vision. Suddenly, his possession of the robe had become even more important, and he couldn't help wondering at the remarkable series of lucky circumstances that had led to them obtaining it. From the briefcase Ralph had discovered in just the nick of time to Zane's remarkably effective Visum Ineptia charm, James had the strongest sense that he, Zane and Ralph were being guided in their goal of thwarting the Merlin plot. But who was helping them? By the way, James said to the ghost of Cedric, once Ralph and Zane had fallen into an animated discussion about Merlin's disapparition, you said you were sent to help me. Who sent you? Cedric had stood and was fading a bit, but not much. He smiled at James and said, Someone I'm not supposed to mention, although I think you can probably guess. Someone who's been watching. Snape, thought James. The portrait of Snape had sent Cedric to help him when he'd got sucked into the threshold marker. But how had he known? James thought about that for a long time after Zane and Ralph had headed back to their own rooms, long after the rest of the Gryffindors had climbed the stairs and plopped into their beds. No answer came that night, however, and eventually James slept. For the next several days, the three boys went about their normal school activities in a sort of triumphant fog. James left Jackson's bag with the relic robe inside locked in his trunk and protected with Zane's locking spell. Considering the effectiveness of the Visum Ineptio charm on the fake case, they had no serious concerns that anyone would even be looking for the real briefcase. Jackson continued to carry the old red rockhound bag with the Hiram and Blatwatts label on it to classes and meals, with no indication that he thought anything was out of the ordinary. Furthermore, no one else spared it a second glance, even though Jackson had been seen carrying the black case with his nameplate on the side for months. Finally, on Saturday afternoon, James, Ralph and Zane met in the Gryffindor common room to discuss their next steps. There are really only two questions now, Zane said, leaning over the table upon which they were ostensibly doing their homework. Where is the Hall of Elders Crossing? And where is the third relic, Merlin's staff? James nodded. I've been thinking about that last one. The throne is under the guard of Madame Delacroix. The robe was under the guard of Professor Jackson. The third relic must be under the guard of the third conspirator. My guess is it's somebody else here on the grounds, an inside person. What if it's the Slytherin who used the name Ostromaddox on Ralph's game deck? They'd have to be aware of the plot if they used that name, and if they're aware of it, they're in on it. But who? Ralph asked. I didn't see who took it. It was just gone. Besides, the staff of Merlin would be pretty hard to hide, wouldn't it? If he was as big as you said he was in your vision, James, then the thing must be six feet tall if it's an inch. How do you hide a six-foot magical lightning rod like that? James shook his head. I haven't the foggiest. Still, it's up to you to keep a lookout, Ralph. Like Ted said, you're our inside man. Ralph slumped. Zane doodled on a piece of parchment. So what about question one? He said without looking up. Where is the Hall of Elders Crossing? James and Ralph exchanged blank looks. 
James said, no clue again, but I think there's a third question we need to think about too. As if the first two weren't tricky enough, Ralph muttered. Zane glanced up and James saw he was doodling the gate to the grotto keep. What's the third question? Why haven't they done it yet? James whispered. If they believe they have all three relics, why haven't they just gone on down to wherever this Hall of Elders crossing is and tried to call Merlin back from his thousand-year disapparition? None of them had any answers, but they agreed it was an important question. Zane flipped his doodle over, revealing a drabble of scribbled notes and diagrams from arithmancy class. I'm checking the Ravenclaw Library, but between homework, classes, Quidditch, debate, and Constellations Club, I hardly have two minutes left to rub together. Ralph dropped his quill on the table and leaned back, stretching. Uh, how's that coming, anyway? You're the only one with any contact with Madame Delacroix. What's she like? Like a gypsy mummy with a pulse. Zane replied. She and Trelawney are supposed to be sharing Constellations Club, like Divination Class, but they've started trading on and off instead of teaching it together. Works a lot better, since they sort of cancel each other out anyway. Trelawney just had to sketch astrological symbols and look at the planets through the telescope to ascertain the moods and manners of the planetary brethren. James, who knew Sybil Trelawney as a distant family friend, grinned at Zane's affectionate impression of her. Zane went on. Delacroix, though, she has us plotting star charts and measuring the color of starlight wavelengths, working out the exact timing of some big astronomical event. Oh, yeah, James remembered. The alignment of the planets. Petra and Ted told me about that. They're in divination with her. Seems like the voodoo queen's really into that kind of stuff. She's the anti-Trelawney, that's for sure. With her, it's all math and calculations. We know the date it'll happen, but she wants us to factor out the exact timing right down to the minute. Pure busy work, if you ask me. She's a little kooky about it. She's kooky in general, if you ask me, Ralph stated. I think she might be on to us, James said in a hushed voice. I've seen her looking at me sometimes. Zane raised his eyebrows and pointed at his eyes. She's blind, if you remember. She's not looking at anything, mate. I know, James said, undeterred. But I swear that she knows something. I think she has ways of seeing that don't have anything to do with her eyes. Let's not freak ourselves out, Ralph said quickly. This is freaky enough already. She can't know anything. If she did, she'd act on it, right? So forget about her. The next day, James and Ralph went to visit Hagrid in his cabin, ostensibly to inquire after Grawp and Prechka. Hagrid was rebuilding the wagon Prechka had accidentally destroyed and was glad of the break. He invited them in and served them tea and biscuits while he warmed himself by the fire, Trife lying over his feet and occasionally licking Hagrid's lowered hand. Oh, it's all ups and downs for them. Hagrid said, as if the tumults of giant courtship were a quaint mystery. They fought for a while over the holiday. Lovers spat over an elk carcass. Grawpy wanted the head, but Pretchker wanted to make the antlers into a bit of jewellery. Ralph took a break from blowing steam off his tea. She wanted to make jewellery out of elk antlers. Well, I say jewellery, Hagrid said, raising his huge palms. It's a tricky concept. Giants use the same sound for jewellery and weapons. Comes to the same thing when you're twenty feet tall, I suppose. Anyway, they worked that all out, and now they're happy as can be again. James asked, Is she still living up in the foothills, Hagrid? Course she is, Hagrid said, a little reproachfully. She's an honourable girl, is Pratchker, and Grop. Why, he bides his time in his oval most days. Got himself a right nice fire pit and a lean-to of birches. These things take time. Giant love is, well, it's a delicate thing, don't you know? Ralph coughed a little in his tea. Hey, Hagrid, James said, changing the topic. You've been around Hogwarts for a long time. You probably know lots of secret stuff about the school and the castle, don't you? Hagrid settled into his chair. Well, course, 
Nobody knows the grounds as well as myself, except maybe Yargus Filch. I started out as a student, I did. A ways back before even your dad was born. James knew he had to be very careful. Yeah, that's what I thought. Tell me, Hagrid, if somebody had something really magical they wanted to hide in the castle somewhere... Hagrid stopped patting Trife. He turned his great shaggy head towards James slowly. And what would a first-year pup like yourself be needing to hide, might I ask? Oh, not me, Hagrid, James said quickly. Somebody else. I'm just curious. Hagrid's beetle-black eyes twinkled. I see. And this somebody else. I'm wondering what they might be up to then, hiding secret magical items here and there. Ralph took a large, deliberate sip of his tea. James looked out the window, avoiding Hagrid's suddenly penetrating gaze. Oh, you know, nothing particular. I was just wondering. Ah, Hagrid said, smiling slightly and nodding. You've been told a lot of stories about old Hagrid from your dad and Aunt Hermione and Uncle Ron, I'm guessing. Hagrid used to let slip some details that maybe he was supposed to keep secret. It's true, too. I can be a bit thick sometimes, forgetting what I should and shouldn't be saying. You may recall stories about a certain dog called Fluffy, among others, yes? Hagrid studied James intently for a few moments and then heaved a great sigh. James, I'm a good bit older than I was then. Old keepers of the keys don't learn much, but we do learn. Besides, your dad clued me in in that you might be getting up to Dickens and asked me to keep an eye out for you. Soon as he'd noticed you'd, uh, borrowed his invisibility cloak in the Marauder's map, that was. What? James blurted, turning so quickly he almost knocked over his tea. Hagrid's bushy eyebrows rose. Oh, well, there you go, then. I don't suppose I was meant to tell you that. He frowned thoughtfully, then seemed to dismiss it. Ah, well, he didn't actually tell me not to mention it. James sputtered. He knows? Already? James, Hagrid laughed. Your dad's the head of the order department, in case you forgot. Talked to him about it last week, right in me own fire, here. What he's most curious about is whether or not you've got the map to work yet, since so much of the castle's been rebuilt. He forgot to test it when he was here. So had any luck, then? In the adventure of capturing the Merlin robe, James had completely forgotten about the Marauder's map. Sulkily, he told Hagrid that he hadn't tried it yet. Probably for the best, you know, Hagrid replied. Just because your dad knows you necked it doesn't mean he's happy about it. And as far as I was able to gather, your mum don't know nothing about it yet. If you're lucky, she won't, neither. Though I can't imagine your dad keeping that kind of secret from her for long. Best just to keep your contraband packed away rather than hiding it anywhere on the grounds. Trust me, James. Keeping suspicious magical items around the school can cause a lot more trouble than it's worth. On the way back to the castle, bundled against the windy cold, Ralph asked James, What's he mean about getting the map to work? What's it do? James explained the Marauder's map to Ralph, feeling vaguely worried and annoyed that his dad already knew about his taking it and the invisibility cloak. He'd known he'd get caught eventually, but had assumed he'd get a howler about it rather than a ribbing from Hagrid. Ralph was interested in the map. It really shows everybody who's in the castle and where they are. That'd be seriously useful. So how does it work? You have to say a special phrase. Dad told me a long time ago, but I can't remember it off the top of my head. We'll give it a try some night. Right now I don't want to think about it. Ralph nodded and let the subject drop. They entered the castle through the main portico and parted at the stairs leading to the cellars and the Slytherin quarters. It was getting late, and James found himself alone in the corridors. The wintry night was cloudy and starless. It pressed against the windows and sucked at the light of the hall torches. James shivered, partly at the cold and partly at a sense of icy dread that seemed to be seeping into the corridor, filling it like a heavy fog from the floor up. He walked faster, wondering how it could be that the halls were so dark and empty.
It wasn't particularly late, and yet the air had a sense of chilly stillness that felt like the dead of morning or the air of a sealed crypt. He realized he'd been walking rather farther than the corridor should have allowed. Surely he should have come to the junction with the statue of the one-eyed witch by now, where he'd turned left into the reception hall leading to the staircases. James stopped and glanced back the way he had come. The hall looked the same, and yet wrong somehow. It looked far too long. The shadows of it seemed to be in the wrong places, teasing his eyes somehow. And then he noticed there were no torches on the walls. The light hung empty, ghostly, bleeding its color from flickering yellow to shimmery silver, fading even as he watched. Fear leapt onto James's back, icy cold and undeniable. He spun back to the front, meaning to run, but his feet failed him when he saw what was ahead. The corridor was still there, but the pillars had become the trunks of trees. The ribs of the vaulted ceilings had turned to limbs and vines, with nothing beyond but the vast face of the night sky. Even the pattern of the tiled floor melted into a lacework of roots and dead leaves. And then, even as James watched, the illusion of the school corridor evaporated completely, leaving only forest. Cold wind barreled past him, whipping his cloak and threading the hair back from his temples with ghostly fingers. James recognized where he was, even though the last time he'd been here the leaves had still been on the trees and the crickets had been singing their chorus. This was the wood bordering the lake near the island of the Grotto Keep. The trees groaned, rubbing their bare branches together in the wind and the sound was like low voices moaning in sleep, wrapped in fever dreams. James realized he was walking again, moving towards the edge of the trees, where the reeds swished and bobbed at the edge of the lake. A great, dark mass rose beyond, blotting out the view. As James approached, apparently helpless to stop his plodding feet, the moon unveiled from a bank of dense clouds. The island of the Grotto Keep revealed itself in the moon glow, and James's breath caught in his chest. The island had grown. The impression of a secret fortress was stronger than ever. It was a gothic monstrosity, decked with grim statues and leering gargoyles, all somehow grown from the vines and trees of the island. The moor of the Dragon Bridge lay before him, and James forced himself to stop there without setting a foot onto it. He remembered the gnashing wooden teeth as it had tried to devour him and Zane. In the silvery moonlight, the gates at the other end of the bridge were quite visible, as well as the words of the poem. When by the light of Solver Bright I found the Grotto Keep, the gates suddenly shuddered and flung open, revealing blackness like a throat. A voice came out of that blackness, clear and beautiful, pure as a chiming bell. Keeper of the relic, said the voice, your duty is satisfied. As James stood and watched, looking across the bridge into the darkness of the open doorway, a light formed there. It condensed solidified and assumed a shape. It was, James recognized, the gently glowing shape of a dryad, a woman of the wood, a tree sprite. It wasn't the same one he had met before, however. That one had glowed with a green light. This one's light was pale blue. She pulsed slightly. Her hair flowed around her head as if in a current of water. A quiet, almost loving smile was on her lips, and her huge, liquid eyes twinkled gently. "'You have performed your role,' the dryad said, her voice as dreamy and hypnotic as the other dryads had been, if not more so. "'You need not guard the relic. This is not your burden. Bring it to us. We are its guardians. Ours is the task. Granted from the beginning, relieve yourself of its weight, bring us the relic. James looked down and saw that, without realizing it, he had taken a step onto the bridge. The dragon's maw hadn't closed on him. 
He glanced up and saw that it had actually pulled upwards a bit, welcoming him. The junction of the fallen trees which formed the jaw creaked slightly. Bring us the relic, the dryad said again, and she lifted her arms towards James as if she meant to welcome him with an embrace. Her arms were unnaturally long, almost as if they stretched out to him over the bridge. Her fingernails were a blue so deep it was nearly purple. They were long and surprisingly ragged. James retreated a step, backing off the bridge. The dryad's eyes changed. They brightened and hardened. Bring us the relic, she said once more, and her voice changed as well. The song had leaked out of it. It isn't yours. Its power is greater than you, greater than all of you. Bring it to us before it unmakes you. The relic destroys those whom it does not need, and it no longer needs you. Bring it to us before it decides to use someone else. Bring us the relic while you still can. Her long arms reached across the bridge, and James felt sure he could touch them if he reached out. He backed away further, catching his heel on a root and stumbling. He turned, pinwheeling his arms for a handhold, and fell against something broad and hard. He pressed his hands against it and pushed backwards, righting himself. It was the stone of a wall. Five feet away, a torch crackled in its sconce. James glanced around. The corridor of Hogwarts stretched away, warm and mundane, as if he'd never left. Perhaps he never had. He looked in the other direction. There was the junction with the statue of the one-eyed witch. The sense of dread was gone, and James felt certain that what had happened hadn't just been a vision of some kind. He could still feel the chill of the night wind in the folds of his cloak. When he looked down, there was a crumble of dry river mud on the end of his shoe. He shivered, then gathered himself and ran the rest of the way to the stairs, where he took two at a time climbing to the common room. The only thing James was sure of was that something wanted him to give up the Merlin robe. He just wasn't sure it was the right something. Fortunately, the robe was still locked away in Jackson's bag in James's trunk. After his experience with touching the robe, James had no plans to take the robe out of the trunk again until he handed it over to his dad and the aura department when the time was right. The time wasn't right yet, but it would be. Soon. Either way, he wasn't about to hand it over to some mysterious entity, tree sprite or not. Confident of this, James reached the Gryffindor common room and prepared for bed. Still, long after he had settled under his blankets, he thought he could hear the whispering voice in the wind beyond the window, pleading with him endlessly, monotonously, Bring us the relic! Bring us the relic while you still can! It chilled him, and when he did sleep, he dreamed of those haunting, beautiful eyes and those long, long arms with the thin hands and ragged, purple fingernails. The following Friday, in herbology class, James was amused to see that Neville Longbottom had moved Ralph's transfigured peach tree out of the Transfiguration classroom, where it had become rather cumbersome, and into one of the greenhouses. All this from a banana, Neville confirmed to James after class. Yeah, I bet Ralph was more surprised than anybody. He's amazing, but I don't think he knows his own power, really. Some of the other Slytherins think he's got some powerful old magical family in his bloodline. Could be, I suppose, since he never knew his mum. That's the sort of thing they'd think, Neville said with unusual candour. Muggleborns can be just as powerful as anyone born of an old pure-blood family. Some prejudices never change, though. James looked up at the peach tree, which had become rather large, despite the fact that its roots were still twined hopelessly around one of the Transfiguration Room tables. He knew Neville was right, but he couldn't help thinking about the look on Ralph's face the day he'd transfigured the banana. Ralph had never said so, but James had a sense that Ralph's power frightened him just a little. The next day, the Gryffindor Quidditch team was slated in a match against the Slytherins. James sat in the Gryffindor stands with Zane and Sabrina Hildegard. 
Ralph, for purposes of maintaining his few Slytherin friends, sat in the green-decked grandstand across the pitch. James made eye contact with Ralph once and waved. Ralph waved back, but carefully, being sure not to be seen by his older housemates. Below, on the field, the team captains strode out to the centre line to meet with Kay Ridcully for the declaration of rules and a handshake, a tradition that nobody really paid any attention to anymore. James watched Justin Kennelly shake Tabitha Corsica's hand perfunctorily. Even from his vantage point high in the grandstand, James could see the smarmy, polite smile on Tabitha's admittedly beautiful face. Then both turned and walked in opposite directions back to their holding pens beneath the stands, leaving Ridcully alone with the Quidditch trunk. Zane happily munched a bag of popcorn he'd brought with him, having somehow convinced one of the kitchen house elves to prepare it. This should be an excellent match, he observed, taking in the high-spirited crowd. Gryffindor against Slytherin is always a crowd-stopper, Sabrina said, raising her voice over the noise. Back in my mum's day, everybody hated Slytherin because they were dirty players. A guy named Miles Bletchley was the team captain back then, and he went on to play for the Thundalara Thunderers for a couple of years until he was booted from the league for using a corked broom. A what? Zane interjected. How do you cork a broom? James explained. It's a kind of cheating where a hole is drilled down the centre of the broom and something magical is threaded into it, like a dragon's rib or a basilisk fang. Basically turns the whole broom into a magic wand. He was using it to cast repelling spells and modified Expelliarmus spells, making the opposing team fumble the quaffle. Really crooked old blighter he was. As he spoke, the Slytherin teams streaked out from their holding pen to the sound of cheers from their grandstand. Damien, seated in the broadcast booth with his wand to his throat, announced the team, his voice echoing in the crisp January air. So, Zane called over the cheers, doesn't seem like everybody hates the Slytherins any more. Sure enough, there was scattered applause throughout the rest of the grandstands. Only the Gryffindor stands booed and hissed. James shrugged. They don't seem to play as dirty as they used to, but they still field unusually strong teams. There's something dodgy about them. It's just not as obvious as it used to be. I'll say, Zane agreed. When we played Slytherin before the break, it was as clean a match as I played all year. Ridcully barely called a single foul on them. Still, there was something just a little too slick about them. They're either the luckiest bunch of skunks ever to mount brooms, or they've made a deal with the devil himself. James gritted his teeth. Across the pitch, Horace Slughorn, red-cheeked and bundled in a fur-collared coat and matching hat, waved a small Slytherin flag on a stick and yelled encouragements to his house team. Ralph, seated two rows below him, applauded dutifully. James knew that Ralph wasn't much of a Quidditch fan, despite the almost studious attention he paid to the matches, and James guessed that it was because Ralph couldn't really choose a team to be loyal to. His friends, including Rufus Burton, cheered and hooted wildly. The Gryffindor team took the pitch next, streaming from the holding pen beneath their grandstand, and the spectators around James erupted, leaping to their feet as one. James shouted right alongside them, grinning and ecstatic, certain that the Gryffindors would win. He stomped his feet and yelled himself hoarse as the team circled the pitch, waving and grinning. The teams flew into position. After instructing the teams to play a clean match and assuring everyone was in position, Ridcully released the bludgers and snitch and tossed the quaffle into the air. The players collapsed into a swarm, chasing the bludgers and wrestling over the quaffle. Noah and Tom Squalus, the two seekers, streaked off after the snitch, which darted around the Ravenclaw banners and vanished. Almost immediately, the difference between the teams became apparent. Gryffindor fought a textbook match based entirely on carefully practiced drills. Justin Kennelly could be heard shouting plays and formations over the cheering crowd, pointing and giving signs. The Slytherins, on the other hand, seemed to have a graceful, almost eerie playing style that moved them over the pitch like a school of fish. Tabitha Corsica called no directions from her broom, and yet her players peeled off and regrouped with dance-like precision.
Once, while in possession, Tabitha ducked under a bludger and simultaneously tossed the quaffle over her shoulder. The ball arced through the air and was deftly caught by a teammate who had flown a perpendicular course directly underneath her. The teammate underhanded the quaffle through the centre goal before the Gryffindor keeper even realised Tabitha didn't have it any more. James groaned while the Slytherins stood and cheered. Justin Canelli looked as if he wanted to jump up and down on his broom in frustration. Still, an hour into the match, the score was 130 to 140 in favour of Gryffindor, close enough that the lead had changed five times. It's all about the seekers in a match like this, Sabrina yelled exuberantly, not taking her eyes from the players. And Squalus is new to that position since Nofton finished last year. Noah should be able to nail him to the wall with his own broom. Sure enough, a sudden roar went up from the crowd, and James saw that Noah was in pursuit of the snitch. Across the pitch, Tom Squalus was bent over his broom, bearing his teeth into the cold wind and rushing to cut Noah off. He banked through the throng of players, barely missed by Justin Canelli's swatted bludger. Despite his speed, James was confident there was no way Squalus would beat Noah to the prize. A golden streak and a whir of tiny wings buzzed by the Gryffindor grandstand, followed a split second later by Noah. Those in the front rows ducked, then leapt to their feet, cheering as Noah banked hard, barely missing the grandstand and lunging forward on his broom, arm outstretched. There was a long, breathless moment when Noah appeared to be in the toe of the tiny golden ball, the distance shrinking, shrinking, Noah's hand trembling as he reached. Then, in a flurry of cloaks and brooms, something changed. Noah was forced to yank up on his broom, grinding to a slewing stop that destroyed his control. A cloud of Slytherins led by Tabitha Corsica had swept in front of him from all directions, stitching a virtual wall in mid-air. Noah ran into a burly Slytherin and bounced off, losing his grip on his broom. He tumbled sideways, grabbing on with one hand and swinging beneath it. The crowd roared. Tabitha Corsica shot through the wall of Slytherins, which opened for her like an iris. Her cloak whipped behind her, and James was amazed to see the snitch flying behind her in the shadow of her cloak. It dipped upwards, and Tabitha followed almost instantaneously, bent low over her broom. Somehow, without even looking, she was shadowing the snitch, marking it for Tom Squalus. He saw her, banked hard, and swooped past her. When he came out on the other side, his hand was raised and the snitch glittered within it. The Slytherin grandstands cheered uproariously. The game was over. Noah swung himself from beneath his broom, hooking one foot over it. He struggled upright just as Ted and Justin Canelli swooped in next to him, talking and gesturing. James understood the nature of what they were saying, even if he couldn't hear the words through the cheers and boos. Something extremely odd had happened, and yet the Slytherins hadn't actually committed any fouls. On the grass of the pitch, Petra Morganston, who played Chaser, had cornered Kay Ridcully and was animatedly pointing at Tabitha Corsica, who was still on her broom, being congratulated by her teammates alongside Tom Squalus. Ridcully shook his head, unable or unwilling to agree with Petra's allegations. There didn't seem to be any recourse for the Gryffindors, since they couldn't prove that anything illegal had actually occurred. What in the name of Valdi's pasty white rear end was that? Damien Damascus demanded, having quit the broadcast booth and joined James, Zane and Sabrina. Sabrina shook her head. That was really creepy. Did you see what I saw? Corsica blocked the snitch. She never touched it, but she flew right next to it, marking it until Squalus could get his broom in gear. There's no rule against that, Zane asked as they all joined the throng leaving the stands. No point making rules against things that are impossible, Damien said crossly. As long as she didn't touch it, she's in the clear. She wasn't even watching the snitch. I'd swear it. Ralph was trotting across the pitch when James and Zane tromped down the last few steps. Panting, he angled them away from Sabrina and Damien, whose moods were getting fouler. <sighs> Did you see that? Ralph asked, struggling to catch his breath. He seemed extremely agitated. We saw something, 
James said, although I'm not sure I believe my eyes. Zane was less diplomatic. The Gryffindors think your buddies cheated somehow. It's going to throw off the final standings, too. Now it looks like Ravenclaw will be playing Slytherin for the tournament. I was hoping for a Gryffindor and Ravenclaw match. Will you two forget about the bloody Quidditch tournament for a minute? Ralph said, turning to face the two of them at the base of the grandstands. In case you've forgotten, we have more important things to think about. All right, then spill it, Ralph, James said, trying not to be annoyed. Ralph took a deep breath. You told me I was your man on the inside, didn't you? So I've been watching closely, looking for hints and clues about who might be involved with the old Merlin plot, right? And you think now that it's the time to discuss this? Zane asked, raising his eyebrows. No, no, it's fine, James interjected. What did you see, Ralph? Something going on back at Slytherin Central? No, Ralph said impatiently. Not back at the common room or anything. Right here, just a few minutes ago. Remember what we're supposed to be looking for? Yeah, Zane said, becoming interested. The Merlin staff. Ralph nodded meaningfully. There was a cheer nearby. The three boys turned as the Slytherins left the pitch, surrounded by a crowd of students in green scarves. Tabitha walked at the head of the group, her broom held triumphantly over her shoulder. Six feet or so of an unusually magical wood, Ralph said in a low voice, still watching Tabitha leave the pitch. Origins unknown. That's right, James replied, understanding dawning on him. Tabitha said her broom was a custom design, crafted by some muggle artist or something. She registered it as a muggle artefact since it wasn't a standard model. And there's no question that there's something pretty unusually magical about it, Ralph added. James nodded. Are you saying what I think you're saying? Zane asked incredulously. Ralph glanced back at him. Makes sense, doesn't it? It's the perfect hiding place. That's why I came running over here right after the match. I wanted you both to see it too and see if it fits. Zane whistled in awe. Talk about your corked brooms. Here all this time, Corsica's been flying around on Merlin's flipping staff. James couldn't take his eyes off it as Tabitha crested the hill, heading back to the castle. The wintry sunlight glinted off the bristly tail of the broom. It was indeed the perfect disguise for a six-foot length of highly magical wood. And now they knew for sure who was the third conspirator in the Merlin plot. The Slytherin who went by the profile name of Ostromaddox. James's heart pounded with excitement and anticipation. So, he said, as the three of them began to follow the Slytherins at a careful distance, wending their way back to the castle. How are we going to get the Merlin staff away from Tabitha Corsica? Chapter 14. The Hall of Elders Crossing What? Why do we need to steal a broom anyway? Ralph exclaimed at breakfast the next morning. He leaned over the table, reaching for a plate of sausages. It would be loads harder to steal than Jackson's case was. Boys aren't even a lad in the girls' dorms. We'd never get near it. Besides, we got the robe already. They can't do anything without all the relics. It's the Merlin staff. That's why we have to get it, James replied. Even on its own, it's got to be one of the most powerful magical objects in the world. You saw what Tabitha Corsica did with it at the match, and it wasn't just her shadowing the snitch without even looking. Her whole team seemed to respond to it somehow, or at least their brooms did. They knew just where to be at all the right moments. That's some really powerful magic. So far, she's only using the staff to win Quidditch matches, but do you really want something like that in the hands of someone like her and the progressive element? Ralph looked dour. Zane put his coffee cup down and stared at the tabletop. I don't know, he said. What? James said impatiently. Zane glanced up. Well, it just seems too easy, really. I mean, first there was Ralph's buddy's rockhound bag that showed up at just the right time. Then, no matter how you look at it, we got really lucky with that Visum in Neptro charm. Even before that, look at all the coincidences that led to you discovering the hiding place of the Merlin throne. From catching a glimpse of the voodoo queen on the lake that night, to finding that Daily Prophet article about the break-in at the ministry. 
And now we just happen to figure out that Tabitha's broom is the Merlin staff? I hate to say it, but it can't be much of a dark conspiracy if a trio of first-year schlubs like us have worked it all out. James fumed. All right, yeah, so we've got lucky here and there. We've worked really hard and been extremely careful, too. And besides, it all fits, doesn't it? Just because the people behind the Merlin plot have been too arrogant to think anybody could catch them doesn't mean the plot isn't for real. What about what happened when we opened Jackson's case? And I didn't even tell you what happened to me last week. Ralph jumped, almost knocking over his pumpkin juice. His eyes were wild for a second, and then he calmed himself. Last week? When? The night we went to see Hagrid, right after I left you, James answered. He described the way the halls of Hogwarts had transformed into forest around him, his strange journey to the island of the Grotto Keep, and the mysterious ghostly figure that had instructed him to bring her the relic robe. Zane listened with keen interest, but Ralph's face was pale and blank. When James finished, Zane asked, You think it really was a dryad? James shrugged. I don't know. It sure looked a lot like the one we saw in the forest, but different, too. It pulsed, if you know what I mean. I could feel it in my head. Maybe it was a dream, Zane said carefully. It sure sounds like one. It wasn't a dream. I was in the corridor heading to the common room. I wasn't sleepwalking. I'm just saying, Zane said blandly, lowering his eyes. What? James prodded. You think that whole Merlin thing was a dream too? Where I disappeared from the room right in front of the both of you and Cedric Diggory's ghost had to bring me back? Of course not. Still, it sounds kind of crazy. Were you in the forest or were you in the corridor? Which one was real? Were either of them real? I mean, you've been thinking about all of this an awful lot. Maybe... Ralph was studying his empty plate. He spoke without raising his head. It wasn't a dream. James and Zane both looked at Ralph. How do you know, Ralph? Zane asked. Ralph sighed. Because the same thing happened to me. James's eyes widened and his mouth dropped open. You saw the Grotto Keep and the Dryad too, Ralph? Why didn't you say anything? I didn't know what they were, Ralph said, looking up. I wasn't with you two when you went out in the forest and saw the island and met the Dryad, remember? So last week, I was on my way through the cellars to the Slytherin rooms, and all of a sudden, the cellars just faded out and turned into a forest, same as you described, James. I saw the island and the tree sprite lady, but I didn't recognise them. I thought she was a ghost or something. She told me to bring the relic to her, but I was scared. I'm not used to having weird, magical out-of-body experiences or anything. I tried to run away, but then all of a sudden I was standing outside the door to the Slytherin common room, plain as could be was worried about my sanity, to tell you the truth. I thought all this magical stuff was making me soft in the head. Frankly, I'm a little relieved that the same thing happened to you too. I can see why, Zane said, nodding. But why you? James asked. You don't have the relic. I do. Zane tilted his head and cinched a corner of his mouth up in that expression of comical concentration he put on when he was thinking hard. Maybe it's as simple as the fact that Ralph's a Slytherin. I mean... He was in the debate against Petra and me. Maybe whatever it was thinks Ralph is the weakest link. Maybe it thinks it can get Ralph to betray you and steal the robe, and then bring it to the island. Not that you would, Ralph, Zane added, looking at Ralph. No way. I'm never touching that thing, Ralph concurred. I guess that makes sense, James admitted. So why not you then, Zane? Zane adopted a beatific expression, eyes raised to the ceiling. Because I'm as pure as the wind-driven snow. And besides, I'm never setting foot on that island again. Too freaky for me by far. But I couldn't even steal the robe if I wanted to, Ralph said, furrowing his brow. Not with Zane's locking spell on it. James is the only one who can open the trunk. You could just drag the whole trunk out there, I suppose, James replied. Where there's a will, there's a way. Fortunately, there's no will, Ralph said gravely. Zane pushed his empty coffee cup away. The dryad, or whatever it was, wouldn't necessarily know about the extra locking spell on the trunk anyway. But the fact that it happened to both of you sure proves something wants that robe and knows we have it. If it isn't Jackson or any of his crew, then who? James said, remember what the green dryad told us? 
She said that the trees were waking, but that many of them had... How did she put it? Zane nodded, remembering. She said they'd gone over, like milk past its expiration date or something. Some of the trees are bad, in other words. They're on the side of chaos and war. You think yours and Ralph's blue dryad was one of the bad ones trying to sound nice? Makes sense, Ralph said. She was all beautiful and smiles and everything, but I had a pretty strong feeling that if I didn't bring her the robe, that smile could turn hungry pretty fast. That's what scared me. That and her fingernails. He shuddered. So this is way bigger than just us and the Merlin conspirators, Zane said seriously. The tree spirits are involved, and who knows what else, too. For all we know, everything in the magical world might be taking sides. Either way, James said earnestly, it proves that these relics are incredibly powerful. In the wrong hands, who knows what kind of damage they could do. That's why we have to get the staff away from Tabitha. I don't understand why we don't just get your dad in here, Ralph interjected. It's his job to deal with this kind of stuff, isn't it? Because they have rules they have to follow, James replied wearily. They'd have to bring in a team of auras to scour the grounds. They wouldn't just go nick Tabitha's broom because we said it was the Merlin staff, even if we did turn over the robe. There'd be magical sweeps, investigating every unusual source of power. It could go on for days. By the time they got around to checking out Tabitha, she'd have got the broom out of here. Jackson and Delacroix might sniff trouble and escape, too. They might even get the whole conspiracy together to go to this Hall of Elders Crossing and try to bring Merlin back. It wouldn't work without the robe, of course, but then the throne and the staff would be lost, hidden, and in the control of dark wizards. Ralph sighed. All right, all right, I'm convinced. So we'll try to capture the Merlin staff from Corsica, but that's it, all right? Then we turn it all over to your dad and his pros. They clean up the mess and we can be the heroes. Whatever, OK? Zane nodded. Yeah, I'm with you. Get the broom and we're done. Agreed? James agreed. So we need a plan. Any ideas? It won't be easy, Ralph said firmly. If we got lucky with Jackson's briefcase, then we'll need an act of God to pull this one off. The slithering quarters are so thick with guard exes and anti-spying spells, they almost um. They're the most suspicious lot I've ever met. Tricksters always expect to be tricked, Zane said wisely. But there's one thing we're forgetting, and it may even be more important than capturing the Merlin staff. What's more important than that? James asked. Keeping the relic we've got, Zane answered simply, meeting James's eyes. Something out there knows we have the robe, and it's already tried once to get it from you. I don't know what kind of magic that was, but you both seem pretty convinced that it transported you to the island straight out of Hogwarts Halls, right? James and Ralph exchanged looks and then nodded at Zane. So... Zane continued, if disapparition is impossible on Hogwarts grounds, then it used some other form of magic to get you there. That's some powerful mojo. What's to say it won't try again? Ralph paled. I hadn't even thought of that. Maybe it used up all its power the first time, James said a little doubtfully. You two better hope so, Zane said, looking back and forth between them, because it already tried asking nice. The next time, it won't be so polite. An idea struck James, and he shivered. What? Ralph asked, seeing James's face change. Remote physio apparition, James said in a hushed voice. That's what Professor Franklin called Delacroix's power to project a wraith of herself. It's different from regular apparition, because she just sends out something like a ghost of herself. But the wraith can still look solid and affect things. I looked it up. The ghost makes a solid version of itself out of whatever material is handy, and then wears that like a puppet. Somehow she used it to bring the Merlin throne here and hide it on the island without being detected. Zane frowned. OK, so? So what if that was how Ralph and I were sent out to the Grotto Keep? Ralph, you called it an out-of-body experience. What if that's what it really was? Maybe we were forced to have a remote physio-apparition. Only a wraith of ourselves went out to the grotto, but our bodies stayed in the corridors, just sort of frozen. Ralph was clearly horrified by the thought. Zane looked thoughtful. It seems to fit, 
Both of you said it happened when you were alone in the corridors. There'd be no one to see you both standing there on autopilot while your souls or whatever were strung out to the grotto keep. But that's Delacroix's speciality, Ralph said, shuddering. You think she knows we got the robe somehow? James answered. Maybe. She's slippery as an eel. She might have figured it out and not even told Jackson. Maybe she wants all the glory for herself. Only one thing is for sure, then, Zane announced. We can't let you two be alone. My guess is that whoever or whatever is doing this doesn't want the secret to get out. That's why they waited until you two were alone for a few minutes. If we keep people around you, then maybe it won't try again. Ralph was as white as a statue. Unless it gets really, really desperate. Well, yeah, Zane agreed. There's always that possibility. But we can't do anything in that case, so let's just hope it doesn't come to that. That makes me feel loads better. Ralph moaned. Come on, James said, getting up from the breakfast table. It's getting late and the house elves are giving us the eye. It's time we got out of here before somebody notices we're planning something. The three boys wandered out onto the chilly grounds and talked of other things for a while. Then, having separate house-related obligations, went their separate ways for the rest of the day. The next week was frustratingly busy. Neville Longbottom assigned one of his very unusual but painstakingly demanding essays. This led to James spending an inordinate amount of time in the library researching the endless uses of spinous wort, an endeavour that was further complicated by the fact that every part of the spinous wort plant, from the leaves to the stem to the root and even its seeds, was used in any number of applications, from healing skin diseases to waxing broomsticks. James had just added the seventy-ninth entry to his scribbled list when Morgan Petonia sat down at the table across from him with a heavy sigh. Morgan, a first-year Hufflepuff, was also in Herbology and working on her spinous word essay. You only need to list five uses, Morgan stated when she saw James's list. You know that, don't you? Five? James said weakly. Morgan gave James a look of somehow delighted disdain. Professor Longbottom only assigned us to write about spinous wort because it's one of the three most useful plants in the magical world. If we were to write about every one of its uses, we'd be turning in encyclopedias, you silly boy. James's face heated. I knew that, he said, aiming for aloof arrogance and hitting only wounded petulance. I just forgot. Can't blame me for being thorough, can you? Morgan tittered, obviously thrilled that James had wasted so much time. James packed up a few minutes later and moved to the Gryffindor common room, annoyed but simultaneously relieved. At least his essay was finished. In fact, since he'd already written about twenty-three spinous wort uses, he probably stood to get loads of extra credit, just as long as Neville didn't figure out that the thoroughness of James's report simply meant James hadn't been paying much attention in class. Twice James saw Professor Delacroix in the corridors and had the haunting sensation that she was watching him. He never actually saw her eyes on him, but since she was blind that hardly mattered anyway. James remembered the way Delacroix had manoeuvred the tureen of gumbo with her ugly grapefruit wand at the Alma Alaron dinner, never spilling a drop. He had a suspicion that Delacroix had ways of seeing that didn't rely at all upon her useless eyes. In fact, that could explain how she might have noticed that Jackson's briefcase was different. The Visum Ineptio charm only worked on what people saw with their eyes, didn't it? Still, she never said anything, or even so much as paused in her stride when she passed him. James decided that he was simply being paranoid. Besides, as Zane pointed out, what difference did it make? She might be the one trying to trick Ralph and James into taking the relic robe out to the Grotto Keep, or it might be some other force entirely. Either way, they had to be on guard, never to be alone. And in the end, the source of the threat didn't really matter anyway. James had begun to realise just how hard it was to never be alone. He would have thought, in a school the size of Hogwarts, it would have been quite rare anyway. Now that he was paying attention... He realised he'd been on his own on the grounds or in the halls several times each day, whether crossing the grounds to get to Neville Longbottom's herbology class after transfiguration, or just going to the bathroom in the middle of the night. Arranging to never be alone, even in these circumstances, was an annoying chore, 
but Zayn, to James's surprise, was consistently adamant about it. Even if we did capture that robe by a string of completely freakish lucky breaks, I'm not going to let it slip out of our hands because we got careless, he told James one day, walking him to the herbology greenhouses. It's the Merlin conspirators' carelessness that's been working for us. I'm not going to do them any favors like that. One day, James introduced Ralph and Zane to the protean charm as a means of communicating if ever an emergency chaperone was needed. James had ordered three novelty rubber ducks from Weasley's Wizard Wheezes, giving one each to Zane and Ralph. The protean charm means that if I squeeze my duck, both of yours will sound as well, James explained, giving his duck a tweak. Quack, sod off! All three ducks quacked in unison. Excellent! Zane said, giving his own duck a firm squeeze, resulting in a chorus of happy insults. So if either of you find yourselves alone or need me to take you to the bathroom, you just honk on this and I come running, eh? Ugh, oh, Ralph said, staring at his duck with distaste. I hate this. It's like being three years old again. Hey, if you want to go getting zapped off to meet with some unhappy tree spirit again, Zane said, shrugging. I didn't say I wouldn't do it, Ralph replied, annoyed. I just ate it, is all. Zane turned back to James. So how will I know which one of you quacked for me? James produced a black marker and drew a small J on the bottom of his duck. Take a look at yours now. Anything we do to a single duck will show up on all of them. When you hear the quack, just check the bottom of the duck and see whose initial shows up. Very tight. Zane said approvingly. He raised his duck and tweaked it as if he was saluting with it. Wah! Eat duck duck poo -poo. The ducks quacked gaily. All right, James said, putting his own duck in his backpack. This will only work if we only use them in an emergency. Got it? Why don't they just squeak? Ralph asked as he pocketed his. Ask a Weasley, James answered dismissively. At first, having to have Zane or somebody around at all times was as annoying to James as it was to Ralph, but eventually James got used to it and even began to like it. Zane would sit on a chair in the corner of the bathroom while James bathed, quizzing him on defensive spell pronunciations or transfiguration terminology and restrictions. James learned that many of his herbology classmates, including Morgan Petonia, had charms class before herbology. Knowing this, James was able to hurry from his transfiguration class to the charms classroom and then accompany Petonia and her friends to the greenhouses, thus avoiding the solitary trek across the grounds. Constantly being near people became an easy habit for James, and eventually he nearly forgot he was doing it. In this fashion, the weeks melted past. The rawness of winter began to thaw into the fragile warmth of spring. Still, neither James, Ralph, nor Zane had come up with a plan to get Tabitha Corsica's broomstick. Eventually, they determined, albeit reluctantly, that some group reconnaissance was required. I'm not liking this, Ralph said, as he led the other two to the door of the Slytherin common room. I haven't seen anyone other than Slytherins in here for months. Don't worry about it, Ralph, Zane said, but his voice was less confident than usual. We've got James's magic map here. We can check it again, but according to it, most of your buddies are out watching the Slytherins practice for the tournament, right, James? James had the Marauder's map unfolded in his hands. He studied it as he walked. As far as I can tell, there's only a couple of people in the Slytherin dorms, and none of them are people we need to worry about. Are you sure you're reading that thing right? Ralph asked, plugging his ring into the eye socket of the snake sculpture on the gigantic wooden door. Last I heard, you said you couldn't even remember how to get it to work. Well, it's working, isn't it? James replied testily. In truth, he was worried about the accuracy of the map. He had remembered the phrase to get the map to open and display the grounds, but as his dad had feared, the castle had changed rather a lot since the map had been created by Mooney, Prongs, Padfoot and Wormtail. Irregular chunks of the map were completely blank, and each blank section was marked with a notation that read, Redrawing required. Please see Messrs. Prongs and Padfoot for assistance. James could only guess that his grandfather and Sirius Black had been the chief artists who had plotted the map, but since both were long since dead, there would apparently be no redrawing of the map to fill in the rebuilt areas.
The tiny names that marked the locations of everyone on campus could still be seen moving here and there, but as they entered one of the blank areas, their marker and name would flicker out. Fortunately, the Slytherin quarters were under the lake and therefore had been very little damaged in the Battle of Hogwarts. Ralph had learned that only the main entry had been destroyed in the siege. James could see the entire warren of Slytherin rooms and halls on the Marauder's map. The snake sculpture asked its questions. Ralph announced himself and explained who James and Zane were and that they were friends. The glowing green snake eye examined Zane and James for a long moment and then unlocked the complicated system of bolts and bars that secured the door. The three boys couldn't help skulking as they moved through the apparently deserted Slytherin common room. The brackish green sunlight, filtered by the lake water above the stained glass ceiling, filled the room with murky shadows. The fire was a dull red glow in the gigantic fireplace, which was sculpted in marble to resemble an open snake's mouth. Nothing like reading a good book in front of gaping doom, Zane murmured, passing the fireplace. So where do they keep their broomsticks, Ralph? Ralph shook his head. I told you already. I don't know. I just know there isn't a common room locker or anything, like the Gryffindors or Ravenclaws. Most of these guys don't trust each other all that much. Everybody has a private locker with a special magical key. Besides, their brooms aren't here now anyway, are they? They've all got them out of the Quidditch pitch. We aren't here to grab it now. Zane answered, peering around the common room. We're just here to scope out where they might hide them. Even in the middle of a spring day, the Slytherin rooms were a pall of shifting green dimness. Lumos, James said, illuminating his wand and holding it aloft. This hall goes back to the boys' quarters, right, Ralph? Yeah, the girls' rooms are on the other side, up those stairs. Zane threaded through the furniture of the common room, aiming for the stairs. Panny raid in the Slytherin girls' quarters. I'm on it. Wait, James said sharply. It'll be charmed, you know. No boys are allowed in any of the girls' quarters. You go up there, it'll be sure to set off some sort of alarm. Zane stopped, glancing at James, and then turned back to the stairway. Drat! They thought of everything, didn't they? Besides, Ralph said from across the room, they're called knickers round here. You say potato, I say patata, Zane muttered. Can we get back to why we're here after all? James said as loudly as he dared. We're supposed to be looking for ways to get to Tabitha's broom, even if all we can do is figure out where she keeps it. Believe it or not, Zane said primly, that's what I was thinking of. For all we know, she sleeps with the thing. Even if she doesn't, you can bet she keeps it near enough to guard. That means getting into the girl's quarters, doesn't it? James shook his head. Not possible. I'm beginning to see how helpful it was for my dad to have Aunt Hermione as part of his crew. He could have sent her up to check things out. We're pretty much stuck, though. As James finished speaking, a noise came from the stairway. The three boys froze guiltily, looking towards the stairs. There was a shuffling of small feet, and then a tiny house-elf came down, balancing a basket of rumpled clothing on its head. The elf stopped, seeing the three boys staring at it. Pardons, masters, the elf said, and James could tell by the timbre of his voice that it was a female. Just collecting the washing, if you please. Her bulbous eyes flicked between the three of them. She seemed disconcerted to have elicited such keen interest. James realised she was probably used to being completely ignored if she was seen at all. Not a problem, miss, Zane said, affecting a small bow and taking a step back from the stairs. The elf didn't move. Her eyes followed Zane's movement with increasing consternation. Excuse me, master. Your name, miss, Zane replied. Uh, Figgle, master. I apologize, master. Figgle isn't accustomed to masters and mistresses speaking to her, master. The elf seemed to be nearly vibrating with nervousness. I'm sure that is true, Figgle, Zane said understandingly. You see, I'm a member of an organization you may have heard of. We're called the, uh... Zane glanced back at James, his eyes wide. James remembered telling Zane and Ralph about Aunt Hermione's Equal Rights for Elves organization. James stuttered, Oh, yeah, SPEW, the Society for the Promotion of, uh... 
Elfish welfare. Yes, what he said, Zane said, spinning back to Figgle, who flinched. S-P-E-W. You've heard of us, no doubt. We help those who elf themselves. Figgle hasn't, Master, not a bit. Figgle has loads of work, Master. That's exactly the point, my dear Figgle. We at S-P-E-W are working to lessen that load. In fact, as an act of good faith, I'd like to help you now. Please, might I help you carry that? Figgle looked positively horrified. Oh, no, Master. Figgle couldn't. Master shouldn't mock Figgle, sir. James could see where Zane was heading with the charade, but was doubtful it would get anywhere. House elves, especially those who worked amongst the Slytherins, were often mistreated and tricked by their masters. Figgle looked as if she was about to burst into tears from fear. Zane knelt down, bringing himself eye-level to the trembling house elf on the second step of the stairs. Figgle, I'm not going to hurt you or get you into trouble, I promise. I'm not even a Slytherin. I'm a Ravenclaw. You know Ravenclaws? Figgle does. Master, Figgle collects the Ravenclaw's wash on Tuesdays and Fridays. Ravenclaws use less scent than Slytherins, Master. The elf was babbling, but she seemed a bit calmer. I'd like to help you, Figgle. Surely there is more to carry. May I carry it for you? Figgle pressed her lips together very hard, obviously caught on the knife edge between her fear of a mean prank and her duty to do what she was told. Her tennis ball-sized eyes studied Zane. Then, finally, she nodded once, quickly. Excellent, Figgle. You're a good elf, Zane said soothingly. There's more laundry upstairs, isn't there? I see you're piling it there by the door. I'll gather the rest for you. He made to step forwards onto the stairs. Oh, no, Master, wait, Figgle said, raising her hand. The basket on her head wobbled a bit and she steadied it easily. Master will break the boundary. Figgle mustn't let the others see she's being helped. Figgle jumped lightly down the last two steps and turned towards the stairs. She raised her hand and snapped her fingers. Something changed about the doorway. James would have sworn that something like a light had been turned off, although the actual lighting in the room hadn't changed. Now Master can go up, but please, Master. Again, Figgle seemed tortured on the edge of fear and obedience. Please, Master mustn't touch anything but the basket. Then Figgle will take all the wash to the basement. Please? She seemed to be pleading to get this over with and be gone as soon as possible. Of course, Zane answered, smiling. With only the slightest pause, he put his foot on the first step. Nothing happened. I'll be right back, guys, Zane said over his shoulder, then trotted up the steps. James let out a pent-up breath and heard Ralph doing the same. Figgle watched Zane tramp up the stairs, then glanced worriedly back at James and Ralph. Ralph shrugged at her and smiled. It was, James thought, a rather ghastly smile. Figgle didn't seem to notice. She weaved through the furniture, balancing the huge basket easily, and then tipped it onto a large pile near the door. James, Ralph said quietly, the map! James nodded and opened the marauder's map again. He looked first towards the upper right area of the map, where a set of neat drawings illustrated the Quidditch pitch and grandstands. Dozens of names were crammed together there, most in and around the grandstands, but a few swooped around the pitch. The Slytherin practice session was still going on, although there seemed to be fewer people on brooms at the moment. They were probably gathered on the ground nearby, talking strategy or something. He glanced over the names ranged between the pitch and the grandstands. There were Squalus, Norbert, Beetlebrick, and a few others James didn't know. Figgle raised her hands in the same gesture James had seen the house elves in the great hall use to gather up the tablecloths. The pile of laundry clumped into a large ball, and a bedsheet cocooned around it, the four corners tying at the top. Figgle tossed a small puff of pink powder onto the gigantic ball of laundry and snapped her fingers again. The ball of laundry vanished, presumably to reappear in the basements. She looked nervously at the stairs. Well? 
Ralph asked James in a tight, worried voice. I can't see Tabitha, James answered, trying to keep his voice calm. Or Philia Goyle. They aren't out on the pitch any more, as far as I can see. What? Well, where are they? I don't know. They seem to be off the map at the moment. Figgle was looking at them, her eyes wide and alert. She seemed to sense something was even more wrong than it had been a minute ago. James studied the Marauder's map keenly, watching the huge blank spots to see if Goyle and Corsica would appear out of them. He kept a sharp eye on the blank spot at the door to the Slytherin quarters. Oh, no, he said, his eyes widening. Here they come! What are they doing here now? Get rid of the map, Ralph said, his face going pasty white. Come on, Zane, he called up the steps. There was no answer. Figgle's expression had gone from alarm to raw panic. Mistress Corsica is coming! Figgle has done an awful thing! Figgle will be punished! She bolted for the stairs, snapping her fingers as she went. There was that sudden sensation of change, as if an invisible light had popped back on, and James knew that the boundary charm over the stairs was in place again. There was a clatter of footsteps and muffled voices, both from upstairs as well as from the front door of the common room. James balled the marauder's map roughly and jammed it into his open backpack. Ralph threw himself onto the nearest couch, trying to effect a scene of lazy indolence. The door swung open just as James re-shouldered his backpack and turned. Tabitha Corsica and Philia Goyle stepped through the doorway. Their eyes fell on James, and both of them went silent. Tabitha was dressed in a sports cloak and black capri, her broomstick over her shoulder. Her hair was in a neat ponytail, and even though she had, only minutes before, been swooping over the Quidditch pitch on her unusually magical broom, she appeared as cool and fresh as a tulip. She spoke first. "'James Potter,' she said mildly, having almost instantly recovered from her surprise at seeing him. "'What a pleasure!' "'What are you doing here?' Philia demanded, scowling. "'Philia, don't be rude.' Tabitha said, moving into the room and passing James breezily. Mr. Potter is as welcome among us as I'm sure we would be amongst the Gryffindors. If we don't have good will during these difficult times, what have we got? Good afternoon, Mr. Deedle. Ralph croaked something from the couch, looking remarkably awkward and uncomfortable. Philia continued to stare hard at James, her expression openly hostile, but she remained silent. "'It's a shame about the Gryffindor Quidditch team,' Tabitha called from a corner of the room as she hung up her cloak. "'We always love a Gryffindor versus Slytherin match for the tournament, don't we, Ralph? "'I'm sure it pains your friends not to be out scrimmaging with us as we speak, James. "'Please give them our sympathies. "'By the way,' Tabitha crossed the room again, heading towards the stairs to the girls' sleeping quarters. I saw several of the Ravenclaw players out at the pitch, studying our drills. Interesting that your friend Zane wasn't among them. You haven't seen him, have you? She tapped her broomstick on the floor idly, watching James's face. James shook his head, not daring to speak. Hmm, Tabitha murmured thoughtfully. Curious, that. Nevertheless, come, Philia. James watched, horrified, as Tabitha and Philia began to climb the steps. He thought furiously, trying to invent a quick diversion, but nothing came. Sawdust! A pair of muffled voices suddenly squeaked. Both Tabitha and Philia stopped in their tracks. Philia, on the first step, whipped around angrily. Tabitha, ahead of her, turned much more slowly, a look of polite wonderment on her face. Did you say something? she asked James slowly. James coughed. Uh, no, sorry. Got a, um, frog in my throat. Tabitha watched him for a long moment, then tilted her head slightly and narrowed her eyes at Ralph. Finally, she turned away and disappeared up the rest of the stairs, with Philia following, glancing back furiously. After a few moments, their footsteps could be heard from above. There were no angry screams or sounds of struggle. Quack, crotty blighter, quacked the muffled voices again. That crazy loon, Ralph rasped, jumping up and grabbing his bag. What's he doing? Come on, James said, lunging towards the door. If he's still up there, we can't help him. 
They both ran out into the hallway and threaded their way around several random corridors before finally stopping. Panting and hearts pounding, they dug their rubber ducks out of their bags, each examining his own even though they were identical. Two words were scrawled on the bottom of the ducks in black ink. Laundry room. That crazy loon, Ralph said again, but he was almost laughing with relief. Figgle just took him down to the cellars with the rest of the dirty sheets. I say we leave him there. James grinned. No, let's go get him before they try to stick him in the ringer. He probably deserves it, but first I want to know what he might have found out. The two boys ran to find the washrooms in the cellar. James stopped only once to ask directions from an annoyingly observant servant in a painting of a gaggle of dining knights. I hardly had two minutes to look around before Figgle came up the stairs like a cannonball, Zane told James and Ralph when they found him in the washrooms. She threw a handful of pink dust at me, and then pow, I'm down here. Ralph was looking around in awe at the enormous copper vats and the clanking machinery of the washers. Elves bustled around them, ignoring the three boys completely as they moved through the hive of their basement workspace. Two elves on a catwalk above the vats were dumping wheelbarrows of powdered soap into the frothing water. White flakes filled the air and stuck like snow in the boy's hair. Trust me, this all gets a lot less interesting after two minutes or so, Zane said tersely. Especially when the lollipop guild here won't let you leave. Three elves were clustered around Zane, looking at him with obvious hostility. Figgle brings a human down to the washrooms. We keeps him until someone explains why, the oldest and grumpiest elf said in a gravelly voice. Spolishy! Humans interfering with elf work is against Hogwarts' code of conduct and practices. Section 30, paragraph 6. So then, who be you two? James and Ralph exchanged blank looks. Ralph said, We're his, well, we're his friends, aren't we? We came to bring him back upstairs. Did you then? the elf said with a penetrating glare. Figgle tells a story about this human trying to do her work, she does. Says he was going on about elf welfare and such builds. She was fair upset. Can't have that sort of thing, you know. We got a coalition agreement with the school. He won't do it again, James soothed. He meant well, but he's a bit dim about such things, isn't he? I'm sorry, he got out of our hands for a minute. Won't happen again. Zane acted offended, but stayed wisely silent. The head elf scowled thoughtfully at James. James was used to elves being subservient and meek, or at least politely surly. Here in their working realm, the rules appeared to be quite different. The elves had a coalition agreement with the school, the head elf had said. It almost sounded like they'd unionized, and that an essential rule of the elf union was that only elves did elf work. Perhaps they viewed it as job security. James wasn't sure if Aunt Hermione would view this as an improvement or a setback. Finally, the head elf grumbled. I'm going against my better judgments, you know. The three of yous are on probation. Any more interference with elfish protocol and I'll have you before the headmistress. We got a coalition agreement, you know. So I hear, Zane muttered, rolling his eyes. But you don't even know our names, Ralph pointed out. How are we on probation if you don't know who we are? James elbowed him in the ribs. The head elf grinned at his fellows, who smiled back a bit disconcertingly. We're elves, he said simply. Now off with yous, and let's hope we don't see you again. The corridors leading out of the washrooms were, not surprisingly, small and short, with half-sized steps that forced James, Zane and Ralph to mince carefully as they climbed them. I don't know whether to congratulate you or kick you. Ralph said to Zane. You almost got us caught by Corsica and Goyle. But I did get into the Slytherin girls' sleeping quarters, Zane pointed out with a grin. How many people can say that? Or would want to, James added. Be nice or I won't tell you what I found. It'd better be good. It's not, Zane sighed. The girls' quarters have big wooden wardrobes alongside each bed. Only one of them was open, but I got a peek inside. Let's just say I'm not wondering where Tabitha keeps her broom anymore. They reached a larger door at the end of a flight of minuscule stairs. James pushed it open, thankful to be out of the heat and noise of the washrooms. What do you mean? Well, they're magical wardrobes, of course. 
although they don't lead to any fairy wonderlands. The one I looked into looked like a combination vanity and walk-in closet. Seemed like a boutique had exploded in there, to tell you the truth. One of those really froofy ones, but with a gothic vampire flair to it. There was a bottle of vanishing cream on the vanity, and from the looks of it, I don't think the vanishing part was a metaphor. All the girls have a wardrobe like that? Ralph asked. Sure looked like it. James frowned. Our chances of getting into the Slithering Girls' quarters again are pretty much zero, and even if we could, how would we even know which wardrobe was Corsica's, much less even get it open? I told you this was going to be really impossible, Ralph reminded James. Smelled like my grandma's dresser in there too, Zane said. Oh, just give it a rest, James exclaimed. This is serious. We still don't know where the Hall of Elders Crossing is, or when Jackson and Delacroix are planning to bring the elements together. For all we know, it could be tonight. So, Ralph said, like you said, they can't do anything without all the relics. Zane sighed, turning sober. Yeah, but if they try it and nothing works, then they'll hide the rest of the relics and we'll never get to them. Ralph threw up his hands. Well, there's got to be another way then. I mean, she has to take her broom out of her wardrobe sometimes, right? We saw her with it today. What if we nick it somehow during a Quidditch match or something? Zane grinned. I like that, especially if we can do it when she's a hundred feet or so in the air. Impossible again, James said in frustration. Ever since my dad's day, there have been protective spells all around the pitch to keep people from interfering with matches. There were a few instances where dark wizards tried to use spells to hurt him or throw him off his broom. Once, a bunch of Dementors swarmed right onto the pitch. Ever since, there have been boundary areas set up by officials. No spells can get in or out. What's a Dementor? Ralph asked, his eyes widening. You don't want to know, Ralph, trust me. Well then, looks like we're back to square one, Zane said dourly. I'm all out of ideas. Ralph stopped suddenly in the middle of the corridor. Zane bumped into the larger boy, stumbling backwards, but Ralph didn't seem to notice. He was staring hard at one of the paintings lining the corridor. James noticed it was the one they had stopped at earlier to ask for directions to the laundry room. The very observant servant in the rear corner of the painting had caught James's attention on the way down, but only as someone they could get directions from. James had become almost inured to the random, watchful characters in the paintings all over Hogwarts. The servant stared sullenly out at Ralph as the knights in the painting hoisted their tankards and turkey drumsticks, slapping each other happily on their partially armoured backs. Oh, great, Zane said, rubbing his shoulder where he'd run into Ralph. Look what you've done, James. Now Ralph's obsessed with every fifteenth painting. And not even the good ones, if you ask me. You two are the weirdest art lovers I've ever met. James took a step closer to the painting as well, studying the servant standing in the shadowy background with a large cloth over his shoulder. The figure took half a step backwards, and James felt sure that it was trying to blend further into the dim recesses of the painted hall. What, Ralph? he asked. I've seen that before, Ralph answered in a distracted voice. Well, we just stopped at this painting not ten minutes ago, didn't we? Yeah, it looked familiar then, too, but I couldn't place it. He's standing different now. Ralph suddenly dropped to one knee, flinging his backpack onto the floor in front of him. He unzipped it quickly and dug inside almost frantically, as if worried that whatever inspiration had struck him would flee before he could confirm it. He finally produced a book, gripped it triumphantly, and stood up again, riffling towards the back. Zane and James crowded behind him, trying to see over Ralph's broad shoulders. James recognised the book. It was the antique potions book his mum and dad had given Ralph for Christmas. As Ralph flipped through the pages, James could see the notes and formulae that crowded the margins, crammed alongside doodled drawings and diagrams. Suddenly, Ralph stopped flipping. He held the book open with both hands and slowly raised it so that it was level to the observant servant in the background of the painting. James gasped. It's the same dude, Zane said, pointing. Sure enough, there in the right-hand margin of one of the last pages of the potions book was an old pencil sketch of the observant servant. It was unmistakably the same figure, right down to the hook nose and the sullen, stooped pose. 
The painted version recoiled from the book slightly and then crossed the hall as swiftly as it could without actually running. It stopped behind one of the pillars lining the opposite side of the painted hall. The knights at the table ignored it. James, watching intently, narrowed his eyes. I knew it looked familiar, Ralph said triumphantly. He was in a different position when we first came across him, so I didn't place it straight off. Just now, though, he was in exactly the same pose as the drawing in this book. Now that is weird. Can I see? James asked. Ralph shrugged and handed the book to James. James bent over it, flipping back to the front of the book. The margins in the first hundred pages were filled mostly with notes and spells, many with sections scribbled out and rewritten in a different colour, as if the writer of the notes was refining his work. By the middle of the book, though, drawings and doodles began to crowd in with the notes. They were sketchy, but quite good. James recognised many of them. Here was a rough sketch of the woman in the background of the painting of the King's Court. A few pages later, he found two quite detailed drawings of the fat wizard with the bald head from the painting of the Poisoning of Pericles. Again and again, he recognised the sketches as the characters in the paintings all over Hogwarts, the secondary figures who had been watching James and his friends with avid, unconcealed interest. Amazing, James said in a low, awed voice. All these drawings are from paintings all over the school. You see? Ralph squinted at the drawings in the book, then back at the painting again. He shrugged. It's weird, but not all that amazing, is it? I mean, the guy who owned this book was probably also a student here, right? Sounds like he was a Slytherin like me. That's why your dad gave me the book. So whoever he was, he liked art. Lots of art lovers sketch from paintings. Big deal. Zane's brow furrowed as he looked back and forth between the drawing of the observant servant and his painted equivalent, who was still skulking near the pillars in the background. No, these aren't just sketches, he said, shaking his head slowly. These are the originals, or so close it's impossible to tell the difference. Don't ask me how I know, I just know. Whoever sketched these drawings was either a master forger or he was the actual artist. Ralph thought about it for a moment, and then shook his head. That doesn't even begin to make sense. These paintings were painted at lots of different times. No way one bloke was responsible for all of them. Besides, a lot of these paintings are old, way older than this book. It makes perfect sense, James said, clapping the potions book shut and looking down at the cover. Whoever painted these didn't paint the whole paintings. Think about it. Not a single one of these sketched characters is of a dominant person in any of the paintings. Every one of them is a drawing of some totally unimportant background character. Whoever drew these just added the characters into existing paintings. Zane cinched up the corner of his mouth and furrowed his brow. Why would anyone do that? It's like graffiti, but nobody would notice it except the guy who painted it. What's the fun in that? James was also thinking hard. He nodded slightly to himself, looking down at the old book in his hands again. I think I have an idea, he said, narrowing his eyes thoughtfully. We'll find out for sure, tonight. Come on, Ralph, James complained in a harsh whisper. Quit tugging, you're yanking it up, you can see my feet. I can't help it, Ralph moaned, crouching down as far as he could. I know you said your dad and his mates used to do this all the time, but one of them was a girl, remember? Yeah, and she didn't eat seven meals a day either, Zane said. The three of them shuffled down the darkened corridor, crammed under the invisibility cloak. They'd met at the base of the staircases, and apart from one tense moment when Stephen Metzger, the Gryffindor prefect and brother of Noah, had passed them in the hall, singing slightly off-key, they had encountered no one. When they reached the junction near the statue of the One-Eyed Witch, James directed them to stop. The three of them manoeuvred clumsily into a corner, and James opened the marauder's map. "'I don't see why all three of us need to do this anyway.' Ralph complained. I trust you two. You could have just told me about it tomorrow at breakfast. You seemed plenty excited about it when we planned this, Ralph and Ader, Zane whispered. You can't lose your nerve now. It was daytime then, and I wasn't born with any nerve, just so you know. Shh, James hissed. Zane bent over the map. Is anyone coming? James shook his head. 
No, look safe. Filch is in his office downstairs. I don't know if he ever sleeps, but for now at least the coast is clear. Ralph straightened up, pulling the invisibility cloak a foot off the floor. Then why are we under this thing at all? It's tradition, James said, without looking up from the map. Besides, Zane added, what good's having an invisibility cloak if we don't use it to float around the halls unseen every now and then? There's nobody to see us anyway, Ralph pointed out. James directed them towards the right angle of the junction, and they shuffled on. Soon enough, they came to the gargoyle guarding the stairway to the headmistress's office. James could tell it was watching their feet under the raised cloak, even though it remained perfectly still. James hoped that the password hadn't changed since he had accompanied Neville to the headmistress's office a few months earlier. He cleared his throat and said quietly, Uh, gallow water? The gargoyle, which was relatively new, having replaced the one that had been damaged in the Battle of Hogwarts, stirred slightly, making a sound like a mausoleum door grating open. Is that the one with the forest green field and the sky blue and red patterns? It asked in a carefully measured voice. I can never remember. James conferred in harsh whispers with Ralph and Zane. Forest green field? I don't even know what it is. It's just the word Neville used to get in. How do you answer the question then? Zane asked. It didn't ask him any questions. It's a tartan pattern, I think, Ralph rasped. My grandmum is mad about them. Just say yes. Are you sure? Of course I'm not sure. Say no, then. How should I know? James turned back to the gargoyle, which seemed to be staring fixedly at James's shoes. Uh, yes, yeah, sure. The gargoyle rolled its eyes. Lucky guess. It straightened and stood aside, revealing the entry to the spiral staircase. The three boys shuffled towards it and clambered onto the lower steps. As soon as all three were on it, the staircase began to rise slowly, carrying them up with it. The hall outside the headmistress's office lowered into view before them, and they stumbled into it, swearing and jostling each other under the cloak. That's it, Ralph said in an annoyed voice. He yanked at the cloak, struggling out from underneath it, and then let out a stifled shriek. James and Zane pulled the cloak off their heads and glanced around nervously, looking for whatever had startled Ralph. The ghost of Cedric Diggory was standing in front of them, smiling mischievously. You really got to stop doing that, Ralph said breathlessly. Sorry, Cedric said in his far-off voice. I was asked to be here. Who asked you? James inquired, trying to keep the annoyance out of his voice. The hair on the back of his neck was still prickling. How would anyone know we were coming here tonight? Cedric just smiled and then gestured towards the heavy door that led into the headmistress's office. It was shut tight. How do you plan to get past that? James felt his face heat a little in embarrassment. I forgot about that, he admitted. Locked, is it? Cedric nodded. Don't worry about it. That's why I'm here, I guess. The ghost turned and walked effortlessly through the door. A moment later, the three boys heard the sounds of sliding bolts. The door swung open silently, and Cedric grinned, welcoming them in. James entered first, and Zane and Ralph were surprised to see him turn immediately away from the headmistress's massive desk. The room was extremely dim, but for the reddish light of the banked fireplace. James lit his wand and held it up. Get that thing out of my face, Potter, a voice drawled quietly. You'll wake the rest with it, and I suspect that this is meant to be a private conversation. James lowered his wand again and glanced around at the rest of the portraits. All of them were sleeping in various poses, snoring gently. Yeah, you're right, James agreed. Sorry. So, you deduced a version of the truth, I see, the portrait of Severus Snape said, his black eyes locked on James. Tell me what you believe you know. It wasn't much of a deduction, really, James admitted, glancing at Ralph. He figured it out. He's got the book. Snape rolled his eyes. That blasted book has been more trouble than it was ever worth. I should have destroyed it when I had the chance. Do continue. 
James took a deep breath. Well, I knew something was going on when I noticed all those characters in the paintings watching us. I also knew they all looked a little familiar, even though they were all really different. I don't think I'd have made the connection if Ralph hadn't shown me the drawings in the potions book, though. I knew the book had belonged to a Slytherin my dad had loads of respect for, so I thought of you, and it all just came together. You painted all those characters into the paintings all over the school, and every one of them is a portrait of you, but in disguise. That's how you've been watching us. You spread yourself out through all those paintings. And since you are the original artist, nobody else can ever destroy the portraits. It was your way of assuring you could always keep an eye on things, even after death. Snape studied James, scowling. Finally, he nodded slightly. Yes, Potter, quite true. Few knew it, but I had some natural inclination towards the task. Being adept at potions... Mixing the necessary enchanted paints was the simple part. It did take me quite some time to hone my rendering skills enough to modify the paintings, but as with any other art, painting was mainly a matter of practice and study. I agree with you, however, that you would have never made the connection if it weren't for my own blind arrogance in allowing that book to continue to exist. I may have been a genius, but pride has been the downfall of greater geniuses than myself. Nevertheless, it has proved to be a very successful endeavour. I have been able to observe you and the rest of this school's operations rather freely. So tell me, why do you come to me now? To gloat over your luck? No, James said firmly, and then paused. He didn't want to say what he'd come to say. He was afraid Snape would laugh at him, or worse, refuse their request. We came... we came to ask for your help. Snape's expression didn't change. He regarded James seriously for a long moment. You came to ask for help, he said, as if confirming he'd heard James correctly. James nodded. Snape narrowed his eyes slightly. James Potter, I had never have suspected it, but you have finally impressed me. Your father's greatest weakness was his refusal to seek assistance from those better and more knowledgeable than him. He always required their help in the end, but usually to their great and sometimes final detriment. You seem to have thrown off that weakness, albeit reluctantly. If you had come to this realization a few weeks ago, we might not have had to rely on pure fortune and good timing to save you from a fate worse than death. James nodded again. Yeah, thanks for that. I know it was you who sent Cedric to help when we were going to open Jackson's case. Foolhardy and ignorant, Potter. You might have known better. Although, I admit, I'd have been surprised if you had. The robe is exceedingly dangerous, and you are stupendously negligent to keep it here. As much as I am loath to admit it, you should turn it over immediately to your father. What do you know about the Merlin conspiracy, then? James asked excitedly, ignoring the rebuke. I know little more than you do, unfortunately. Other than the wealth of knowledge I've accumulated through my studies of the legend and the multitude of previous attempts to facilitate the return of Merlinus Ambrosius, a study I can assure you would have proven far more helpful to you than your current ridiculous fantasies of capturing the Merlin staff. Why are they ridiculous? Zane asked, stepping a bit closer. Ah, the jester speaks, Snape sneered in a low voice. Mr. Walker, I believe. It's a fair question, James said, glancing at Zane. The staff is probably even more dangerous than the robe. We can't let it be controlled by the sorts of people who believe Voldemort was just some misunderstood sweetie who wanted everybody to be pals. 
And who might these people be, then, Potter? Snape asked silkily. Well, tap at the Corsica, for one. Snape regarded James with open contempt. Typical Gryffindor prejudice. Prejudice? James exclaimed. Whose house is it that believes that all muggle-born wizards are weaker stock than the purebloods? Whose house invented the term mudblood? Don't ever say that word in front of me again, Potter, Snape said dangerously. You believe you speak of what you know, but let me save you from your ignorance by reminding you that what you know is as limited as it is one-sided. Easy judgments about individuals based on their house of origin is another of your father's greatest mistakes. I had hoped that you would surpass that as well, based on your own choice of companions. Snape's black eyes darted to Ralph, who had hung back, watching silently. Well, Ralph's different, isn't he? James said weakly. Snape responded quickly, his eyes still on the larger boy. Is he? Different from what, Mr. Potter? What precisely do you believe you know about the members of Mr. Deedle's house? Or, dare I ask, Mr. Deedle himself? I know what the tree sprite told us, James said, rounding on the portrait, his voice rising in anger. I know that there is a bloodline of Voldemort alive in these halls even now. His blood beats in a different heart. The heir of Voldemort is alive, and he walks among us. And what makes you so certain, Snape said sharply, that this heir is a Slytherin or a male? James opened his mouth to answer and then closed it again. He realized that the Dryad had never actually said either of those things. Well, it just makes sense, Snape nodded the sneer creeping back into his face. Does it? Perhaps you haven't learned anything after all, then. Snape sighed, and he seemed genuinely disappointed. What did you come to ask, Potter? I see you are determined in your course, regardless of what I say. So let's get this over with. James felt small in front of the portrait of the former headmaster. Zane and Ralph stood further back, and James knew it was his question to ask. This was his battle more than it was theirs. His battle against the Merlin conspiracy, yes, but more importantly, his battle against himself and the shadow of his father. He raised his eyes to Snape's black gaze. If we can't get the Merlin staff, I need to go to the Hall of Elders Crossing. I need to stop them there before they can hide the staff and the throne forever. James heard the movement of Zane and Ralph behind him. He turned back to them. I won't ask you two to come, but I'm committed. I have to try to stop them. Snape sighed hugely. <sighs> Potter, you really are just as foolish and preposterously self-absorbed as your father. Turn the robe over. Give it to your father or the headmistress. They will know what to do. I will advise them. You cannot possibly hope to manage this on your own. You've impressed me once. Do try to accomplish that again. No, James said with conviction. If I tell them, Jackson and Delacroix and whoever else will get away. You know it just like I do. Then two of the relics will be lost forever. Without all three together, the power of the relics is broken. But not destroyed, James insisted. They are still powerful on their own. We can't let them be used by those who try to continue Voldemort's work. We can't risk them falling into the hands of Voldemort's heir. Snape scowled. If such a person exists, that's not a risk worth taking. James countered. Where is the Hall of Elders crossing? You do not know what you are asking, Potter, Snape said dismissively. We'll find out somehow, James, Zane said, stepping forward again. We don't need this old pile of paint to tell us. We've worked everything out so far. We'll figure this out, too. You've survived on suspicious good fortune and the interference of myself alone. 
Snape growled. Do not forget your place, boy. It's true, Ralph said. James and Zane turned to look at him, surprised to hear him speak. Ralph swallowed and went on. We have done pretty well so far. I don't really know who you are, Mr. Snape, but as grateful as we are for you helping us when James put on the robe, I think James is right. We need to try and stop them and get the rest of the relics. You were a Slytherin, and you said that the things they say about Slytherins aren't always right. Well, one of the things they say about Slytherins is that we always just look out for ourselves. I don't want that to be true. I'm with James and Zane, even if we fail, no matter what. Snape had listened to this sudden speech from Ralph with a steely eye and a tight frown. When Ralph finished, he glanced at all three of the boys in succession and then heaved another sigh. <sighs> You're all completely daft, he said flatly. This is a pointless and destructive fantasy. Where's the Hall of Elders Crossing? James asked again. Snape regarded him, shaking his head minutely. As I said, Potter, you do not know what you are asking. Zane spoke up. Why not? Because the Hall of Elders Crossing is not a place, Mr. Walker. You of all people should have recognized that. If any of you had been paying even a shred of attention for the last several months, you'd know it. The Hall of Elders Crossing is an event. Think about it for a moment, Mr. Walker. Elders Crossing. Zane blinked. Elders, he said thoughtfully. Wait a minute. That's what the astronomers of the Middle Ages called the astrological signs. The planets. They called them the Elder Ones. So the Hall of Elders Crossing, James concentrated, and then widened his eyes in revelation. The alignment of the planets. The Hall of Elders Crossing is when all the planets cross each other in their paths, when they make a hall. The alignment of the planets, Ralph agreed in an awed voice. It's not a place, but a time. Snape stared hard at all three boys. It's both, he said resignedly. It's the moment the planets align, and it's the place that all three of the relics of Merlinus Ambrosius are brought together. That alone is when and where the return of Merlin can be accomplished. That is his requirement. And unless I am greatly mistaken, if you mean to go through with this foolhardy plan of yours, you have less than one week. Zane snapped his fingers. That's why the voodoo queen's been drilling us to work out the exact moment of the alignment. She said it would be a night we'd never forget, and she meant it. That's when they mean to bring the relics together. The grotto keep, James whispered. They'll do it there. The throne is already there. The other two boys nodded. James felt flushed with fear and excitement. He looked at the portrait of Severus Snape. Thanks. Don't thank me. Take my advice. If you plan to go through with this, I will not be able to help you. No one will. Don't be a fool. James backed away, extinguishing his wand and pocketing it. Come on, you two. Let's get back. Snape watched as James consulted the Marauder's map. It wasn't Snape's first encounter with the map. On one occasion, the map had insulted him fairly cheekily. Having assured themselves that Filch was still in his office, the three crowded back under the invisibility cloak and shuffled back through the door of the headmistress's office and into the hall. Snape considered waking Filch, who he knew was sleeping in his office with a half-empty bottle of fire whiskey on his desk. One of Snape's self-portraits resided in a hunting painting in Filch's office, and Snape could easily use that painting to alert Filch to the three boys sneaking. Reluctantly, he decided not to. Like it or not, such petty tricks gave him little pleasure any more. The ghost of Cedric Diggory, who Snape had come to recognize before anyone else, closed the door behind the boys and shot the bolt. Thank you, Mr. Diggory, Snape said quietly amidst the snores of the other paintings. Feel free to accompany them back to their dormitories, or not. I don't much care. Cedric nodded to Snape. Snape knew the ghost didn't like to talk to him, 
something about a ghost talking to a painting seemed to disturb the boy. Nothing technically human on either end, Snape figured. Cedric dismissed himself and walked through the locked wooden door. One of the paintings near Snape stopped snoring. He isn't precisely like his father, is he? A thoughtful older voice said. Snape settled back into his portrait. He's only like him in the worst of ways. He's a potter. Now who's passing easy judgments? The other voice said with a hint of teasing. It's not an easy judgment. I've watched him. He's as arrogant and foolish as the others that bore his last name. Don't pretend you don't see it. I see that he came to ask for your help. Snape nodded grudgingly. One can only hope that the instinct has a chance to mature. He asked for help only when he ran out of other options. And he didn't, you'll notice, actually take any of my advice. The older voice was silent for a moment, and then asked, Will you tell Minerva? Perhaps, Snape said, considering. Perhaps not. For now, I will do as I've done all along. I will watch. You believe there is a chance he and his friends might succeed, then? Snape didn't answer. A minute later, the older voice spoke again. He is being manipulated. He doesn't know it. Snape nodded. I assumed there was no point in telling him. You're probably right, Severus. You have an instinct for such things. Snape replied pointedly. I learned when not to talk from the master, Albus. Indeed you did, Severus. Indeed you did. Chapter 15 The Muggle Spy Martin J. Prescott was a reporter. He always thought of the word as if it were capitalised. For Martin, being a reporter was more than a job. It was his identity. He wasn't just another face reading from a teleprompter or another name next to a dateline. He was what the producers in the age of the 24-hour news cycle called a personality. He accented the news. He framed it. He coloured it. Not in any negative way, or so he firmly believed. He simply added that subtle dash of flair that made news into news. In other words, something people might want to watch or read. For one thing, Martin J. Prescott had the look. He wore white button-down shirts with jeans, and he usually had his shirt sleeves rolled up a bit. If he wore a tie, it was invariably of an impeccable style, but loosened just a tad, enough to say, Yes, I've been working extremely hard, but I respect my viewers enough to maintain a degree of professionalism. Martin was thin, youngish, with sharp, handsome features and very dark hair that always looked windblown and fabulous. But, as Martin was proud of saying to the attendees at the occasional press club breakfast, his appearance wasn't what made him a reporter. It was his sense of people and of news. He knew how to plug the one into the other in a way that produced the biggest emotional jolt. But the last thing that made Martin J. Prescott a reporter was that he loved the story. Where the other high-paid and high-profile news faces had long since assembled a team of lackeys to tramp far and wide, collecting footage and filming interviews, while they themselves huddled in their dressing rooms reading about their ratings, Martin prided himself in doing all his own travel and research. The truth of it was that Martin enjoyed the reporting, but what he absolutely loved was the chase. Being a member of the press was like being a hunter, except that the former aimed with a camera rather than a gun. Martin liked to stalk his prey himself. He delighted in the pursuit, in the blurry jostle of handheld camera footage, the shouted, perfectly timed question, the long stakeout of a courtroom back door or a suspicious hotel room. Martin did it all himself, often alone, often filming himself in the act, providing his viewers breathless moments of high tension and confrontation, 
No one else did it like him, and this had made him famous. Martin had, as they say of the very best reporters, a nose for news. His nose told him that the story he was chasing right now, if it panned out, if he could simply provide the real, unadulterated footage, was quite possibly the story of a lifetime. Even now, crouched among the brush and weeds, dirty and salty, with two days' worth of sweat, his fabulous hair matted and soiled with twigs and leaves, even after all the setbacks and failures, he still felt this was the story that would cement his career. In fact, the harder he'd had to work for it, the more doggedly he'd pursued it. Even after the ghost, even after being kicked out of a third-story window by a homicidal kid, even after his harrowing brush with the gigantic spider, Martin viewed setbacks as proof of value. The harder it was, the more it was worth pursuing. He took a grim satisfaction in knowing that, had he merely hired a team of investigators to check this out, they'd have turned back months ago, when they'd first met the strange, magical resistance of the place, without a solitary blip of a story. This was the kind of story that could only be told by him. This, he told himself with satisfaction, was Anchorman material. No more field reports, no more special interest segments. If this panned out, Martin J. Prescott would be able to pave his own way in any major newsroom in the country. But why stop there? With this under his belt, he could anchor anywhere in the world, couldn't he? But no, he told himself, one mustn't think of such things now. He had a job to do, a difficult and outrageously demanding job, but Martin took pleasure in the sense that the hardest part was behind him. After months of plotting and arranging, planning and observing, the time had finally come for the big payoff, for all the bets to be called in. Granted, if this last phase of the hunt didn't work out exactly as planned, he'd walk away with nothing. He'd been unable to get any usable, convincing footage on his own, except for the handheld camera video of that incredible flying contest a few months back. That might have been enough, but even that had been lost, sacrificed reluctantly to the gigantic spider during his escape through the woods. It didn't do to dwell on failures, though. No, this would work. It would go exactly as planned. It had to. He was Martin J. Prescott. Still crouched at the perimeter of the forest, Martin checked the connections of his mobile phone. Most of his field gear had gone completely buggy ever since he made it through the forest. His palm top barely worked at all, and when it did, it exhibited some very strange behaviour. The night before last, he'd been trying to use it to access his office computer, when the screen suddenly went entirely pink and began to display the lyrics to a rather rude song about hedgehogs. Fortunately, his camera and mobile phone had worked relatively well until the incident with the spider. His phone was nearly all he had left now, and despite the fact that the display screen showed a strange mixture of numbers, exclamation marks and hieroglyphics, it did seem to be maintaining a connection. Satisfied, Martin spoke. I'm huddled outside the castle at this moment, hidden in the arms of the forest that has been my occasional home during these last gruelling months. Up until now, I have simply watched, careful not to disturb what might only be a simple country school or a boarding facility, despite the reports of my sources. Still, I am confident that the time has finally come for me to approach. If my sources are wrong, I will merely be met with puzzlement and that rare brand of careful good humour that is the purview of the Scottish countryside. If, however, my sources prove correct, as I suspect, based on my inexplicable experiences so far, then I may well be walking into the clutches of my own doom. I am now standing. It is mid-morning, about nine o'clock, but I see no sign of anyone. I am leaving the safety of my hiding place. I am entering the grounds. Martin crept carefully around the edge of the ramshackle cabin near the forest. The enormous, shaggy man he'd often spied in and around the cabin was not anywhere in sight. 
Martin straightened, determining to be bold about his initial approach. He began to cross the neatly cropped field between the cabin and the castle. In truth, he did not believe he was in grave peril. He had an innate sense that the greatest dangers were behind him in that creepy and mysterious forest. He had indeed camped on the fringes of that forest, far on the side opposite the castle, where the trees seemed rather more normal and there were fewer unsettling noises in the night. Still, his travels back and forth through the densest parts of that forest had been strange, to say the least. Apart from the spider, which he had only escaped by sheer good luck, he hadn't actually seen anything. In a sense, he thought it might have been better if he had. A known monstrosity like the spider is far easier to deal with than the unknown phantoms conjured by Martin's imagination in response to the strange noises he'd heard on those long woodland walks. He had been shadowed, he knew. Large things, heavy things, had followed him, always off to the left or right, hidden just behind the density of the trees. He knew they were watching him, and he also sensed that, unlike the spider, they were intelligent. They might have been hostile, but they were certainly curious. Martin had almost dared to call out to them, to demand they reveal themselves. Finally, remembering the spider, he decided that, after all, maybe an unseen monster that is merely curious is better than a seen monster that feels provoked. The castle, as I have mentioned, is positively huge. Martin said into the small microphone clipped to his lapel. The microphone was connected to the phone on his belt. I've travelled much of this continent and seen quite a variety of castles, but I've never seen anything so simultaneously ancient and yet immaculately maintained. The windows, apart from the one I was forced through those months ago, are beautifully sturdy and colourful. The stonework here doesn't show so much as a crack. This wasn't entirely true, but it was true enough. It is a beautiful spring day, fortunately, clear and relatively warm. I am not hiding myself at all as I cross to the enormous gates which are open. There, there seems to be a gathering over to my right on a sort of field. I, I can't quite tell, but it looks as if they are playing football. I can't say that I expected that. They don't seem to be paying me any attention. I am continuing to the gates. As Martin entered the gates, he finally began to be noticed. He slowed, still maintaining a steady course onward. His goal was simply to get as far into the castle as possible. He had purposefully left his still camera behind. Cameras in nearly every circumstance incite resistance. People with cameras get thrown out of places, Yet simply walking into a place, walking confidently and purposefully, may be met with curiosity, but they are not usually stopped. At least, not until it is too late. The courtyard was dotted with young people moving here and there in knots. They wore black robes over white shirts and ties. Many carried backpacks or books. The ones nearest Martin turned to watch him pass, mostly out of curiosity. There are, there are what appear for all the world to be school pupils, Martin said quietly into his microphone, sidling past students as he worked across the courtyard. Young people in robes, all school age. They seem surprised at my presence, but not hostile. In fact, as I am now approaching the entryway into the castle proper, it appears that I have elicited the attention of virtually everyone. Excuse me! This last was said to Ted Lupin, who had just appeared in the doorway with Noah Metzger and Sabrina Hildegard. All three of them stopped talking instantly as the strange man in the white shirt and loosened tie slipped between them. The quill in Sabrina's hair wobbled as she turned to watch him. "'Who's he talking to?' Ted said. "'And who the ruddy hell is he?' Sabrina added. The trio turned in the open doorway, watching the man work his way carefully into the entry hall. Students parted for him, recognising immediately that this man was rather out of place. Still, no one seemed particularly alarmed. There were even a few puzzled grins. Martin went on speaking into his microphone. More and more of what I must for the time being call students, 
There are dozens of them around me at the moment. I am moving through a sort of main hall. There are chandeliers, great doorways, statues, paintings. The paintings. The paintings. The paintings. For the first time, Martin seemed at a loss for words. He forgot the students gathering around him, watching him as he took two steps towards one of the larger paintings lining the entry hall. In the painting, a group of ancient wizards were clustered around a large crystal ball, their white beards illuminated in its glow. One of the wizards noticed the staring man in the white shirt and tie. He straightened and scowled. "'You're out of uniform, young man!' the wizard exclaimed sternly. "'You look a fright! I dare say you have a leaf in your hair!' "'The paintings... the paintings are...' Martin said, his voice an octave higher than normal. He coughed and gathered himself. The paintings are moving. They are, for lack of a better term, like painted movies, but alive. They are addressing me. I address equals, young man, the wizard said. I command the likes of you. Be gone, ruffian. There was a smattering of laughter from the crowding students, but there was also a growing sense of nervousness. Nobody was ever amazed at the moving paintings. This man was either a nutter of a wizard, or he was... well, it was unthinkable. A muggle could not get into Hogwarts. The students formed a large circle around him, as if he were a mildly dangerous animal. The students have hemmed me in, Martin said, turning around, his eyes rather wild. I'm going to attempt to break through, however. I must move further in. As Martin proceeded, the perimeter of students broke apart easily, following him. There was a murmuring now. Nervous chatter followed the man, and he began to raise his voice. I'm entering a large chamber, quite high. I've been here before, but late at night in the dark. Yes, this is the hall of moving staircases. Very treacherous. Remarkable mechanics at work here, and yet no sound of machinery at all. What's he saying about machinery? Someone in the crowding students called. Who is this bloke, anyway? What's he doing here? There was a chorus of confused responses. Martin pushed on, turning past the staircases, almost shouting now. My presence is beginning to cause some resistance. I may be stopped at any moment. I... I am bypassing the stairs. Martin turned a corner and found himself in the midst of a group of students playing winkles and augers in a bright alcove. He stopped suddenly and recoiled as the auger, an old quaffle, stopped three inches from his face, floating and turning slowly. Oi! What are you thinking? Just walking right out into the middle of the sodding match, ye? One of the players called, yanking his wand up and retrieving the quaffle. Dangerous, that is. You need to watch yourself. Flying things! Martin squeaked, straightening himself and smoothing his shirt frantically. Aye! Wands! Actual magical wands! And levitating objects! This is perfectly remarkable. I've never seen... Hey, no, another of the Winkles and Augers players said sharply. Who is this? What's he going on about? Someone else yelled, Who let him in? He's a muggle. Got to be. It's the man from the Quidditch pitch. The intruder. The crowd began to yell and jostle. Martin ducked past the Winkles and Augers players, losing some of the pursuing crowd. I'm pressing in further still. Corridors leading everywhere. Here is, uh, as far as I can tell, it is a corridor of classrooms. I'm entering the first one. He burst into the first classroom on his right, followed by a stream of confused, yelling students. The room was long and recessed. The students attending the class turned in their seats, seeking the source of the interruption. "'Relatively normal, it seems, on the surface, at least,' Martin yelled over the growing din, scanning the room. "'Students! Textbooks! A teacher of some kind! Who? Who? Who?' Again, Martin's voice rose, and he seemed to be losing control of it. 
His eyes boggled and he ran out of breath. His mouth continued to work, making hoarse, raspy sounds. At the front of the class, the ghostly Professor Binns, whose grasp on the temporal realm was tentative at best, had not yet noticed the interruption. He droned on, his voice high and chiming like wind in a bottle. The professor finally noticed the gasping form of Martin J. Prescott and stopped, frowning. Who is this individual, might I ask? Bin said, peering over his ghostly spectacles. Martin finally dragged a great gulp of air. <gasps> a ghost! he declared tremulously, pointing at Bin's. He began to totter. Just as the students near the doorway were shoved roughly aside by the advancing figures of Professor Longbottom and Headmistress McGonagall, flanked by Ted and Sabrina, Martin fell over in a dead faint. He landed hard against two desks at the rear of the room. The students occupying the desks threw their hands up, lunging to get out of the way. A bottle of ink fell to the floor and shattered. Headmistress McGonagall approached the man swiftly and stopped a few feet away. "'Can anyone please inform me who this man is?' she said in a strident voice. "'And what is he doing fainting dead away in my school?' James Potter shouldered his way to the front of the crowd. He looked at the man collapsed across the desks. He sighed deeply and said, "'I think I can, Professor.' Fifteen minutes later, James, McGonagall, Neville Longbottom and Benjamin Franklin bustled into the headmistress's office, with Martin Prescott stumbling between them. Martin had regained consciousness halfway to the office and had instantly shrieked in horror at the realisation that he was being levitated along the corridor by Neville. Neville, in turn, had been so startled by Martin's shriek that he had nearly dropped him, but had recovered in time to lower the man fairly gently to the floor. Apart from James's explanation that the intruder was the very same man he'd accidentally knocked through the stained glass window and later seen on the Quidditch pitch, the trip to the headmistress's office had progressed with very little conversation. Once the door to her office had closed behind them, McGonagall spoke up. I only want to know who you are, why you are here, and most importantly, how you managed to gain entry she said furiously, stalking behind her desk but remaining upright. Once we have resolved that, you will be removed forthwith, and with nary a glimmer of any memory of what you have seen, I can promise you that. Now speak! Martin swallowed and glanced around at the assembly. He saw James and grimaced, remembering the shattering glass and the sickly fall afterwards. He took a deep breath. First of all, my name is Martin J. Prescott. I work for a news program called Inside View. And second of all, he said, returning his gaze to the headmistress, I have been injured upon these grounds. I don't wish to make a legal matter of it, but you must be aware that it is entirely within my rights to pursue compensation for those injuries. And somehow... I don't get the impression that this domicile is insured exactly. How dare you! McGonagall exclaimed, leaning over her desk and meeting Martin's eyes. You break into this castle, trespass, where you have neither the right nor the understanding to carry yourself. She shook her head and then went on in a lower voice. I will not be baited by threats. You are obviously of muggle origin, so I will practice a modicum of patience with you. Answer my questions willingly, or I will be more than happy to resort to more straightforward means of interrogation. Ah, Martin said, trying to sound confident despite the fact that he was trembling visibly. You must mean something along the lines of this. He reached into his shirt pocket and produced a small vial. James recognised it as the one he had seen in this man's hand when he'd encountered him in the potions cupboard. Yes, I see by your faces that you know what this is. Took me a time to figure it out. Veritas serum, indeed. I put two drops into a colleague's tea, and I couldn't get him to shut up for an hour. I learned things about him I hope I live to forget, I'll tell you. You tested an unknown potion 
on an unsuspecting person? Franklin interrupted. Well, I had to know what it did, didn't I? I figured two drops wouldn't hurt anyone. He shrugged and lifted the bottle again, looking at the light through it. Truth serum. If it was dangerous, you'd hardly have kept it right there on the shelf where just anyone could get to it. McGonagall's face was white with fury. In these halls, we rely on discipline and respect rather than cages and keys. Your friend is fortunate indeed that you didn't happen upon a vial of nagglespake or thaff sap. Don't try to intimidate me, Martin said, obviously quite intimidated in spite of himself. I just wanted to show you that I know your tricks. I've been watching and studying you for quite some time. You won't be getting me to drink any of your potions or performing any brainwashing tricks on me. I'll answer your questions, but only because I expect you to answer some of mine as well. Neville fingered his wand. And why, pray tell, do you believe we won't just bring in an obliviator, have your mind wiped of all memory of this place, and drop you off at the nearest road? Martin tapped the tiny microphone clipped to his lapel. This is why. My voice and everything all of you are saying is being sent through my phone to a computer at my office. Everything is being recorded. In a small town not three kilometers from here is a film crew and a group of experts in a variety of fields whom I have asked to assist me in my investigation. Investigation, the headmistress repeated incredulously, absolutely and unequivocally out of the question. Martin overrode her. One of those individuals is a detective in the British secret police. James felt a palpable silence descend over the room at the mention of the Muggle police. He knew from conversations he'd heard between his dad and other ministry officials that it was one thing to obliviate a single person or even a contained group, but things could get extremely complicated if any official muggle investigative departments became involved. It pays to be owed favours in high places, Martin went on. It took quite a lot to get a ranking detective out here, but I am confident that this is the sort of story one calls in large favours for. There is no official charge yet, of course, since there is no record of any establishment of this size in the area. The point is this. If they do not receive a phone call from me in the next two hours with directions for how to get their gear onto the grounds, they are to return immediately to the office Retrieve the recording of this conversation and everything that has occurred to me here so far, and broadcast it however they see fit. It may seem preposterous to most people, I grant. A school in a castle in the dead of nowhere, teaching kids how to work real magic, wands and all. But your secret will be out nevertheless. Your students may attend here, in this secret location, but they do sometimes go home, do they not? and I'm willing to bet those homes are nowhere near as protected as this. There will be investigations. You will be revealed, one way or another. Headmistress McGonagall's face was as hard and white as a tombstone. She merely stared at the skinny man in the white shirt. Franklin broke the silence. My good sir, you cannot comprehend what you are asking. He took off his glasses and stepped in front of Martin. Your plan would undeniably result in the closing down of this school and possibly many others like it. All those present and many, many more would lose their livelihoods and educations. More importantly, what you are insisting upon is the reintroduction of the entire magical world into the world of muggles, whether either is prepared for that or not. And to what end? Not for the betterment of mankind, I expect. No, I suspect that your aspirations are far more myopic. Please do think before you continue. There are forces at work here that you do not comprehend. Although you may well be acting on behalf of some of them, I suspect that you are not a bad man, or at least not yet a very bad man. Think, my friend, 
before you make a choice that will condemn you in the eyes of generations. Martin listened to Franklin's words and seemed to actually consider them. Then, as if snapping out of a daze, he said, You're Benjamin Franklin, aren't you? He grinned and waggled a finger at Franklin. I knew you looked familiar. That's amazing. Look, I know you're not in a position to discuss this right now, but I have two words for you. Exclusive interview. Think about it, right? Mr. Prescott, the headmistress said, her voice stony. You cannot expect us to make a decision regarding this in a matter of minutes. We simply must discuss this. Indeed, Neville added. Even if we do agree to your conditions, you must conduct yourself upon our terms. How that can be of any benefit to us, considering the sheer magnitude of what you are undertaking, I do not yet know. But regardless, we must have some time. As I said, Martin replied, seeming far more comfortable now that he believed he had the upper hand. You have two hours. Well, ninety-four minutes, actually. Answer me this, Mr. Prescott, Franklin said, sighing. How did you get onto the school grounds? Before we go any further with this charade, we must know that. Martin sighed lightly. Got a chair? It's rather a story. Neville pointedly produced his wand. Never taking his eyes off Martin, he pointed the wand at a wooden chair in the corner and levitated it rather brusquely. The chair shot forward, nearly scooping Martin off his feet. The man plopped gracelessly onto the seat, and the chair thunked to the floor. Do continue, Neville said, half sitting on a corner of the headmistress's desk. McGonagall settled into her chair, but remained ramrod straight. Franklin and James continued to stand. Well, I first got the letter telling me about this place in September of last year, Martin said, leaning forward and rubbing his backside while staring angrily at Neville. The view offers a hundred thousand pounds reward for proof of paranormal activity, and the gentleman that wrote the letter seemed to think that this Hogwarts place would offer such proof in spades. Honestly, we get thousands of letters a year from people hoping to collect the reward. They include everything from blurry pictures of tossed pie plates to actual slices of toast with the faces of saints burned onto them. The view never actually had any plans to reward the money. They like a nice dash of the inexplicable in the news from time to time. But when it comes to belief, most of them are the most cynical bunch of hardheads imaginable. Me, on the other hand, I'm the sort of guy who wants to believe. It wasn't the tone of the letter that got my attention, though. It was the little item the sender had included in the envelope, a little box containing something called a chocolate frog. I expected it might have some novelty spring snakes in it at best, so being a sport, I went ahead and opened it. Sure enough, there was a perfect little chocolate frog inside. I was just about to grab it and take a bite when the thing lifted its head and looked right at me. I just about dropped the box. Next thing I know, the frog leaped straight out of the box and onto my desk. It was a hot day, and the thing had just come in with the post. Good thing, too, because the little bugger had got a little melty, left little chocolatey frog footprints all over that night's copy. Three good hops, and then the frog just putters out. I was afraid to touch it, but five minutes later it still hadn't moved. I had time to determine that it had just been a normal frog covered in chocolate. Some joke. Thing probably had suffocated from the stuff and from the heat of being in the box. So I went ahead and scooped it back up, and sure enough, the thing was just chocolate. Good chocolate, too, I might add. I still might have forgotten all about it, to tell you the truth. No matter how open-minded a person might think they are, being confronted with something truly inexplicable still tends to shut down the old belief circuits. If it weren't for those little chocolatey frog footprints on my papers, I might never have mustered the resolve to be here. I kept them in the bottom of my desk, and every time I looked at them, I remembered the little bugger hopping across my desk. I couldn't get it out of my mind, so I emailed the guy who'd sent it. Nice trick, I told him. Got any more? He emails me back the next day and says if I really want to see tricks, I just need to follow the signal he'd send me. Sure enough, the day after that, there's another package from him, a little one, 
contained everything I needed to lock onto the signal here. There was no way those faithless turds in management would equip me with a crew to investigate the origin of a jumping chocolate frog, even if I showed them the froggy footprints. Fortunately, I had some leave due, so I decided to give it a go on my own. A little camping out would do me good, so I packed my own cameras and caught a train. Getting into the general vicinity was easy enough, of course. I spent the first night on the other side of the forest, knowing by the signal that I was within a few kilometres of the source. Next day I was on foot by dawn. I followed the direction I knew I was supposed to go, but sure enough, every time I'd find myself heading right back out the way I'd come. It never seemed like I turned round or even veered off my course. It was as if I had succeeded in getting to the opposite side of the forest, but somehow the planet had turned around right underneath me. I tried using a compass, and it'd tell me I was dead on as well, until all of a sudden I'd be stepping right back out into my camp, and the needle would spin away as if it had forgotten what it was for. This went on for three solid days. I was getting frustrated, I'll tell you that. But I was also getting determined, because I knew something was trying to keep me out. I wanted to know what. So the next day, I got out my little package and located the coordinates. This time, though, I kept it in front of me the whole time, watching that little flashing dot. Soon enough, the ground seemed to force me away. I'd run into an old creek bed with sides too steep to climb. I'd angle away only to run into a deadfall of trees or a low cliff. Everything seemed to be working to turn me off my course. I pushed on, though. I climbed and scurried. I pushed through thorns and the thickest undergrowth I've ever seen. Then even gravity seemed to be working against me. I kept feeling as if the earth was tilting up beneath me, trying to throw me backwards off it. No such thing was happening, of course, but it was a dreadful sensation nonetheless. I became nauseous and unaccountably dizzy, but I followed my direction, crawling at the last. And then, suddenly, the sensations were gone. The forest seemed to snap back to normal, or at least what passes for normal in this neck of the woods. I had made it through. Ten minutes later, I came out for the first time on the edge of the clearing overlooking this very castle. I was stunned, needless to say, but what amazed me far more than the castle was the scene that I very nearly walked into the midst of. There, not twenty feet before me, was the largest man I had ever seen. He looked almost like a grizzly bear that had been taught to walk upright, but then, standing next to him... For the first time in his story, Martin paused. He swallowed, obviously shaken by the very memory. There was something so monstrously huge that I at first thought it must be a kind of dinosaur. It had four legs, each the size of a pillar. I raised my eyes and saw that it was, in fact, two creatures standing near each other, and they were both human-shaped. The tallest one's head was above the treetops. I couldn't even see its face. I scrambled back into a hiding place, certain they'd heard me, but it seemed not to be so. The smallest one, the one that looked like a walking bear, talked to the other two, and they answered, sort of. Their voices vibrated the ground. Then, to my horror, they turned and headed towards me into the forest. The largest one's foot came down right next to me, shaking the earth like a bomb and leaving a footprint three inches deep. And then they were gone. Martin drew a huge sigh, obviously content with his telling of the tale. And that was when I knew I'd found it. The greatest story of my life. Possibly the greatest story of this century. He looked round as if he expected applause. There is one small detail you have failed to explain to my satisfaction, Headmistress McGonagall said coldly. This device you mentioned... It was somehow able to point you to this school. I must know what it is and how it works. Martin raised his eyebrows and then chuckled and sat up. Oh, yes, that. It's been acting pretty wonky ever since I got here, but at least it maintained the signal. A simple GPS device. Uh, please forgive me. You're probably unfamiliar with the term. A global positioning system device. 
It allows me to locate any point on Earth within a meter or so. Very helpful bit of, uh, muggle magic, if you will. James spoke for the first time since entering the room. But how did you pinpoint the school? How would that device know where to find it? It's unplottable, not on any map. Martin turned to look at him, his brow furrowed, apparently uncertain whether he should even deign to answer James. Finally, seeing that everyone else in the room expected him to respond, Martin stood up. Like I said, I was sent the coordinates. They were provided by someone on the inside. Really very simple. Martin reached into the pocket of his jeans and pulled something out. James knew what it was even before he saw it. He had known it somehow even before he'd asked the question. His heart sank as if through the very floor. Martin flourished a game deck. It was a different colour to Ralph's, but of exactly the same make. He plunked it unceremoniously onto the headmistress's desk. Wireless uplink for online competition, including chat capability. Pretty standard stuff. So anybody here go by the screen name Ostrom Maddox? You can't do this to me! Martin exclaimed as Neville led him unceremoniously into the room of requirement, which had arranged itself into a rather quaint turret-top prison cell, complete with a barred window, a bed, a bowl of water, and a crust of bread on a plate. This is unlawful imprisonment! It's an outrage! Think of it as field research, Neville instructed politely. We have much to discuss, and after your ordeals in the forest, we thought you might like a bit of a breather. Put your feet up, mate. James, who was standing in the hall behind Neville, couldn't help smiling a little. Martin saw him, scowled angrily, and made to shove past Neville. Neville whipped out his wand so fast that James barely saw his robes twitch. I said, Neville repeated with low emphasis, not quite pointing his wand at Martin, put your feet up, mate. James's smile faltered. He'd never seen Neville Longbottom so intense. Of course, James knew the stories of how Neville had cut off the head of Voldemort's snake, Nagini, but that was before James had been born. In all his memory of the man, Neville had been a kindly figure, soft-spoken and a bit clumsy. Now Neville's wand hand was so immobile and purposeful that it might have been carved out of marble. Martin blinked at Neville, saw something in the man's posture and the set of his face that he didn't like, and backed up. The back of his knees struck the bed, and he sat down hard. Neville pocketed his wand and stepped back into the hall, pulling the door of the Room of Requirement shut behind him. Martin, seeing the wand put away, immediately jumped up and started to yell again, but his voice was cut off as the door slammed shut. "'You know, we do have dungeons, Madam Headmistress,' Neville said in his normal voice. Seeing the door closed, Mistress McGonagall turned on her heel and walked briskly down the corridor as the others followed. We have some rather antique torture devices as well, Professor Longbottom, but I believe this will suffice for the moment. We only need to hold him until we receive word from the Ministry of Magic about whatever recourse we may or may not have against the dilemma Mr. Prescott has foisted upon us. In the meantime, Mr. Porter... I must ask you, do you know anything about the game device that has apparently led this person into our midst? James swallowed as he struggled to keep up with the headmistress's pace. He opened his mouth to answer, but nothing came. Uh, well... Neville touched James on the shoulder as they walked. We all saw your face turn as pale as the moon when Prescott produced the game deck device. You looked almost like you expected it. Is there something you know that might help us, James? James decided there was no point in trying to protect Ralph. It wasn't his fault, anyway. My friend has one. He's a first year like me, but he's muggle-born. He didn't know it might be dangerous to have here. None of us did, really. I was surprised it even worked here. He used it to communicate with someone in the muggle community? Neville asked quickly. No, as far as I know, he never used it at all. As soon as he got here, his housemates saw it and gave him a load of trouble about it. They're Slytherins, so they were all getting on at him about counterfeit magical devices, about how it was an insult to the purebloods and all that. The headmistress turned a corner, heading back towards her office. 
I assume you are speaking of Mr. Deedle. Yes, I am confident enough that he is not at the head of this particular conspiracy, although this device of his might be. Does it perhaps broadcast some sort of signal? James shrugged. You'd be better off asking Ralph about that, or even my other friend, Zane. He seems to know a lot about how these things work, but I don't think it sends out information on its own. Ralph says somebody else took his game deck and used it. Another Slytherin, we think. Zane was able to tell that somebody had spent some time on it and that they'd used the name Ostromaddox. They hadn't played the game at all, though. They must have just been using it to send information. Probably the coordinates that guy said he used to locate the school using his GPS thing. You're quite sure about this, are you, James? Neville said, following the headmistress back into her office. Have you considered that Mr. Deedle might have used this device on school grounds and unwittingly shared information that he shouldn't have? It is possible that this tale of the stolen game deck is a ruse. James shook his head firmly. No way, not Ralph. It never even occurred to him or any of us that the thing might be used to lead people here. He just knew it made his Slytherin mates angry. We're all forgetting one important thing. McGonagall said, lowering herself tiredly into her chair. Even if Mr. Deedle or this unknown borrower of the device did attempt to share information about this school with a muggle, the vow of secrecy would prevent them. Professor Franklin, who had remained in the headmistress's office to fiddle with the game deck, replaced the device on the desk and stared at it, apparently unable to make anything of it. How does this vow work precisely, Madame Headmistress? It's quite straightforward, Professor. Every student must sign the vow, proclaiming they will not knowingly reveal any information regarding the existence of Hogwarts to any muggle individual or agency. If they do, the magical properties of the vow will engage, preventing any such communication. This might mean the landlock jinx or any other curse that would disable the individual's ability to share information. In this case, we might assume that the user of the device might experience a fusing of the fingers or paralysis of the hand, anything that would prevent them from entering any dangerous information into this device. Franklin was thoughtful. We use a similar means at Alma Alaron. The wording of the vow must be very specific, of course. No loopholes. Still... It does seem apparent that someone was indeed able to use such a device to communicate very specific information about this school. My guess is that each of these gaming devices is equipped with a tracker that corresponds to the global positioning mechanism Mr. Prescott spoke of. Whoever used Mr. Deedle's device was apparently able to send the geographical coordinates of one game deck to another. Mr. Prescott merely needed to enter that information into his GPS device and follow it very carefully. Despite Mr. Prescott's obvious muggle nature, this made him a sort of haphazard secret keeper. He can, if he so wishes, share the secret of this school's location with anyone else he wishes. Whether they are able to get past the school's unplottability zone is another question, though. Not everyone is quite as persistent as he is. This might explain why he needs our help to bring in his entourage. We cannot allow such a thing to happen, of course, Neville said, looking to the headmistress. I'm not entirely certain we can prevent it, she said heavily. Our Mr. Prescott is indeed an extremely tenacious individual. He knows enough already to do us a great harm. Even if we were to discover the whereabouts of his crew, obliviate them all, and send them back, they would discover the recording that has been made of all Mr. Prescott has seen so far. He would inevitably return, and perhaps next time it will occur to him to bring live cameras rather than just a telephone. I see no recourse but to allow him to go on with this investigation of his, and hope to talk him out of broadcasting it. Neville shook his head. I have more confidence that we could talk the mer-people out of living in the lake than we could convince this sodding twit not to broadcast his prize story. Franklin adjusted his tiny glasses and looked at the ceiling. Of course, there are more, uh, wholesale methods of dealing with this kind of thing, Madame Headmistress. We could simply place the imperious curse upon Mr. Prescott. 
That way we could arrange for him to send his crew away and even accompany him back to his offices to help him destroy any record of this visit. Once that was accomplished, we could feel free to obliviate Mr. Prescott with no fear of a repeat performance. McGonagall sighed. This is not the sort of decision we are exactly authorized to make, and frankly I'm glad of that. The Ministry of Magic has been notified of the situation, and I am assured they will instruct us on the proper course within the hour. I expect to hear from your father directly, Mr. Porter, and at any moment. As if on cue, a woman's voice spoke up from the fireplace. Greetings and salutations. This is an official communication of the Ministry of Magic. Can we be assured that this is a secure assembly? McGonagall stood and moved around her desk to face the fireplace. It is. These with me are the only persons on the grounds at present fully aware of what is happening, although by this point the whole of the school must know that we have a muggle individual among us. His entry was hardly subtle. The face in the banked coals of the headmistress's fireplace looked around at Neville, James, and Professor Franklin. I am the undersecretary of Miss Brenda Saccharina, co-chair of the Council of Ambassadorial Relations. Please stand by to be connected. The face vanished. James saw McGonagall's face tighten just the tiniest bit when the undersecretary mentioned Miss Saccharina. Only a few seconds passed before the face of the prim woman appeared in the fireplace. Madam McGonagall, Professors Franklin and Longbottom, greetings, and young Mr. Potter, of course. An ingratiating smile appeared on Saccharina's lips when she spoke to James. The smile disappeared almost as suddenly as it had appeared, as if it were something she could turn on and off like a light. We have conferred about the situation that has thrust itself upon you, and have reached a conclusion. As you may guess, we have prepared contingencies for just such an occurrence. Please tell Mr. Prescott that he may contact his associates. We find that there is no recourse but to allow his investigation to proceed. However, no one other than Mr. Prescott is to be allowed onto Hogwarts grounds until a delegation from the Ministry arrives to oversee them. We will arrive no later than tomorrow evening, at which time we will assume all negotiations with Mr. Prescott and his crew. Miss Saccharina, McGonagall said, are you suggesting that the Ministry may well allow this man to perform his investigation and broadcast it to the Muggle world? I'm sorry, Madam McGonagall, Zacharina said sweetly. I didn't mean to imply that or anything else. You may rest assured that we are prepared to deal with this situation, regardless of the method we choose. I'd hate to burden you with any more detail than you've already been forced to deal with. The headmistress's face became rather pink. Burden away, Miss Saccharina, for I can promise you that the future of this school and its students is hardly the sort of detail I'm likely to dismiss. Saccharina laughed lightly. My dear Minerva, I suspect that the future of Hogwarts, the students and yourself, is as secure as ever. As I mentioned, we have contingencies for such events. The Ministry is prepared. Forgive me, Miss Saccharina, Franklin interjected, taking half a step forward. But you'd have us believe that the Ministry of Magic has prepared contingencies for a muggle investigative reporter penetrating the school of Hogwarts on foot with a camera crew at the ready and intentions to broadcast the secrets of the magical world to muggles worldwide? Zacharina's indulgent smile tightened. I'd have you believe, Mr. Franklin, that the Ministry has prepared emergency response techniques for dealing with a wide variety of confrontations. The specifics do not matter. I beg to disagree, miss. The specifics of this instance have revealed a rather large security breach that could, at this point, be utilized by virtually anyone. This school can no longer be considered secure until this breach has been addressed. One thing at a time, Professor. We appreciate your concern, but I assure you that we are fully equipped to deal with the matter in its entirety. 
If, however, you feel that the safety of yourself and your staff are at risk, we could possibly arrange for your early departure. This would cause us great disappointment and be quite a disruption to the school. My concern, Miss Sacarina, Franklin said coolly, removing his glasses, is for the security of everyone within these walls and for the security of the magical and muggle worlds in general. I rather suspect that is somewhat of an exaggeration, Zacharina smiled. Please, all of you, put your minds at ease. I, along with Mr. Recreant, will arrive tomorrow evening. We will meet with this Mr. Prescott, and I am quite confident, positive even, that we will reach a mutually amicable arrangement. You needn't bother yourselves with it any further. What about my dad? James asked. Zacharina blinked, apparently mystified. Your father, James? Whatever do you mean? Well, don't you think he ought to be here along with you and Mr. Recreant? Zacharina smiled her ingratiating smile again. Why, your father is head of the aura department, James. There is no dark magic involved in this unfortunate set of circumstances. So far as we can tell, there'd be no reason to bother him with it. But he's dealt with this man before, Neville said. He and James witnessed him on the Quidditch pitch last year and led the search to try and capture him. And a fine job he did, Zacharina said, her smile snapping shut. That was his duty at the time. This, however, as you cannot fail to realize, is an ambassadorial issue. Harry Potter's skills may be varied, but ambassadorship is not one of them. Besides... Mr. Potter is currently on assignment and not to be interrupted. We do have, however, specialists in exactly this sort of negotiation. Along with myself and Mr. Recreant, we are arranging for another ambassador to join us. He is an expert in muggle magical relations. We expect him to spearhead our dealings with Mr. Prescott and his crew, and we have full confidence that he will serve all parties quite well. McGonagall waved her hand dismissively. And what shall we do with Mr. Prescott until your arrival, Miss Sacarina? Make him comfortable. Allow him to make his telephone call. Other than that, as little as possible. Surely you do not mean for us to allow him free access to the school, the headmistress said, as if it were a statement rather than a question. Sacarina seemed to shrug in the fireplace. Whatever harm he might be able to do by observing is surely less than the harm he could do if he brought muggle legal charges against us. We must, for the moment, treat him as a guest. Besides, it sounds as if he's seen quite a lot already. McGonagall's face was unreadable. Very well, then. Good afternoon, Miss Sacarina. We will look forward to your arrival tomorrow evening. Sacarina smiled again. Indeed, until then, the face vanished from the fire. The headmistress reached for her poker and poked studiously at the embers for several seconds, strewing them so that no hint of the face remained. She replaced the poker, turned her back to the fire, and said, Insufferable bureaucratic poppycock! I'd be happy to lodge Mr. Prescott in the Alma Alaron quarters, Franklin said, putting his glasses back on. I'd prefer to keep a close eye on him anyway. I suspect we can keep him busy enough to prevent him causing any more trouble. I don't like this at all, Neville said, still looking at the fireplace. Harry should be here. Prescott himself isn't a dark wizard, of course, but there is something extremely dodgy about how he got here at all. Somebody led him here, and that person somehow circumvented the vow of secrecy. I don't care what Sacharina says. I feel a lot better with a decent aura looking into it. The headmistress opened her door. At this point, it is out of our hands. Professor Franklin, your idea is as good as any. Let us escort Mr. Prescott to the Alma Alaron Cortes, and despite what Miss Sacarina might believe, I prefer for us to arrange for Mr. Prescott to be quite busy for the next twenty-four hours. The less time he has to explore the school, the better. "'Mr. Potter, please feel free to return to your classes, and although I suspect I cannot ask you not to speak of this to Mr. Walker and Mr. Deedle, 
I'd be quite happy if you managed not to talk of it to anyone else, especially Ted Lupin or Noah Metzger. As James followed the adults out of the office, a quiet voice spoke to him from the wall. Going to be quite a busy day tomorrow, Potter. James stopped and glanced at the portrait of Severus Snape, not entirely sure what he meant. I guess so, at least for the headmistress and everybody. Snape's black eyes bored into him. Answer me truthfully, Potter. Are you still labouring under the delusion that Tabitha Corsica is in possession of the Merlin staff? Oh, James said. Look, say what you want, but it makes sense. We're going to get it from her too, one way or another. Snape spoke quickly. Don't be a fool, Potter. Turn over what you have. Give it to the headmistress. Surely you see how dangerous it is to keep the robe, especially now. James blinked. Why? What happens now? Does it have something to do with this Prescott fellow? Snape stared hopelessly at James. You don't see it, then, he sighed. There is a very good reason why your father, dull as he is, is being kept from accompanying tomorrow's delegation. There are members of the progressive element even within the ministry, although they do not call themselves by that name. Sacharina is one of them, recreant maybe as well, although he is not really in charge. Either she is taking full advantage of a very suspicious coincidence, or this is all her plan from the beginning. What? What's her plan? James asked, lowering his voice and stepping closer to the portrait. The details are unimportant. All that matters is that unless you secure the Merlin robe by tomorrow night, all will very likely be lost. But it is secure, James replied. We captured it already. You know that. We have to get the Merlin staff now. Forget the staff. Snape hissed angrily. You are allowing yourself to be manipulated. If I had even the slightest hope that you'd be any better at it than your father was, I'd have taught you occlumency by now. When I tell you to secure the Merlin robe, I mean you must turn it over to those who know how to bind it, not just hide it. The enemy has the two other relics. The robe wishes to be reunited with them. You will not be able to prevent that, Potter. Don't be the arrogant fool your father was. James scowled. My father was never the arrogant fool you think he was, and I'm not either. I don't have to listen to you. Besides, tomorrow isn't the alignment of the planets. It's the next night. Zane told me himself. Snape grinned maliciously. So trusting are you both. Where, pray tell, does Mr. Walker get his information? He's in Constellations Club, James replied angrily. Madame Delacroix has been using everybody in the club to help her pinpoint the exact timing of the alignment. And did it never occur to you that she might have deliberately altered the information, just enough to mislead those too ignorant to notice? She has known the day of the alignment for the past year. She only needed help to ascertain the hour. Even you have realized that she is involved in the Merlin plot. Do you expect that she would desire dozens of stargazing students to be swarming the grounds on the very night she plans to skulk off to facilitate the return of the most dangerous wizard of all time? James felt sheepish. Of course she wouldn't. He just hadn't thought of it. He opened his mouth to speak, but could think of nothing to say. Snape went on. She has misled all of you by exactly one day. The Hall of Elders Crossing will not occur Thursday night, but Wednesday. Tomorrow, Potter, you have been duped, and you are being duped still. 
There is no time for any more delusions of grandeur. You must turn over the robe. If you do not, you will fail, and our enemies will succeed in their plan. James! It was Neville. He poked his head into the headmistress's doorway. We lost you, it seems. Did you forget something? James's mind was running at full speed. He stared blankly at Neville for a few seconds and finally gathered himself. Uh, no, sorry, I was just thinking out loud. Neville glanced at the portrait of Snape. Snape sighed and crossed his arms. Go on, Longbottom, and take the boy with you. I've no use for him. Neville nodded. Come along, James. You still have time to make your afternoon classes if you hurry. I'll walk with you and explain why you're late. James followed Neville out of the room, thinking only of what Snape had told him. They had only one day, one day to get the Merlin staff from Tabitha, one day before the Hall of Elders Crossing, and it just happened to be the very same day that Sacharina was coming to deal with Prescott. As he rode down the moving spiral stairs and came out into the corridor below, it occurred to James that Snape was right about one thing. Tomorrow was indeed going to be a very busy day. Chapter 16 Disaster of the Merlin Staff The next morning, James, Ralph and Zane entered the Great Hall for breakfast and headed purposefully towards the far end of the Gryffindor table. Are you sure about this? Ralph asked as they crossed the hall. We can't go back after this, you know. James pressed his lips together, but didn't answer. They crowded in with Noah, Ted, and the rest of the gremlins, all of whom were seated conspicuously in a tight knot. Ah, the very man, Ted announced, as James squeezed between him and Sabrina. We were just taking bets on why you asked all of us to meet you for breakfast. Noah thinks you want to officially join the ranks of the gremlins, in which case we've prepared a series of gruelling challenges for you to complete. My favourite is the one where you don Sabrina's old Yule gown and run through the school singing the Hogwarts tribute as loud as you can. There's plenty more, although Damien's challenges tend to involve too many slugs and mustard for my taste. James grimaced. To tell you the truth, the reason I asked to talk to all of you is that Ralph, Zane and I have something we need to ask of you. To their credit, none of the gremlins seemed surprised. They simply leaned in a little as they continued to eat. James didn't exactly know where to begin. He had awoken that morning with the simple realisation that, on their own, he, Ralph and Zane would not succeed in capturing the Merlin staff in one day. They had no plan. The portrait of Snape had been some help, but Snape didn't even believe that Tabitha Corsica had the staff, so who could they turn to? He acted on his first impulse. He could ask the one group of people in all the school who were experts in the subtle arts of chaos and tomfoolery. It might take too long to explain everything to Ted and his fellow gremlins, and even if they could, they still might not agree to help, but it was his best, last hope. James sighed hugely and stared at his glass of pumpkin juice. We need your help to... to borrow something. Borrow something? Noah repeated, his mouth full of toast. What? Money? A cup of sugar? A decent haircut? Doesn't sound like you need us exactly. Quiet, Metzger, Ted said mildly. What is it you want to borrow, James? James took a deep breath and then simply said it. Tabitha Corsica's broom. Damien coughed into his juice. All the other gremlins glanced at James with widened eyes, all except Ted. Whatever for? Sabrina asked in a low voice. Tonight's the tournament match between Ravenclaw and Slytherin. Is that it? Are you trying to ruin Slytherin's chances? I admit that there's something highly suspect about that broom of hers, but cheating doesn't exactly seem like your style, James. No, it doesn't have anything to do with the match, James said, and then faltered. It's a lot to explain, and I'm not even allowed to talk about some of it. McGonagall asked me not to. Tell us as much as you can, then, Petra said. All right. Zane, Ralph, help me out. Fill in any bits I miss. It's going to sound pretty mad, but here goes. 
Between the three of them, they explained the entire story of the Merlin conspiracy. From the first glimpse of the shade of Madame Delacroix on the lake, to the adventure at the Grotto Keep, to Ralph and James's mysterious confrontation with the creepy dryad demanding the Merlin robe. They had to back up then and explain how they'd come to capture the robe from Professor Jackson. James was worried that the story had become so fragmented that the gremlins wouldn't be able to follow it. Ted listened intently the entire time, simply eating and watching whoever was speaking. The rest of the gremlins asked clarifying questions and responded with a mixture of scepticism, awe and excitement. "'You've been working this whole plot out all year, and you're only now telling us about it?' Damien asked, narrowing his eyes. "'Like I said, McGonagall warned us not to tell anybody about the Grotto Keep,' James said sincerely. "'And we were worried that you wouldn't believe the rest of it anyway. "'We had a hard time believing a lot of it ourselves, for a while at least. "'So what do you think?' "'I'm confused,' Sabrina said, frowning. "'The whole thing seems pretty patched together. "'It's one thing to shoot off Weasley fireworks during the debate, "'but it's something else entirely to go and steal the broom "'of one of the most prominent and, frankly, scary witches in the school.' That's thievery, that is. It's only thievery if what we're saying isn't true, Zane reasoned. If Tabitha's broom is the Merlin staff, then it isn't hers, really. I don't know whose it is, but no matter what, she had to have stolen it somehow herself. Damien didn't seem convinced. Even if she did, we'd be the only ones who knew that. If she hauls us all into the headmistress's office, claiming we stole her broom, what would we say? It's all right because she stole the broom herself from somebody we don't know who. And besides, the broom is really the magical staff of the most powerful wizard ever, so we were really just doing the world a favour, taking it out of Corsica's hands. That'll fly like a dead owl. Well, why wouldn't it? Ralph interjected. If it's true, it's true. And that came from the mouth of a Slytherin, Noah said, grinning crookedly. What's that supposed to mean? Ralph said, firming his jaw. James shook his head. It's all right, Ralph. He's pulling your leg. The point is, yes, even if it's true, we might not be able to prove it. I won't tell you we might not get into trouble over this. I can only tell you that if it is true, then being hauled to McGonagall's office and called a thief is the least of our worries. I can't ask any of you to get involved if you don't want to. It's risky. We could all get in loads of trouble. We could even fail despite our best efforts. Now, wait a minute, Noah said. This is the gremlins you're talking about. Petra sat up straight and looked around at the group. The thing is, if James, Zane and Ralph are wrong, we'll know by tomorrow. If we did borrow Corsica's broom, we could return it somehow, probably anonymously. No harm, no penalty. Everybody will just think it was a Quidditch prank, right? But if this story is true, and the broom really is the Merlin staff, then nobody will be dragging anybody to the headmistress's office. Why not? Sabrina asked, interested. Because Tabitha will have bigger fish to fry, Noah answered thoughtfully. If she's part of some big Merlin conspiracy, and she fails to come through with the staff, she'll be in some serious outs with her cronies. People like that don't tend to be very forgiving, you know. Why? We might never even see her again. One can only hope, Petra muttered. Ted stirred. Look here, all of you. This is all well and good, but as far as I'm concerned, there's only one thing to decide. Can we trust James? I don't know Zane and Ralph here all that well, but I grew up with James. He may have sometimes been an obnoxious little squitter, but he's always been honest. And besides, he's the son of my godfather. You remember that guy, don't you? I'm willing to take a little risk for him. Not just because he's family, but because he's a potter. If he says there's a battle worth fighting, I'm inclined to believe him. Well said, mate, Noah said gravely, slapping Ted on the back. And besides, let's not forget that this does have the fringe benefit of pulling one over on Tabitha Corsica. And perhaps balancing out tonight's Quidditch match, Sabrina admitted. And maybe we could somehow snatch her broom when she's nice and high in the air, Damien grinned nastily. That's what I said, Zane exclaimed. You're both mad, 
Petra said reproachfully. You're as bad as she is. We don't want to kill her, Zane replied in a wounded voice. We just want to see her drop a few hundred feet in terror. Rit Cully would levitate her at the last moment, just like the Ralphinator did for James. Honestly, you must think we're monsters. So are we all agreed, then? Ted asked the group. Everybody nodded and murmured assent. That's wonderful and all, Ralph said. But how are we going to do it? Ted leaned back and stared up at the enchanted ceiling of the great hall, stroking his chin. Slowly, he smiled. Does anyone know what the weather is supposed to be like tonight? There was very little that the group needed to do to prepare. After lunch, Sabrina and Noah headed off to the basement to talk to the house elves. James and Ted, both of whom had an afternoon free period, spent some time in the library studying a collection of gigantic books about atmospheric and weather charms. This is Petra's thing, really, Ted lamented. If she wasn't busy all afternoon with divination and runes, we'd be a lot better off. James looked over their notes. Looks like we've got what we need, though, doesn't it? I guess. Ted replied airily, flipping a few huge pages. A minute later, he looked up at James. It was really tough for you to ask for help, wasn't it? James glanced at Ted and met his eyes, then looked out a nearby window. A little, yeah. I didn't know if I'd be able to explain it. I wasn't sure any of you would believe it. Ted furrowed his brow. Is that all? he prodded. Well, James began, then stopped. He fiddled with his quill. No, I guess not. It just seemed like, like something I was supposed to do on my own. I mean, with Zane and Ralph's help, sure, they knew right from the start, but still, I kind of figured that between the three of us, we'd be able to manage. We'd work it out. It felt a little like... He stopped, realising what he was about to say, surprised by it. Like what? Ted asked. James sighed. <sighs> like a failure. Like if the three of us couldn't do it on our own, we'd failed somehow. The three of you, like your dad and Ron and Hermione, you mean? James glanced at Ted sharply. What? No, no, he said, but suddenly he wasn't sure. I'm just saying, Ted replied. It makes sense. That's how your dad did it. He was a big one for taking on all the responsibilities of the world and not sharing the load with anyone else. He and Ron and Hermione... There were always loads of people around who were ready and willing to help, and sometimes they did, but not until they'd pretty much forced themselves into the action. Ted shrugged. You sound like Snape, James said, keeping his voice level. He felt uncomfortably vulnerable all of a sudden. Well, maybe Snape's right sometimes, Ted said mildly, even if he was an oily old umbug most of the time. Yeah, well, blast him. James said, surprised to feel a prickle of tears. He blinked them away. He was a load of help, wasn't he? Sneaking around, working both sides, never making it clear to anybody where his loyalties really lay until it was too late. Can't really blame my dad for not trusting him, can you? So I don't trust him either. Maybe my dad did do most stuff with just Aunt Hermione and Uncle Ron. That was all he needed, wasn't it? They won. He had found two people he could trust with everything. Well, I found them too. I've got Ralph and Zane. So maybe I thought I could be just as good as Dad. I'm not, though. I needed some help. There was more James meant to say, but he stopped, uncertain if he should continue. Ted looked at James for a long, thoughtful moment, and then leaned forward, resting his elbows on the table. Tough thing living in the shadow of your dad, isn't it? he said. James didn't reply. A moment later, Ted went on. I never knew my dad. He died right here on the school grounds. He and Mum both. They were in the Battle of Hogwarts, you know. You'd think that it would be hard to feel resentful of people you never knew, but you can. I resent them for dying. Sometimes... I resent them for being here at all. I mean, what were they thinking? Both of them rushing off into some big battle, leaving their kid at home. You called out responsible? I sure don't. Ted looked out the window as James had done a minute earlier. Then he sighed. <sighs> oh, well. Most of the time, though, I'm proud of them. Somebody once said, if you don't have something worth dying for, you aren't really living. 
Mum and Dad had something worth dying for, and they did. I lost them, but I got a legacy out of it. A legacy is worth something, isn't it? He looked across the table at James again, searching his face. James nodded, unsure what to say. Finally, Ted shrugged a little. The reason I bring it up, though, is my dad. He left me something else. Ted was quiet for almost a minute, thinking, apparently debating with himself. Finally, he spoke again. Dad was a werewolf. I guess it's as simple as that. You didn't know that, did you? James tried to keep his face from showing it, but he was quite shocked. He knew there had been something secret about Remus Lupin, something that had never been explained to him or even mentioned outright. All James knew for sure was that Lupin had been close friends with Sirius Black, James Potter I, and a man named Peter Pettigrew, who had eventually betrayed them all. James knew that Lupin had come to teach at Hogwarts when his dad was in school, and that Lupin had taught his dad how to summon his Patronus. Whatever the secret of Remus Lupin's past, it couldn't have been anything terribly serious, James had reasoned. He had thought perhaps Ted's father had been in Azkaban for a while, or that he had once flirted with the dark arts when he was young. It had never crossed James's mind that Remus Lupin might have been a werewolf. Despite James's attempt to mask his shock, Ted saw it on his face and nodded. Yeah, quite a secret that was. Your dad told me the old story himself a few years back when I was old enough to understand it. Grandmum never talks about it at all, even now. I think she's afraid. Not so much of what was, but, well, what could be. James was a little afraid to ask. What could be, Ted? Ted shrugged. You know how it is with werewolves. There are only two ways to become one. You can get bitten by one, or you can be born of one. Of course, nobody really knows exactly what happens when only your mum or dad is a werewolf. Your dad said that my dad was pretty upset when he found out mum was going to have a baby. He was scared, see? He didn't want the kid to be like him, to grow up an outcast, cursed and hated. He thought he never should have even married me mum, because she wanted babies, but he was afraid to pass on the curse to them. Well, when I was born, I guess everybody breathed a big sigh of relief. I was normal. I got me mum's metamorph magus thing, even. They tell me I was always changing me hair colour as a baby. Got no end of laughs about that, grandmum says. I can still do it today, and a few other things, too. I usually don't, though. Once you get known for stuff like that, it's hard to be known for much else, if you know what I mean. So I guess Dad died feeling a bit better about having me, then. He died knowing I was normal, more or less. I'm glad of that. Ted was staring out the window again. He took a deep breath, then looked back at James. Harry told me how your grandfather James, Sirius Black and Pettigrew, used to run with me dad when he changed, how they'd change into animal forms and accompany him around the countryside under the full moon, protecting him from the world and the world from him. I even started thinking it was all sort of adventurous and romantic like those dopey muggles who read those werewolf stories where the werewolves are all handsome and seductive and mysterious. I started almost wishing I had got the werewolf thing after all. And then... Ted stopped and seemed to wrestle with himself for a moment. He lowered his voice and went on. Well, the thing is, nobody really knows how all this werewolf stuff works, do they? I never gave it a second thought. But then, last year I started having insomnia. No big deal, right? except it wasn't any normal insomnia. I couldn't sleep, but not because I wasn't tired exactly. I was... He stopped again and leaned back in his chair, staring hard at the wall by the window. Hey, James said, feeling nervous and embarrassed, although he didn't quite know why. You don't have to tell me. Forget it. No problem. No, Ted said, returning his gaze to James. I do need to tell you. As much for me as for you, because I haven't told anybody else yet, not even Grandmum. I think if I don't tell somebody, I'll go nuts. See, I couldn't sleep because I was so hungry. I was starved. I lay there in bed the first time it happened, telling myself that this was just crazy. I'd had a nice big dinner and everything, just like normal. But no matter what I told myself, my stomach just kept telling me it wanted food. And not just anything. It wanted meat. Raw meat. Fresh off the bone meat. You see what I'm getting at? James understood. It was, he began, and then had to clear his throat. 
It was a full moon. Ted nodded grimly, slowly. Eventually I got to sleep, but since then it's got worse. By the end of last school year, I finally started sneaking down to the kitchens below the Great Hall, where all the elves work. They have a big meat locker down there. I started to, well, you know, I ate. It tends to be a bit of a mess. Ted shuddered, and then seemed to shrug it off. Anyway, the point is, obviously I didn't completely skip the old werewolf thing. My dad gave me his own shadow to live in, didn't he? I don't blame him for it. For all I know, this is the worst it'll ever get, and this isn't all that bad. Helps me bulk up for Quidditch season, at least, but it's scary, a little. I don't know how to manage it yet, and I'm afraid to tell anyone about it. People... Ted swallowed and looked hard at James. People don't respond well to werewolves. James didn't know whether to agree with that or not, not because it was untrue, but because he wasn't sure Ted needed any more affirmation of it. My dad could help you, I bet, James said. And me too. I'm not afraid of you, Ted, even if you are a werewolf. I've known you my whole life. Maybe we could, you know, work it out like your dad and his mates did. He had his James Potter to help him, and you have yours. Ted smiled, and it was a huge, genuine smile. You're a Brit, James. I'd hate to have to eat you. Learn how to turn yourself into a giant dog like Sirius did, and maybe being a werewolf wouldn't be so bad after all, with you trotting along next to me. But I almost forgot why I brought this up at all. Ted leaned forward again, his eyes serious. You have the shadow of your dad to grow up in, just like me, but I can't choose whether I'm like my dad or not. You can. It's not a curse, James. Your dad's a great man. Pick the bits of who he is that are worth being like, and like them if you want. The other parts, well, that's your choice, isn't it? Take it or leave it. Those are the places where you can choose to be even better. Your dad didn't much ask for help, did he? But that's not because he didn't need it. The fact that you asked for help doesn't tell me that you're worse than him. It tells me you learned something he never learned. That's you being you, not just a copy of your dad. I think that's pretty cool, if you ask me, and not just because it means I got to help pull a fast one on Tabitha Corsica. James was speechless. He simply stared at Ted, unsure what to feel or think, unsure if what Ted was saying was true or not. He knew only that it surprised him and humbled him in a good way to hear Ted say what he had. Ted closed the gigantic book in front of him with a loud clunk. Come on, he said, standing and gathering the books together. Help me get these to the common room so Petra can look them over before the match. She's going to have to help me get this right or we're doomed for sure. Dinner's in an hour and after that we're going to be pretty preoccupied for the rest of the night. You know what I mean? The afternoon of the last Quidditch match of the season was cool and misty, covered with a veil of restless grey clouds. Silent and unusually sombre, the gremlins trooped through the tunnel behind the statue of St. Lockimagus the Perpetually Productive. When they reached the steps that led up to the interior of the equipment shed, Ted slowed and tiptoed. By now, Ridcully had probably already retrieved the Quidditch trunk from the shed, but it didn't hurt to be careful. Ted peered around the cramped space, saw only some dusty shelves and a few broken brooms, and then beckoned the rest to follow him up. It's all clear. We should be safe in here, now that Rick Cully's been and gone. He's the only one that uses the shed. Ralph climbed the steps and looked cautiously around. James remembered that Ralph hadn't been along the night he and the gremlins had used the secret tunnel to go and raise the wocket. "'It's a magic tunnel. It only works one way,' he whispered to Ralph. "'We can get back through it because it's the way we came, but anybody else would just find the inside of the equipment shed.' "'Cool,' Ralph breathed meaningfully. "'That's good to know.' James, Ralph, and Sabrina pressed against the rear of the shed to peer through the single grimy window. The Quidditch pitch lay behind the shed, and they could clearly see three of the grandstands, already mostly filled with banner-waving students and teachers, all bundled against the unseasonable chill. 
the Ravenclaw and Slytherin teams were gathering along opposite sides of the pitch to observe their captain shaking hands and listen to Ritcully's traditional recital of the basic rules of play. I forgot all about this, Sabrina said quietly. The whole handshaking thing. That Zane is a pretty sharp fellow. James nodded. It had been Zane's idea to stage the broom caper during the opening moments of the match, in those few minutes when both teams came out of their holding pens beneath the grandstands to watch the opening ritual. It was a genius idea, because it was the only time when the team's brooms were separated from their owners, left behind in the holding pens until the teams collected them for their big flying introductions. "'It's time!' Ted said, tapping James once on the shoulder. There's Corsica already. James swallowed past a lump in his throat that felt like a marble. His heart was already pounding. He pulled the invisibility cloak out of his backpack, shook it open, and threw it over his and Ralph's heads. As they neared the door of the shed, Petra whispered harshly, I can see your feet. Ralph, duck down some more. Ralph hunkered, and James saw the edge of the cloak meet the ground around his feet. "'Stay low and move fast,' Ted instructed. He turned and peered between the planks of the door. The equipment shed was positioned at a corner of the pitch, just inside the magical boundary erected by the match official. The door faced away from the pitch, visible only to the Slytherin grandstands right next to it. "'Looks clear enough!' Ted said, his face pressed to the cracks in the door. Let's just hope everybody's looking at the pitch, not the shed. With that, he pushed the door open and stepped aside. James and Ralph shuffled through, and James heard the door clank shut behind them. The wind was shifty and unpredictable. It barreled across the pitch and swatted restlessly at the invisibility cloak, flapping it about the boy's legs. Somebody's going to see my feet. Ralph moaned. We're almost there already, James said under the noise of the crowd. Just stay close and keep down. Through the transparent fabric of the invisibility cloak, James could see the dark mouth of the doorway into the Slytherin holding pen. The great doors were swung wide open, latched to the walls of the grandstand to keep them from blowing shut. The Slytherin players were lined up along the pitch on the other side of the doorway, close enough that a careless word or a flicker of their shoes might be noticed. James held his breath and resisted the urge to run. Slowly, the two boys sidled past the nearest Slytherin player, Tom Squalus, and slipped into the shadow of the doorway. Inside, the wind fell away, and the cloak hung still. James let his breath out in a careful hiss. Come on, he whispered almost soundlessly. We don't have much time. James knew what the gremlins were planning, even though he wasn't going to see any of it. Zane, who was watching along with his teammates on the Ravenclaw side of the pitch, told him all about it later. As Tabitha and Jennifer Tellus, the Ravenclaw captain, walked to meet Ridcully at the centre line of the pitch, a strange sound began to build in the air overhead. All day the sky had been low and sluggish, packed with grey clouds, but now, as the spectators and players glanced up, the clouds had begun to circle ponderously. There was a bulge in the clouds directly over the pitch, spiralling in on itself and lowering even as the crowd watched. The general noise of the assembly quieted, and the sound of the clouds in that silence was a deep, vibrating groan, long and menacing. With only his eyes, Zane glanced towards the equipment shed at the far corner of the pitch. He could just see the shapes of Ted and Petra ducked low in the corners of the tiny window, their wands raised, teasing the cloud shapes. He smiled, and then, when the timing was perfect and the entire pitch had fallen silent, he called out across the pitch. Quidditch is never called on account of the weather, right, Jennifer? There was a nervous ripple of laughter across the nearer grandstands. Jennifer glanced at Zane for a moment, then looked back up at the funnel, lowering over her. As a gremlin, Ted had told her of their plan, but Zane could tell that her nervousness wasn't hard to fake. Neither Ridcully nor Tabitha Corsica seemed prepared to move. Corsica merely looked up at the clouds, her hair whipping wildly around her face, her wand visible in her hand. 
Ritkali's expression seemed to be one of grim determination. Ladies and gentlemen, Damien's voice echoed throughout the grandstands from his place in the announcer's booth. We seem to be experiencing some sort of highly localised weather phenomenon. Please stay in your seats. You're probably safe there. Those on the field, please remain where you are. Cyclones cannot see you if you don't move. In the crowd, someone shouted out, That's dinosaurs, you crazy fruit bat! Same difference, Damien answered in his amplified voice. Sabrina and Noah darted out of the equipment shed, ducking against the swirling winds. They scurried towards the tiny concessions area built into the base of the Hufflepuff grandstand. The counter was manned by Hufflepuff students, but the food itself was prepared by elves in a kitchen near the back. Noah and Sabrina headed along the side of the grandstand and stopped at an open doorway. Hey, you fellows see what's going on out here? Sabrina yelled over the growing noise of the cyclone. Weather's getting pretty foul, isn't it? A grumpy-looking elf in the back of the kitchen lowered his pipe. And what do you want we to do about it, eh? You want me to shoot a blast of storm-calming pixie dust out of us, maybe? I was just thinking about Section 55, Paragraph 9 of the Elves of Hogwarts Coalition Agreement, Noah yelled, hunkering in the doorway. Says elves are responsible for securing the grounds during inclement weather. Getting pretty inclement out here, I'd say. Maybe you'd like Sabrina and me to go and shut and lock the holding pen doors for you until this blows over. Come on, Sabrina. The elf stuffed his pipe into the knot of his napkin loincloth and jumped forward. Never you mean that now. He turned and called into the depths of the kitchen. Oi! Heckle! Krung! Sidi! We got a job he does! Let's get a move on! The four elves bustled past Sabrina and Noah. The grumpy elf called back over his shoulder as they went, Much obliged, master and mistress! Enjoy the match now! As the elves scurried through the wind towards the holding pen doors, the cyclone finally touched the pitch. It licked across the centre line, twenty feet to Tabitha Corsica's right, and for several moments she watched it fascinated. Many people commented later that, impressive as it was, it was certainly the smallest cyclone they had ever seen. The grass where it touched down tossed wildly, but the power of the tornado dropped off significantly after a hundred feet or so, so that those in the grandstands were relatively unaffected. Jennifer Tellus turned and ran to the sidelines to join her team. Ridcully didn't seem to notice. Still standing in the centre of the pitch next to him, Tabitha Corsica fingered her wand and glanced around, now ignoring the writhing cyclone. She seemed to be looking for something. In the holding pen deep beneath the slithering grandstands, James and Ralph heard the noise of the cyclone and the creaking of the grandstand as the wind pressed against it. Which one is it? Ralph asked, as James whipped the cloak off them. There's so many of them. James pointed past the row of broomsticks leaning against the lockers. There, in the corner, farthest from the door, a broom hung in the air as if awaiting its rider. That's got to be it, he said, darting towards it. They stopped, one on either side of it. Close up, the broom seemed to be vibrating or humming very slightly. A low, unsettling noise came from it, audible even over the moan of the wind and the creak of the grandstands. Grab it then, James. Come on, let's get out of here. James reached out and grabbed the broomstick, but the broom didn't budge. He pulled it, then wrapped both hands around it and yanked. The broom was as immobile as if it had been buried in stone. What's the problem? Ralph moaned, glancing back towards the door. If we're still in here when they come back... We have the invisibility cloak, Ralph. We can hide, James said, but he knew Ralph was right. The holding pen was small and there were no obvious places to get out of the way, even if they couldn't be seen. The broom stuck somehow. I can't move it. Well, Ralph replied, gesturing vaguely, it's a broomstick. Maybe you're supposed to ride it. James felt a sinking in his stomach. I can't ride this thing, even if I could get it to move. Why not? It's not mine. I wasn't all that great on the broom until I got my thunder streak, if you recall. We want to capture this thing, not pulverize it into a wall with me on it. 
You've got better at it since then. Ralph insisted. Even before you got your thunder streak, you were getting loads better, almost as good as Zane. Go on, I'll I'll hop on the back and throw the cloak over both of us. James dropped his hands and rolled his eyes. Ralph, that's completely crazy. Suddenly, a resounding boom echoed down the corridor leading to the pitch. It rattled the rafters, showering dust all around. Ralph and James both startled. Ralph's voice was squeaky with fear. What was that? I don't know. James replied quickly. But I think we just ran out of options. Ralph, get ready to hop on. James swung his leg over the floating, gently humming broomstick and gripped the handle tightly with both hands. Slowly, he settled his weight onto the broomstick, letting it collect him. A minute earlier, outside, Tabitha Corsica had spied something. Zane saw her gaze stop. On the equipment shed. Somehow she'd known the cyclone was suspicious and had identified the one place someone might hide and cast spells into the magical boundaries of the Quidditch pitch. Zane was prepared to bolt onto the pitch to head her off if she approached the shed. He was already concocting a haphazard plan to pretend to drag her to safety. She didn't approach the shed, though. Zane saw her take one step in that direction and then glance aside at the elves closing and barring the doorways into the team holding pens. Tabitha turned on her heel and stalked purposefully towards the door in the base of the Slytherin grandstands. Even if Zane ran flat out, he'd barely beat her there. He simply had to hope that the elves would stick by their duties regardless of what Tabitha said. Noah and Sabrina had followed the elves to the Slytherin holding pen doors, watching from a distance as they swung them shut and threw the locking beam into place. Sabrina saw Tabitha striding across the pitch, her face grim and her wand out. Open those doors, Tabitha yelled, her voice firm but calm. She raised her wand hand, pointing it at the closed doorway. Very sorry, miss. The grumpy elf answered, bowing slightly. Coalition requirements! These doors must remain secure until such time as they can be opened without fear of danger or damage. Open them now or stand aside, Tabitha called. She was only thirty feet away from the doorway now, and Sabrina saw the look of murder on Tabitha's face. She'd blast those doors open with her wand and probably crush the poor duty-bound elves to paste between them and the wall. Obviously, Tabitha had guessed what was happening and knew that her broom was in jeopardy. Hey, Corsica! Sabrina shouted, launching herself forwards, trying to get between Tabitha and the doors. You summoned the cyclone because you were too proud to forfeit to the Ravenclaws? Tabitha's eyes darted towards Sabrina, but her pace didn't change. Her wand hand swung swiftly and locked onto Sabrina, who stopped in her tracks. Noah jumped forward to pull Sabrina back, but he was too late. Neither heard the curse Tabitha spoke, but they both saw the bolt of red light leap from her wand. It struck Sabrina square in the face, throwing her backwards into Noah. Both fell to the ground, their shouts drowned by the roar of the wind and the now yelling, confused crowd. Ladies and gentlemen, Damien's voice echoed over the noise. Please, let's give a big cheer for Mr. Cabe Ridcully, our beloved credit official who is currently trying to calm the cyclone with some sort of, well, ritualistic dance as far as I can tell. Sure enough. Ritcully seemed to be dancing around the tornado as it curled over the pitch, throwing up a thick cloud of grit and dust. He pointed his wand at the funnel, but whenever he seemed to get a good aim at it, the funnel would shift, lunging towards him and forcing him to dance away. The crowd did indeed begin to cheer him, so that very few people noticed what was happening at the base of the Slytherin grandstands. Last chance, Tabitha called to the elves guarding the doorway. They both glanced at Sabrina, who was still collapsed atop Noah, her hands covering her face. Now listen here, mistress, 
the grumpy elf began, but he was cut off by the bolt of red light that struck the closed doors. Both elves were thrown aside as the great wooden beam that barred the door exploded with a deafening boom and a shower of splinters. Tabitha hadn't slowed in her approach to the door. She aimed her wand once more, ready to cast the spell that would throw the doors wide open. Then, suddenly, she stopped. She cocked her head as if listening. Noah, struggling to get out from beneath the dazed Sabrina, heard it as well. Beneath the sound of the cyclone and the roaring grandstands, there was a sound like a single person yelling, and it was growing louder very quickly. The doors to the Slytherin holding pen burst open, ripping completely off their hinges as something rocketed through them from inside. Noah had the briefest glimpse of somebody bent low over a broom, hurtling past Tabitha Corsica so fast that she was thrown off her feet. She landed in a graceless heap ten feet away. The voice of the screaming rider thinned into distance as the broomstick streaked over the pitch, through the cyclone, and out the other side. James clung to Tabitha's broomstick as tightly as he could. He had left Ralph behind, having launched into an instant wild acceleration the moment he'd settled onto the broom. He felt the thundering shock as the broom rocketed through the cyclone. Then he opened his eyes and pulled, trying to gain some control over the wildly careening broomstick. The Quidditch pitch wheeled sickeningly beneath him as the broom responded, fighting him, but unable to resist the force of his lean. The Ravenclaw grandstand loomed ahead, and James struggled to pull up. He roared over the crowd, which ducked in his wake, hats and banners flying up behind him. Damien was yelling something from the announcer's booth, but James couldn't hear it over the roar of the wind in his ears. He risked a glance behind him, fearing he might have hurt someone. There were no obvious injuries as far as he could see. When he turned forwards, he was heading directly towards the slithering grandstands again, back the way he'd come. He leaned in the opposite direction and pulled as hard as he could, driving the broom into a wild, banking turn. The Slytherin grandstand spun away. With a sense of wild triumph, James realised he was getting some control over the broomstick. He looked ahead to see where his turn was taking him and gasped. He barely had time to duck his head before swooping through the open door of the equipment shed. The broom seemed to move as if it had a mind of its own. It roared through the tunnel beyond the shed, and the air of the confined space pressed hard against James's eardrums. When it reached the opening behind the pedestal of St. Blockimagus, it turned so hard, threading into the corridor, that it nearly threw James off. The sense of speed was staggering as the broomstick careened through the halls. Fortunately, the majority of the school's population was out at the Quidditch pitch for the tournament match, leaving the corridors mostly empty. The broomstick banked and dipped into the chasm of the stairwells. It swooped under and over the staircases as they swung and pivoted, barely missing them, forcing James to duck and hug the broomstick as closely as he could. Peeves was near the bottom of the staircases, apparently drawing moustaches on some of the statuary. James saw him out of the corner of his eye. Then, amazingly, Peeves was sitting on the broomstick in front of James, facing him. Naughty trickery this is, Potterboy, Peeves shouted gleefully as the broom shot into a narrow hall of classrooms. Is we trying to create some friendly competition with dear old Peeves? <laughs> Peeves grabbed a passing chandelier and swung around it, leaving James and the broom to plunge on after him. James tried to steer, but it was no use. The broomstick was following its own definite, if maniacal, course. It banked and dove down a flight of stone stairs into the elf kitchens. Unlike the rest of the school, the kitchens were crowded and bustling, filled with elves cleaning up after the evening meal. The broom darted between gigantic pots, forcing the elves to scramble like tenpins. There was a cacophony of crashing dishes and silverware, the noise of which fell away with horrible speed. The washrooms were next, stifling hot and noisy. 
The broom rocketed wildly through the machinery of the washers, diving through gigantic cogwheels and under the arms of enormous chugging pistons. James was horrified to see that the broom, apparently having reached a dead end, was barrelling straight towards the stone wall at the end of the room. He was about to throw himself off the broom, hoping to land in one of the copper vats of suds and water, when the broom ticked slightly to the left and angled up. There was a door set into the wall, and James recognised that it was a laundry chute. He gritted his teeth and hugged the broomstick again as it shot into the chute, angling upwards so hard that James could barely keep his legs tucked in, and then there was only rushing darkness and pressure. A pile of laundry met him halfway up the chute, and James spluttered as the mass of cloth smothered him. He struggled to shake the clothes free, but couldn't risk letting go of the broomstick. The broom ducked again, and James could tell by the change in pressure and the coolness of the air that it had somehow taken him back outside again. All he could see through the mass of cloth was a faint pattern of flickering light as the broomstick banked and dove. James risked letting go with one hand. He flailed at the clothing wrapped around him, finally grabbing a handful and yanking it as hard as he could. The cloth came free, stunning him with a blurring tableau of light and wind. He had time only to recognise that somehow, incredibly, the broom was taking him back to the Quidditch pitch. The grandstands loomed ahead of him. At the base of the nearest one was a throng of people, many turning towards him, pointing and yelling. Then, with instant finality, the broomstick simply stopped moving. James shot off the end of the broom, and for what seemed like far too long a time, he simply hurtled through the air unsupported. Finally, the ground claimed him with a long, rolling thud. Something in James's left arm popped unpleasantly, and when he finally came to a stop, he found himself staring up into a dozen random faces. "'Looks like he'll be all right,' one of them said, looking from him to someone standing nearby. "'More than he deserves,' another person said angrily, frowning down at him. "'Trying to ruin the match by stealing the team captain's broomstick. I would never have thought it.' "'It's quite all right, really,' another voice said from further off. James moaned and pushed himself up on his left elbow. His right arm was throbbing horribly. Tabitha Corsica stood twenty feet away, surrounded by a crowd of awed spectators. Her broom hung motionless next to her, exactly where it had stopped. She had one hand on it, gripping it easily. "'We can surely forgive this kind of first-year enthusiasm, although I myself am rather amazed at the length some will go to in the name of Quidditch. Really, James, it's just a game.' She smiled at him, showing him all her teeth. James flopped back into the grass, clutching his right arm next to him. The crowd began to break apart as Ridcully appeared, pushing his way through. The headmistress and professors Franklin and Jackson were right behind him. James heard Tabitha Corsica talking loudly to her teammates as she headed back towards the pitch. People think that because it's muggle-made, it must be a lesser broom, you see. But the magic of this is stronger than anything you'd find in a standard thunderstreak, even one with the extra gestural enhancement option. This broom knows who its mistress is. All I had to do was summon it. Mr. Potter could hardly have known that, though. In a way, I feel sorry for him. He was just doing what he knew to do. McGonagall squatted down next to James, her face grave and full of consternation. Really, Potter? I just don't know quite what to see. Broken ulnar, madam. Franklin said, peering at James's arm through a strange device comprised of different-sized lenses and brass rings. He folded it neatly and slipped it into his inner row pocket. "'I'd suggest the hospital wing for now, and questions later. We have much more to attend to at the moment.' "'Quite right,' 
the headmistress agreed, not taking her gaze from James. Especially since I expect that Miss Sacarina and Mr. Recreant will be here within the next few hours. I must say, Potter, I'm extremely surprised at ye to attempt something so puerile at such a time. She stood, brushing herself off. "'Very well, then. Mr. Jackson, would you escort Mr. Porter to the hospital wing, please? "'And if you would be so kind as to instruct Madame Curio that Mr. Porter is to be kept there overnight.' "'She fixed James with a steely stare as Jackson pulled him to his feet. "'I want to know exactly where to find him when I wish to question him. "'And no visitors.' "'Rest assured, Madame Headmistress,' Jackson answered, leading James back towards the castle. They walked the first five minutes in silence. Then, when they entered the courtyard and the noise of the pitch died away, Jackson said, I haven't quite pegged you yet, Potter. The pain in James's arm had receded to a dull throb, though it was still rather distracting. Excuse me, sir? I mean that I haven't figured you out yet, Jackson said in a conversational voice. You obviously know far more than a boy of your age should, and somehow I don't think this is merely because you are the son of the Ministry's head aura. First you attempt to steal my case, and then tonight you orchestrate this preposterous charade to steal Miss Corsica's broom. And despite what everyone else might think, Potter, he glanced aside at James as they entered the main hall, his dark brows lowering, I know that you did not steal it in order to give the Ravenclaws a better chance in the tournament. James cleared his throat. I don't know what you're talking about. Jackson wasn't paying him any attention. It doesn't matter, Potter. Whatever you think you know, whatever it is you are up to, after tonight it won't matter one iota. James's heart skipped a beat, and then began to pound hard in his chest. Why? he asked, his lips strangely numb. What's tonight? Jackson ignored him. He opened one of the leaded glass doors into the hospital wing and held it for James. The room was long and high, lined with crisply made beds. Madame Curio, who for rather obvious reasons was not a Quidditch fan, was seated at her desk in the rear corner, listening to classical music on her wireless. Madame Curio, you probably know Mr. Potter here, Jackson said, pressing James towards her. He has somehow managed to break his arm at the Quidditch match, despite the fact that he himself is not actually on either of the teams. Madame Curio stood and approached James, shaking her head. Hooligans! I'll never understand what it is about that sport that turns otherwise proper individuals into Neanderthals. What do we have here, then? She lifted James's arm gingerly, feeling for the break. He hissed through his teeth when she found it. She clucked her tongue. Nasty fracture, sure enough. Could have been worse, though, I'm sure. We'll have you fixed up in no time. Also, Jackson said, I've been instructed by the headmistress to ask you to keep Mr. Potter here for the evening, madam. Curio didn't look up from her inspection of James's arm. The Skelligrow will take at least until tomorrow morning to complete its work anyway. Still, this is minor enough. I might have sent him to his rooms with a splint. The headmistress wishes to question Mr. Potter, madam. She desires that he be kept under supervision until then. It seems, I am afraid, that Mr. Potter is suspected to be involved in a very serious plot that could put this school at risk. I shouldn't say more, but if you choose to post some sentries at the doors to keep visitors out and Mr. Potter in, at least until tomorrow morning, I wouldn't think that was overdoing it. She didn't say any such thing, James exclaimed but he knew that his protest wouldn't help. In fact, the louder he protested, the worse it would probably look. Curio gasped and straightened up. Does this have anything to do with the intrusion of that horrible man on the premises yesterday? I've heard that he's some sort of muggle news person and that he's still here. It does, doesn't it? She covered her mouth with her hand and looked from Jackson to James. Again, I really shouldn't say any more, madam. 
Jackson replied. Besides, Mr. Potter may end up being entirely exonerated. We shall see in time, at any rate. Jackson looked down at James, and there was the faintest suggestion of a smile on one corner of his lips. Until tomorrow morning, then, James. He turned and stalked out of the room, closing the door carefully behind him. Chapter 17 Night of the Returning To her credit, Madame Curio didn't let Professor Jackson's accusations influence her treatment of James. She examined the fracture for several minutes, poking and pinching, and then carefully splinted it. She fell into a harsh but pedantic diatribe about the woes of Quidditch injuries, but it sounded to James like something she'd said a hundred times before. Her mind was elsewhere, and James didn't need to guess what was preoccupying her. The invasion of Martin Prescott into the school had caused a wave of speculation and anxiety. His identity as a muggle news reporter and the fact that he was being kept in the Alma Alaron's quarters had fed a load of rumours. There was a cloud of unease over the entire school, not alleviated by the headmistress's announcement that ministry officials were arriving to deal with Mr. Prescott. As Madame Curio measured the Skelligro dosage, James caught her glancing at him suspiciously, looking him up and down. Somebody had to have let the interloper in, after all. Why not this first-year son of the head aura? James knew that some people, those who believed the lies of the progressive element, would expect him to pull just such a stunt. Earlier that day he had heard a voice from a cluster of students saying, it makes sense, doesn't it? The whole aura line is that the law of secrecy is our only protection from the supposed muggle witch hunters. So what do they do? They allow this guy to sneak in and scare us all into thinking muggles are hiding out in the forest behind every bush with a torch and a pyre, ready to burn us all at the stake. It's preposterous. I say let him do his story. That'll show those ministry power mongers what for. There, Madame Curio said, straightening. I'm finished. You'll feel some tingling and itching overnight as the bone knits. That's perfectly normal. Don't fiddle with the splint. That's the last thing you'll want is for the bones to knit crookedly. The only fix for that would be for me to re-break the bone and start all over, and we certainly wouldn't want that now. She gestured towards the row of beds. Pick whichever you like. I'll see that breakfast is brought to you here in the morning. You may as well make yourself comfortable. James slung his backpack onto one of the bedside tables and climbed up onto the unusually high bed. It was a very comfortable bed, and for good reason, since all the mattresses in the hospital wing had been infused with relaxation charms. The charms, however, had no effect on James's thoughts, which were dark with frustration and anxiety. Professor Jackson had admitted that tonight was a night of ultimate importance. It wasn't simply speculation any more. And now here James was, stuck for the night in the hospital wing, neatly trapped by Professor Jackson's crafty interpretation of Headmistress McGonagall's instructions. Alone for the first time since the attempted broomstick caper, James felt the full impact of what had happened out on the Quidditch pitch. It had seemed like a crazy plan from the beginning, but no more so than the plan to capture Professor Jackson's briefcase, and that had worked, hadn't it? Everything had been a success so far, until now. It was as if an invisible brick wall had suddenly blocked them, halting their progress at the last, ultimate moment. Arguably, the Merlin staff was the most powerful element of the three relics. Even now, Corsica, Jackson and Delacroix were probably preparing to bring the relics together, unaware that they were missing the robe, but with the two most important relics in their possession. In spite of his anxieties, James had begun to drift sleepily under the influence of the charmed mattress. Now he sat up, his heart beating hard in his chest. What would happen when Jackson opened his case and found Ralph's dress robes instead of the relic robe of Merlin? The Visum Ineptio charm would break then, wouldn't it? Jackson would see the case for what it was. He'd recognize it and remember that day in technomancy class when James, Ralph and Zane had used the fake case to trick him. 
He thought they'd failed, had even referred to it while taking James to the hospital wing. He would surely realise then that they hadn't failed. Jackson was smart. He'd know which of the boys had the real robe. Not Zane or Ralph, but James, the boy he hadn't pegged yet. Would Jackson come to the hospital wing to demand the robe? No, even as James thought it, he knew Jackson wouldn't. He'd go straight to James's trunk in the Gryffindor boys' quarters. He'd probably claim to be searching for clues about James's involvement in the unnamed dangerous plot against Hogwarts. Jackson would surely get James's trunk open, and then he'd retrieve the robe. Everything James, Ralph and Zane, and even the gremlins had risked would be in vain. It would indeed be over, and there was nothing James could do about it. James struck the bedside table with his fist in frustration. Madame Curio, seated at her desk in the corner, gasped and put a hand over her chest. She looked at James, but didn't say anything. James pretended not to see her. His backpack had slipped sideways when he'd slammed his fist onto the table. Resolutely he grabbed it and opened it. He took out his parchments and his ink and quill. He knew that, under normal conditions, Madame Curio would never allow a patient to have an open ink bottle on her clean, white sheets. But as far as she was concerned, she was harbouring a potentially dangerous individual. Best not to provoke him. James bent over the parchment and wrote quickly, awkwardly, with his splinted arm, not even noticing the way his hand smeared the inky wet letters. Dear Dad, I'm sorry I took the M map and the I cloak. I knew I shouldn't have, but I needed them, and I thought it was what you would have done, so I hope you aren't too mad. I know I don't stand a chance with Mum, but put in a good word, will you? The reason I took them is because I've discovered something really sneaky and scary going on here at school. Some of the American teachers are in on it, though not Franklin. He's cool. Also, the P.E. here is in on it. I don't want to tell you about it in a letter, but even if I am in big trouble with you and Mum, I need you to come. Can you be here tomorrow? Miss Saccharina says you are on an important job and not to be interrupted, so maybe you can't, but try, OK? It's really important and I need your help. Love, James. James folded the parchment and tied it with a bit of twine. He didn't know how he'd send it, but he felt better just having written it. He remembered now that he'd intended to write to his dad about the Merlin plot way back when they'd captured the robe, and he berated himself for not doing it then. He'd thought at the time that his reasons for not telling his dad were good ones, but now, trapped in the hospital wing on the ultimate night of the Merlin plot, and knowing that, despite everything, Jackson might very possibly capture the relic robe back from him, it seemed foolish and arrogant that he hadn't written to his dad about it earlier. An idea struck James, and he dug into his backpack again. A moment later, he held his Weasley brand rubber duck in his hands. It still had Zane's handwriting on the bottom, laundry room. James dipped his quill and drew a line through that. Then, underneath it, he wrote, Hospital wing, send Nobby to the east window. When he was finished, he gave the duck a sharp squeeze. Quack, monkey barn pot, it quacked. In the corner, Madame Curio once again startled and looked accusingly at James. Potential criminal or not, she clearly thought his behaviour unaccountably rude. Sorry, madam, James said, holding up the rubber duck. It wasn't me, it was my duck. I see, he said with obvious disapproval. Perhaps now would be a good time for me to retire for the evening. You won't be, er, uh, needing anything, will you? James shook his head. No, madam, thanks. My arm feels loads better anyway. Don't fiddle with it, like I said, and you'll be fine by morning, I expect. She stood and hurried past James towards the leaded glass doors. Two figures could be seen through the milky glass, and James knew that they were Philia Goyle and Kevin Murdoch, both kindly sent by Professor Jackson to watch the doors. Madame Curio unlocked the doors and went out, offering her good evenings to the sentries. The door clicked shut behind her, and James heard the bolt clack into place. 
He sighed in frustration and then jumped as his rubber duck quacked a loud insult next to him. He raised it and looked at the bottom. Below his handwriting was a new line of black letters. Open the window. Ten minutes. James felt a little better. He hadn't been sure that either Ralph or Zane would be in any position to hear or respond to their ducks. In fact, it had no word whatsoever about what had happened to the rest of the gremlins. He felt cautiously confident that none had been caught, although Ralph's predicament, left in the middle of the Slytherin holding pens, was probably worse than anyone else's. Despite that, he figured that even Ralph had got out all right. Once everyone had seen James explode out of the holding pen riding Tabitha's broom, attention had probably focused on his wild ride and then Tabitha's summoning of her broomstick, bringing both it and James back to the pitch. Most likely, Ralph had slipped out at that point and returned to the shed, along with the gremlins. James watched the clock over Madame Curio's desk as the minutes ticked away. He struggled with the impulse to go and open the window before the ten minutes had passed. If Madame Curio came back and saw him standing by an open window, she'd suspect treachery even though the window was at least thirty feet above the ground. Finally, as the minute hand ticked into place, announcing 8.15, James jumped off the bed. He grabbed the letter from the bedside table and ran lightly towards the far right window. The latch turned easily, and James opened the window onto a cool, misty night. The sky had finally cleared, revealing a dusting of silvery stars, but there was no sign of Nobby. James leaned over the sill, looking along the ledge, and a monstrous, silent shape loomed out of the darkness towards him, blotting out the stars. It fell over him heavily, surrounded him, and yanked him bodily out of the window before he had time to shout for help. The figure squeezed him so that James's breath whooshed out of him. Far below, a voice called in a loud, stage whisper, "'Not so hard! You'll grind his bones already!' James was amazed to recognize Zane's voice. The gigantic hand loosened a bit, and James saw yards of female giant going past as he was lowered towards the ground. "'Nicely done, Pritchker!' Zane called, patting the giant on her shin. She grunted happily and opened her hand, unrolling James onto the ground between her massive feet. "'I thought you were just bringing Nobby!' James gasped, clambering up. "'It was Ted's idea!' Ralph said, moving out of the shadow of a nearby shrubbery. He knew you'd want to get out and see to this whole Merlin affair, especially now. He went off to find Grawp the moment you were taken off by Jackson. Grawp found Prechka, who's tall enough to reach the hospital wing. And we were just trying to figure out how to get you to the window when you ducked at us. Worked out pretty neatly, we thought. I'll say, James said, rubbing his ribs with the heel of his left palm. Good thing she's left-handed or I'd probably need a whole new dose of skelly grove for my arm. She's got a grip. So where is Ted, anyway? House arrest, along with the rest of the gremlins, Zane said, shrugging. McGonagall knew they were involved in the broomstick-thieving plot, even if she can't prove it yet. She probably would have let it slide. She has bigger frogs to dissect with Recreant and Saccharina here. But Jackson's idea was to have all the gremlins out of the way until tomorrow, when the whole thing with this Prescott dude was taken care of. Ted was sent off to the Gryffindor common room the moment he got back from the forest with Grop. Everybody's there except Sabrina, who took a pretty ugly giantism curse from Corsica. Her nose is the size of a soccer ball. Nothing for it but to sleep it off, apparently. I think we'd have been under guard, too, except that Jackson thinks Ralph's too dim to be involved in the broomstick plot, and I had the perfect alibi being right there on the field the whole time. So here we are. What's the plan, James? James glanced from Zane to Ralph to Prechka, and then took a deep breath. Same as before, we need to get out to the Grotto Keep to stop Jackson, Delacroix, and whoever else is involved— we still need to capture the Merlin staff if we can, and most importantly, we need to escape so we can testify about whoever is involved. Eria, Ralph agreed. But first, James said, holding up the letter he'd written to his dad. 
I need to send this. I should have sent it weeks ago, but better late than never. Ted was right. We need help. If we hadn't asked the gremlins to help us, I'd still be stuck up there in the hospital wing. If we hadn't asked the gremlins to help us, you might not have got thrown in there in the first place, Ralph muttered, but without much feeling. Zane, James said, turning towards him and stuffing the letter into his pocket. What time is the alignment supposed to happen? 9.55, Zane answered. We've only got an hour and a half. James nodded. Meet me at the edge of the forest near the lake in fifteen minutes. Bring Prechka if she'll come. Zane looked up the dark bulk of the giantess. I don't think we could get rid of her even if we wanted to. She seems to like helping. Excellent. Ralph, you have your wand. Ralph produced his ridiculously large wand from his back pocket. The lime-green painted tip glowed eerily in the darkness. Don't leave home without it, he said. All right, keep it handy. You're on guard duty. Try to remember everything we learned in DADA -DA and be ready to put it to use. This is it, then. Let's go. James darted through the shadows of the corridors, trying to move both quickly and inconspicuously, which was rather a challenge. He arrived at the portrait hole just as Stephen Metzger was coming out. "'James,' Stephen said, blinking in surprise. "'What are you doing here? Aren't you supposed to be—' He stopped and then glanced around the darkened corridors. "'Get inside before anyone sees you.' "'Thanks, Stephen,' James said, ducking into the portrait hole. "'Don't mention it,' Stephen replied, "'and I really mean that. I never saw you, and you never saw me. Don't make me regret this.' "'Regret what? Nothing happened.' Stephen stepped into the hall as the portrait of the fat lady swung shut on James. The gremlins, except for Sabrina, were gathered by the fireplace, looking sulky and agitated. Noah saw James and sat up. "'I see Prechka found her man.' The others turned and grinned wickedly. "'What are you doing here?' Ted said, growing serious. "'Ralph and Zane just left to get you. It took us half the night to get your stuff sorted out after that disaster at the Quidditch pitch, so it's getting pretty late. You should be heading out to the island. You want us to come along?' "'No, you're all in enough trouble. I just came to mail this.' He held up the letter. Ted nodded in approval, sensing who it was for. I'm meeting Ralph and Zane by the forest in ten minutes. I want to come, Noah said, standing up. Corsica cursed Sabrina. I want to return the favour on her behalf. James shook his head. You three have a different job tonight, and it may well involve a curse or two. If Ralph, Zane and I fail, Jackson or somebody will probably show up here looking for the Merlin robe. You three need to guard it. If anyone comes looking for it, you have to stop them, no matter what. I hate to ask you to do that, but will you? Petra nodded and looked at Noah and Ted. Not a problem, but as much as we'd all like a chance to plug one of those guys, do try not to fail, won't you? James nodded and then turned and ran up the stairs to the boys' sleeping quarters. The room was empty and dark, but for one candle near the door to the tiny bathroom. Nobby, who hadn't got the principle of the owlery and continued to show up at James's window, was sleeping in his cage. Nobby, James whispered urgently, got a message for you to deliver to Dad. I know it's late, but it's really important. The great bird raised his head from beneath his wing and clicked his beak sleepily. James opened the cage door, letting Nobby hop out onto the ledge of the table. When the note was tied to Nobby's outstretched leg, James opened the window. And this time, when you come back, go to the owlery. Nice as it is to have you around, you're going to get me into even more trouble, all right? The owl peered at James with his enormous, inscrutable eyes, then hopped onto the window ledge. With a gust of flapping wings, Nobby launched out into the darkness. James was about to plunge back down the stairs again when his eye was caught by the dark bulk of his trunk. Was it slightly out of its normal position? He felt a sudden icy dread. Maybe Jackson had already been for the robe. Perhaps he'd checked his briefcase before heading out to the Grotto Keep just to be sure and discovered the trickery. Surely the gremlins below would have seen Jackson coming and going, but then again, maybe not. As James had realised earlier, 
Jackson was smart. Maybe he'd disguised himself, or maybe he'd asked Madame Delacroix to use her remote physio apparition skills to simply appear in the boy's sleeping quarters to collect the robe directly. Then again, Ted had mentioned that Zane and Ralph had been there, sorting things out after the Quidditch disaster. James had to know. He hunkered down next to his trunk and produced his wand. The case unlocked at his command, and he riffled through the contents until he found the case buried at the bottom. It was still there, but it was slightly open. James gasped in fear, then felt inside. His fingers found the smooth folds of cloth. He could even smell that haunting smell of leaves and earth and living, breathing winds. He heaved a gigantic sigh of relief. With the trunk open, James wondered if there was anything he might need for his adventure at the island. He glanced around at the unruly pile of clothes and supplies on the end of his bed. After a moment's consideration, he grabbed the marauder's map and the invisibility cloak. He clapped the trunk shut, used his wand to lock it, and then, having left his backpack on the table in the hospital wing, he stuffed the map and the cloak into a leather satchel his mum had given him at the beginning of the year. He turned and clumped down the stairs quickly, stopping only to remind Noah, Petra and Ted about Delacroix's powers. Don't worry, Noah said, jumping up and heading for the stairs. We'll take turns keeping an eye on your trunk. One hour shifts, right, Ted? Ted nodded. Satisfied, James ducked through the portrait hole to go and meet Ralph and Zane. Five minutes later, as he came out of the courtyard and onto the grounds, James's eyes were too dazzled from the interior lights to be able to see clearly in the darkness. He felt his way down the slope towards the lake until he heard Zane whistling, apparently trying to sound like a bird. The sound came from his left, and as James turned towards it, he was finally able to make out the bulk of the giantess standing at the edge of the woods. Zane and Ralph were huddled nearby. That was pretty good, wasn't it? Zane said, grinning. I saw that in a James Bond movie. I thought you'd appreciate it. Nice, James nodded. The cool of the night air settled over him, and James felt a wild sense of excitement and fear. This was it. There was no turning back. Even now, his absence from the hospital wing was probably being discovered. There might be trouble tomorrow, but if they failed now, there'd be even worse trouble to come. James glanced up at Prechka. Will she let us ride on her shoulders? It's the only way we'll get there in time. Prechka heard him. In answer, she bent down, making the earth shudder as her knees struck the hillside. Prechka, help, she said, trying to keep the boom out of her voice. Prechka, carry small ones. She grinned at James, and her head, now at his level, was nearly as tall as he was. Zane, Ralph, and James took turns scrambling up her arm and onto the giantess's great sloping shoulders. James needed Ralph and Zane to help him up, and his splinted right arm was almost no use to him. When she stood, it was like riding a freight elevator into the treetops. Without a word, she began to lumber into the forest. The upper branches of the trees swept past, occasionally groaning as Prechka pushed them aside like reeds. How does she know where she's going? James asked in a hushed voice. Ralph shrugged. Grawp told her. I don't know how, but apparently it's a giant thing. They just remember where they've been and how to get there again. It's probably how they find each other's ovals in the mountains. I didn't understand the language at all, but she seems pretty sure of herself. Riding Prechka was an altogether different experience than riding Grawp. Whether he giant had been careful and delicate, the giantess swayed and thumped, her footsteps shuddering up her body and shaking the boys. James thought it was rather like riding on a gigantic walking metronome. The forest swam past, eerie from this strange high perspective, as if it were clawing at the sky. After a while, James tugged on the giantess's burlap tunic. Stop here, Prechka! We're close! and I don't want them to hear us coming if we can avoid it. Prechka put out a hand, halting herself against a huge, gnarled oak tree. 
Carefully, she lowered herself, and the boys climbed off her shoulders, sliding down her arm to the ground. Wait here, Prechka, James said into the giantess's enormous, lumpy face. She nodded slowly, seriously, and then stood again. He could only hope that her understanding of their wishes was better than Grorp's, who had wandered off in search of food after only a few minutes when he had brought them out here last year. This way, Zane said, pointing. James could see the glitter of moonlight on water through the trees. As quietly as possible, the boys threaded through the tree trunks and underbrush. Within a few minutes, they emerged at the perimeter of the lake. The island of the Grotto Keep could be seen further along the edge of the water. It loomed monstrously, grown to gothic cathedral proportions for its ultimate night. The Dragon's Head Bridge was clearly visible, open wide, both welcoming and threatening at the same time. James heard Ralph gulp. Silently, they made their way towards it. As they reached the opening onto the bridge, the moon slipped from behind a raft of wispy clouds. The island of the Grotto Keep unveiled fully in that silvery glow. There was virtually no hint of the wild, wooded nature of the island now. The Dragon's Head Bridge was a carefully sculpted horror, yawning open before them. At its throat, the vine-encrusted gate was as solid-looking and ornate as wrought iron. James could clearly read the poem inscribed on the doors. It's closed, Zane whispered rather hopefully. Does that mean anything? James shook his head. I don't know. Come on, let's see if we can get in. Single file, the three boys tiptoed across the bridge. James in the lead saw the bridge's upper jaw open further as they approached the gate. It didn't creak this time. The motion was silent and oily, almost unnoticeable. The gates, however, remained firmly closed. James made to reach for his wand and then stopped, hissing in pain. He'd forgotten about the splint on his fractured right arm. Ralph, you'll have to do it, James said, sidling to the right to let Ralph in front of him. My wand hand's no use. Besides, you're the spell's genius. What am I supposed to do? Ralph stammered, pulling out his wand. Just use the unlocking spell. Whoa, wait, Zane said, throwing up his hand. Last time we tried that, we were almost tree food, remember? That was then, James said reasonably. The island wasn't ready. Tonight's the night it exists for, I think. It'll let us in this time. Besides, this is Ralph. If anybody can do it, he can. Zane grimaced, but couldn't offer any argument. He took a step backwards, giving Ralph room. Ralph pointed his wand at the gates nervously, his wand hand shaking. He cleared his throat. <clears throat> what is it? I always forget. Alohomora, James whispered encouragingly. Emphasis on the second and fourth syllables. You've done it loads of times. Don't worry. Ralph stiffened, trying to halt the shivering of his arm. He took a deep breath and, in a tremulous voice, spoke the command. Immediately the vines twining the gates began to loosen. The letters of the poem dissolved into curls and tendrils contracting from the wooden shapes of the doors. After a few seconds, the doors swung silently open. Ralph glanced back at James and Zane, his eyes wide and worried. Well, it worked, I guess. I'd say so, Ralph, Zane said, moving forwards. The three of them stepped carefully into the darkness beyond the gates. The inside of the grotto keep was circular and mostly empty, surrounded by trees that had grown into the shapes of pillars, supporting a thick, domed ceiling of branches and spring leaves. The floor of the grotto was terraced with stone, forming steps that descended towards the middle. There, in the very centre, a round bowl of earth was lit in a beam of bright moonlight that pierced a hole in the centre of the domed canopy. The Merlin throne stood in that beam of moonlight, and in front of it, silhouetted against the moonlight, her back to them, was Madame Delacroix. James felt weak with fear, 
he froze in place and only distantly felt Ralph's hand groping at him, tugging him backwards into the shadow of one of the tree-trunk pillars. He stumbled a little and then dropped down behind the bulk of the tree next to Ralph and Zane. Carefully, slowly, James peered around the tree pillar, his eyes wide and his heart thundering. Delacroix hadn't moved. Her back was still to them, and she was still staring motionlessly at the throne. The Merlin throne was tall, straight-backed, and narrow. It was made of polished wood, but was somehow more delicate than James had expected. The mass of it was formed of carvings of vines and leaves, curling and tangled. The only solid parts were the seat and the centre of the backrest. The throne looked as if it had been grown rather than carved, much like the grotto keep itself. No one else was visible. Apparently Delacroix had arrived early. James was wondering how long she'd been standing there, motionless, watching the throne, when there was the sound of someone else's footsteps behind them on the Dragon's Head Bridge. James held his breath and sensed Ralph and Zane hunkering down as low as they could next to him, hiding among the low underbrush lining the keep. A man's voice spoke a low command in some strange language James didn't recognize. It sounded both beautiful and frightening. There was the sound of the gate's vines unfurling again, and then footsteps clacked hollowly on the stone steps of the terraced floor. Professor Jackson moved into view, walking resolutely down into the centre of the grotto keep behind Madame Delacroix. "'Professor Jackson!' Madame Delacroix said, her heavily accented voice ringing in the stone bowl of the grotto. "'You never fail to meet my expectation!' She still hadn't turned around. "'Nor you mine, madame. You are early.' "'I was savouring the moment, Theodore. It been a long time coming. I'd be tempted to say too long if I were a believer in chance. I am not a cause. This how it were meant to be. I done what I meant to do. Even you have performed the role you were preordained to perform. Do you really believe so, madame? Jackson asked, stopping several feet behind Delacroix. James noticed that Jackson had his hickory wand in his hand. I wonder. I, as you know, am neither a believer in chance nor destiny. I am a believer in choices. <laughs> Don't matter what you believe, Theodore, long as your choices lead to the right end. I have the robe, Jackson said flatly, abandoning the pretense of polite conversation. I have always had it. You will not get it from me. I am here to see to that. I am here to stop you, madame, despite your best efforts to keep me away. James almost gasped. He covered his mouth with his hand, stifling it. Jackson was here to stop her. But how? James felt a cold dread dawning on him. Next to him, Ralph whispered almost silently, Did he say? Shh! Zane hissed urgently. Listen! Delacroix was making a strange, rhythmic sound. Her shoulders shook slightly with it, and James realized she was laughing. I never attempt to block you. Why, if I not allow a token resistance to your presence on this trip, you never done come at all. Your stubbornness and suspicious nature are my best tool. And I need you, Professor. I need what you had, what you believed so ardently that you protect in. Jackson stiffened. Do you believe I was foolish enough to bring the robe with me tonight? Then you are more arrogant than I thought. No, the robe is safe. It is secured with the best hexes and counter asio charms ever created. I know that, for they were created by me. 
You shall not find it. Of that I am certain. But Delacroix was laughing harder. She still hadn't turned around. The beam of light illuminating the chair seemed to be growing brighter, and James realized it was the accumulated light of the planets. They were moving into place. The time of the Hall of Elders Crossing was nearly upon them. Oh, Professor! <laughs> Your confidence cheer me. With enemies such as yourself, my success is all the more delicious. You think I not known all along that you got the robe of Merlinus in your case at all times? You think I not preparing for the robe to be delivered to me from the moment I first arrived here? I haven't lived so much as a finger, and yet the rope come to me of its own accord this very night. James had a horrible thought. He remembered that day in defense against the dark arts when Jackson had followed Professor Franklin into the classroom, speaking in low tones. Madame Delacroix had come to the door to tell Jackson his class was waiting, James had glanced down at that moment, and the case had mysteriously come open. Was it possible that Madame Delacroix had caused that to happen, just so that James would see inside? Had she tried to use him somehow? He remembered Zane and Ralph saying that the capture of the robe had been easy, somehow too easy. He shuddered. James, Ralph whispered urgently. You didn't bring the robe with you tonight, did you? Of course not. James replied, I'm not crazy. Zane leaned in to keep his voice as quiet as possible. Then what's in the book bag? James felt terror and anger mingling inside him. The marauder's map and the invisibility cloak. Ralph reached up and clutched James's shoulder, turning him so that they were face to face. Ralph's expression was horrible. James, you don't have the invisibility cloak, he rasped his voice cracking. I do. You left it with me in the Slytherin holding pen, remember? I used it to escape. It's in my trunk, back in the Slytherin boy's quarters. James simply stared at Ralph, petrified. Below them, in the centre of the grotto keep, Madame Delacroix continued to cackle. <laughs> Miss James Potter, she called through her laughter. Please feel free to join us. Bring your friends if you so desire. James felt rooted to the spot. He wouldn't go down there, of course. He would run. He knew now that he had the robe of Merliness in his satchel, that he had been tricked into bringing it along, tricked into thinking it was the invisibility cloak. Now was the moment to flee. And yet he didn't. Ralph pushed him, urging him to go. But Zane, on James's other side, slowly stood up and pulled out his wand. The voodoo queen thinks she's pretty smart, he said out loud, stepping around the pillar and pointing his wand at her. You were as ugly as you are evil. Stupefy! James gasped as the bolt of red light shot from Zane's wand. The curse struck Madame Delacroix directly in the back, and James watched for her to collapse unconscious. She didn't move, however, and James was dismayed to see that the bolt of red light had passed straight through her. It struck the ground near the throne and vanished harmlessly. Delacroix was still laughing as she turned to face Zane. Ugly, am I? Her laughter dried up as her gaze met Zane's. She was no longer blind or old. It was, in fact, her wraith, the projected version of herself. Evil, perhaps, but only as a hobby. The wraith of Madame Delacroix raised a hand, and Zane was lifted from his feet roughly. His wand flew from his hand, and he thumped against the tree pillar, his shoes three feet from the ground. He seemed to be stuck there, as if on a hook. If I was truly evil, I would kill you now, wouldn't I? She grinned at him and then pivoted, pointing her arm at the place where James hid. 
Mr. Potter, please. It's silly of you to fight me. Yeah, after all, almost my apprentice in this endeavor. Bring Mr. Deedle with you. Let's all enjoy the fado do shall we? Jackson had turned when Zane came forward, watching with a noticeable lack of surprise, his wand still out but pointed at the floor. Now he looked on as James and Ralph stood jerkily as if against their will and began to march down the steps towards the centre of the grotto. His eyes met James's, his bushy dark brows low and furious. Stop, Potter, he said quietly, raising his wand halfway, pointing it at the floor in front of James and Ralph. Their feet stopped moving as if they'd suddenly landed in glue. Oh, Teardar, must you prolong this? Delacroix sighed. She swung her arm towards him and performed a complicated gesture with her fingers. Jackson's wand flicked out of his hand as if on a string. He grabbed for it, but it darted up and away. Delacroix made another gesture with her hand, and the wand snapped in midair as if broken over a knee. Jackson's face didn't change, but he slowly lowered his hand, staring hard at the two pieces of his hickory wand. Then he turned back to Delacroix, his face white with fury, and began to pace towards her. Delacroix's hand moved like lightning, darting into the folds of her clothing and coming out with her horrible grapefruit wand between her fingers. This may only be a representation of the real thing, she said playfully, conjured from the dirt of this place, just like this version of Marcel. But I assure you, Theodore, it exactly as powerful as I think it is. Don't make me destroy you. Jackson stopped in his tracks, but his face didn't change. I can't let you go through with this, Delacroix. You know that. Oh, but you already have, she cackled gleefully. She pointed the wand at Jackson and flicked it. A bolt of ugly orange light shot from it, sending Jackson flying violently backwards. He landed hard on the upper stone steps, grunting in pain. He struggled to get up, and Delacroix rolled her eyes. Heroes, she said disdainfully, and flicked her wand again. Jackson flew off the ground and rammed against another of the tree pillars lining the grotto. He hung there, apparently knocked unconscious. And now, she said, lazily pointing her wand in the direction of James and Ralph, Join me. The two boys were lifted from the ground and transported down the rest of the steps. They dropped clumsily to their feet in the grassy space at the bottom of the grotto, directly in front of the wraith of Madame Delacroix. Her eyes were emerald green and piercing. Give me the robe, and please don't make me harm either of you. I only asked the one time. The satchel slipped off James's shoulder and struck the ground at his feet. He looked down at it, feeling dazed and completely hopeless. Please, Delacroix said, and flicked her wand. James fell to his knees as if something extraordinarily heavy had landed on his shoulders. His hand plunged into the bag, clutched the robe, and pulled it out. Ralph struggled to grab it but he seemed locked in place, unable to move more than a few inches in any direction. Don't, James! I'm not! he said hopelessly. Delacroix's eyes sparkled greedily. She reached out a hand and delicately took the robe from James. Free will is highly overrated, she said airily. You won't win, James said angrily. You don't have all the relics! Delacroix looked up from the robe, meeting James's eye with an expression of polite surprise. Don't I, Miss Potter? No, James said, gritting his teeth. We didn't get the broomstick. Tabitha still has it. I'm not even sure if she knows what it is, but I don't see her bringing it to you now either way. He hoped he was right as he said it. He didn't see the broomstick anywhere in sight, and Tabitha certainly didn't seem to be present unless she was hiding like they had been. Delacroix laughed lightly, as if James had just made a very witty remark at a party. 
<laughs> that was the perfect hiding place, wasn't it, Miss Potter? And Miss Corsica such the perfect individual to harbor it for me. Why, it's so perfect, in fact, that you never stood a chance of learning that it was, in fact, a clever lie. Interesting him may be, but Miss Corsica's broomstick? Him nothing more than a convenient ruse. No, no, like the robe, the Merlin staff also found it way to me tonight, regardless of what you think. It been cared for very well, in fact. The rather beautiful wraith of Madame Delacroix turned to Ralph and held out her hand. Your wand, please, Mr. Deedle. No, Ralph protested, his voice almost a moan. He tried to back away. Don't make me insist, please, Ralph, Delacroix said, raising her own wand towards him. Ralph's hand jerked up and went to his back pocket. Trembling, he produced his ridiculously huge wand. For the first time, James saw it for what it was. It wasn't just unusually thick, whittled to a point at one end. It was part of something that was, at one time, much larger, worn down with age, but still, as had been repeatedly shown, extremely and inexplicably powerful. Delacroix reached out and almost daintily plucked the Merlin staff from Ralph's hand. There be no point risking my own capture by smuggling such a thing onto the ground. Surely someone would have detected it if done been in my possession. So I arrange for it to be sold to you and your charming father, Mr. Deedle. I was your salesman, in fact, though in a different guise. I do hope you enjoyed the use of the staff. Quite powerful, wasn't it? Oh, but now I see, she added, turning almost apologetic. You thought you be the powerful one, didn't you? <laughs> I'm so sorry, Miss Deedle. You really think you've been allowed to enter the keep if you not had the staff of Merlin with you? Surely even you can see the humor in that, can you? You, a muggle bone! <laughs> Please forgive me! She laughed again, lightly, maliciously. She turned then and very carefully began to arrange the relics on the throne. James and Ralph looked at each other miserably, and then James tried to look back at Zane, who was still stuck to the tree pillar behind them, but the darkness was too thick. Madame Delacroix stepped back from the throne, breathing in a great, long breath of anticipation. She positioned herself between Ralph and James as if they were compatriots. Oh, there we go. Oh, I'm so pleased. I hate to say it, but everything worked out exactly as I planned. Enjoy the spectacular, my young friends. I cannot guarantee that Melinas will not destroy you with his arrival, but surely you not think that a too high price to pay to observe such a thing. It'll be worth it if he destroys you too, James said through gritted teeth. Such venom, Delacroix replied, smiling. No wonder you make such a good apprentice. The robe of Merlin had been draped across the back of the throne, as if Merlin would simply shrug into it when he appeared. The last bit of Merlin's staff leaned against the front of the throne. The beam of combined moon and starlight had become very bright, drawing a dim line through the darkness from the hole in the domed ceiling to the center of the grassy area below. The three relics glowed in the shimmering, silvery light. The time of the Hall of Elders' Crossing had come. James heard something. He knew Madame Delacroix and Ralph had heard it too. All three turned their heads, 
trying to locate the source of the noise. It was low and whispering, coming from all directions at once. It was tremulous and distant, almost like a low note on a hundred far-off flutes, but it was growing louder. Madame Delacroix glanced about, her face a mask of glee, and yet James was sure that, wraith or not, there was a hint of fear on her face as well. She suddenly gripped both boys' arms in her steely hands. Look! she breathed. Tendrils of mist were pouring in between the pillars of the grotto, bringing the sound with them. James glanced around. The tendrils were seeping in between the branches of the domed ceiling as well. They were as insubstantial as smoke, but moved intelligently with growing speed. They snaked towards the throne, and there they began to collect. As the tendrils combined, they writhed and collapsed, forming only hazy shapes at first, and then hardening, coming into focus. A line of slightly curved horizontal bars coalesced in the centre of the throne. With an involuntary shudder, James saw that they were the ribs of a skeleton. A spine grew from them, both up and down, connecting to two more shapes, the skull and the pelvis. This, James realised, was an apparition happening in extreme slow motion. The atoms of Merlin were streaming back together, fighting the collected inertia of the centuries. The sound that accompanied the apparition was growing both in volume and pitch, rising through the octaves and becoming almost human. Hey, voodoo queen! A voice immediately behind James suddenly said, making all three of them jump. Dodge this! A length of log slammed down onto Delacroix's head, disintegrating it into a hundred clods of wet dirt. Instantly, the body-bind curse on both James and Ralph fell away. James spun and saw Zane holding the end of the log, pulling it back out of the mess of Delacroix's wraith, which was struggling to rebuild itself. From the shoulders up, Delacroix seemed to be made entirely of broken dirt, writhing roots and worms. The wraith's hands scrabbled at the ruined neck, trying to push the clods back into shape. She forgot about me when Merlin started forming, Zane shouted, yanking the log free and hoisting it back over his shoulder. I fell off the pillar and just grabbed the closest heavy thing I could find. Get the robe and the staff. Zane swung the log like a baseball bat, taking off one of Delacroix's arms at the shoulder. It hit the ground and shattered into a mess of dirt and worms. James jumped forward and snatched a handful of Merlin's robe, reaching his left hand through the forming shape of the wizard. He pulled, but the robe fought back, struggling to maintain its position. Digging his heels into the soft earth, James yanked as hard as he could. The robe wrung from the back of the throne, coming through the skeletal shape seated on it. The shape gripped the arms of the throne and seemed to scream, bringing the pitch of the haunting drone up another octave. Ralph lunged and grabbed at the staff, which was growing in length even as the figure on the throne gained solidity. He jumped back with it, holding it high over his head. The wraith of Madame Delacroix seemed caught between trying to reform itself and trying to get the robe and the staff back into place. It waved its remaining arm wildly at Ralph, then clawed at the robe in James's hands. Zane danced behind the wraith, the log held high, then brought it down again, burying it almost waist-deep in the disintegrating figure. James glanced towards the Merlin throne and saw that the figure there, which had formed to a full skeleton with ghostly musculature clinging to it like moss, was writhing horribly, beginning to melt again into mist. The sound of Merlin's apparition had become a keening shriek. And then, as if out of nowhere, another figure was among them. It resolved from the darkness beyond the grotto keep, moving with terrible speed. It was the dryad with the horribly long blue fingernails, but only just barely. There was something else moving within the shape, as if the dryad was merely a costume. A new voice joined the keening wail of the half-formed Merlin. Master! 
No, I will not fail you. Your time has come at last. The figure split somehow, completely abandoning the form of the dryad. It became simply two enormous black talons. They lunged simultaneously at James and Ralph, snatching the robe and the staff back and sending the two boys sprawling to the stone steps. The talons spun, placing the relics back into their positions and then retracted, falling into dust as if exhausted. The figure on the throne shuddered violently, drawing itself back together, and the tendrils of mist roared towards it, solidifying now with terrible speed. The bones grew muscles, layer upon layer. Organs bloomed inside the chest and abdomen, forming from the veins out. The body filled the robe, and the robe took shape over it. Skin collected on the body like dew, first as filmy membrane, but thickening, growing ruddy and tan. The fingers clutched the staff, which had grown to a length of six feet, tapered gently at the bottom and with a heavy, knobbed end. Runes ran up and down the staff, pulsing with a faint green light. The noise of Merlin's return resolved into a long scream, and the wizard finally ran out of breath, his head thrown back, the cords of his neck drawn taut as wire. After a long moment, he drew his first breath in a thousand years, filling his huge chest, and lowered his head. Master! a ghostly voice cried out. James looked from the figure on the throne to the shape that had resolved out of the awful talons. It was a small man, almost invisible. He panted, his bald head glistening in the faint moonlight. You have returned! My work is complete! I am released! I have returned, the voice of Merlin agreed. The face was stony. The eyes locked onto the ghost. But what time is this you have returned me to, Ostramadux? The, the world is made ready for you, master, the ghost stammered, its voice high and frightened. I, I waited until the perfect time for your coming. The balance of the magic and the magicless is ripe for your hand, master. The time, the time is come. Merlin stared at the ghost, utterly unmoving. Please, master! Ostromadoc screamed, falling to his ghostly knees. I have watched for centuries. My duty, my duty was more than I could bear. I waited as long as I could. I only helped a little. I found a woman, master. Her heart was open to me. She shared our goals. So I... I encouraged her. I helped, but only a little, a little. Merlin's gaze moved from Ostromadox to the wraith of Madame Delacroix, which had mostly reconstituted itself. It flung itself to its knees, and when it spoke, the voice sounded as if it came through a mouthful of dirt. Ah! Your servant, Melinas, I summon you to fulfill your destiny, to lead us against the muggle worm. We prepare for you, the world rap for you. This puppet of filth is to be my muse, Merlin said, his voice low but nearly thundering with intensity. Let us see her as she is, then. Not as she wishes to be seen. Delacroix straightened herself and began to speak, but nothing came out. Her jaw worked almost mechanically, and then, chillingly, deep, choking sounds began to emerge from her throat. The wraith's hands floated upwards, rising to clutch at the neck, then to scrabble at it, digging in with long fingernails so that strips of muddy flesh began to peel away. The throat bulged, almost like that of a bullfrog, and the wraith suddenly bent at the waist as if it was going to be sick. Merlin's eyes blazed at the wraith, 
and his staff glowed softly, the runes rippling with their inner light. Finally, violently, Madame Delacroix's wraith heaved and the jaw split wide open, far past its logical limits. Something ripped forth from the yawning, horrible mouth. It poured out onto the ground before it. The wraith's body shrunk as the mess poured from its mouth. It was almost as if the wraith turned itself inside out, emptying itself out of its own mouth, until all that was left was the thing lying prone on the ground, writhing and awful. It was Madame Delacroix as she really was, somehow transported from her remote place of safety and vomited from her puppet form. She racked against the floor as if in great pain, her shape emaciated and bony, her eyes blank grey orbs staring blindly at the ceiling. Ostromadox, you have brought me to a dead time, Merlin said, his low voice filling the grotto like the roar of a thousand deeps. He turned away from the pathetic shape of Madame Delacroix, returning his gaze to the cowering ghost. The trees have awakened for me, but their voice is nearly mute. Even the earth sleeps the sleep of centuries. You have returned me to suit yourself and yourself alone. You were a faulty servant when I agreed to apprentice you, and I have returned only to realize the depth of that mistake. I discharge you from my service. Be gone! Merlin raised his free hand and held it palm out towards the ghost of Ostromadox. The ghost paled even further and shrank away, raising its hands as if to deflect a blow. No, no, I was faithful. Please do not discharge me. I fulfilled my duty. I was faithful. No! The last word elongated and rose in pitch, climbing the scale as the ghost seemed to shrink. For a moment it assumed the form of the blue dryad, cringing and desperate. Then it began to lose its shape entirely. It dwindled, and James saw that it contracted in the same proportion as Merlin's closing hand, as if the wizard were squeezing Ostromadox in his outstretched fist. The ghost's last word bled into a wall of horror, diminishing even as the ghost collapsed into a bright, flickering point of light. Merlin squeezed his fist and then opened his hand with a roll of the fingers. The ghost popped, vanished, leaving only the echo of its final scream. Finally, as if noticing them for the first time, Merlin turned his attention to James, Ralph, and Zane. James moved forward, not sure what he would do, but knowing in his heart he had to do something. Merlin raised his hand again, this time towards James. James felt the world soften around him, darkening. He fought it, tried to shout out against the descending oblivion, but it was no use. He could fight the power of Merlin as much as a gnat might fight a gale. The world streamed away, funneling down to a point, and at the centre of the point was the upraised hand of Merlin pulling him in. There was an eye in the centre of the hand, blue like ice. The eye closed, and Merlin's voice said one word. A word that seemed to fill the blackness where the world had once been, and that word was sleep. Chapter 18 The Tower Assembly Dawn was a faint pink line on the rim of the horizon when James opened his eyes. He was lying uncomfortably on the grass at the bottom of the grotto keep, and he was cold to the bone. Moaning, he rolled to a sitting position and took stock of his surroundings. The first thing he noticed was that the Merlin throne was gone. There wasn't as much as a depression in the grass where it had stood. The second thing James noticed as he raised his head and looked around was that the grotto keep was no longer a magical place. In the absence of the Merlin throne, the island was quickly returning to its wild, random nature. The sense of haunting Gothic architecture was slipping away. 
birds sang in the thatch of tree branches overhead. Uh, a voice nearby groaned. Where am I? Somehow I have the terrible feeling that a cup of coffee and a fireplace is not about to appear before my eyes. Zane? James said, getting shakily to his feet. Are you all right? Where's Ralph? Amir, Ralph muttered, just taking inventory of all my bones and major bodily functions. So far nothing alarming, except that I need a bathroom even more than St. Rocky Majors. James climbed the steps into the gloom of the upper terraces of the grotto. The early morning light was faint and grey, barely making it through the brush and trees of the island. Zane and Ralph were climbing unsteadily to their feet. Merlin's gone, James said, looking around, and I don't see Jackson or Delacroix either. He stepped over the broken bits of Jackson's wand and shuddered. Guess we were wrong about him, weren't we? Ralph said. We were wrong about loads of stuff, James agreed softly. Zane rubbed his lower back and groaned. Hey, we didn't do too bad, considering everything. We almost stopped Merlin's return, thanks to a handy length of log and my cat-like reflexes. His voice sounded hollow in that flat echo of the grotto, and he fell silent. The three boys found the opening that led out to the Dragon's Head Bridge, hacked through some weeds that had grown up to choke the space, and stumbled out into the dawn. The bridge had partially collapsed, and bore almost no resemblance to the frightening Dragon's Head any more. The bank bordering the forest was muddy and wet, covered in morning dew. Hey, look, Ralph said, pointing. There were tracks in the fresh, slippery mud. Looks like two people went that way, away from the school, Zane said, bending over to study the sloppy markings. You think one of them was Merlin? James shook his head. No, Merlin wasn't wearing shoes. That looks like Delacroix and Jackson to me. She probably left first, and then he set out after her when he came too. Besides, something about Merlin tells me he doesn't leave tracks unless he makes a point of it. I hope Jackson breaks her in half when he catches her, Zane said, but without much passion. I hope she doesn't break him, Ralph replied morosely. You saw what she did to his wand. Don't remind me, James muttered. I don't want to think about it. He began to walk forward, heading generally into the woods where they'd left Prechka, but with no real destination in mind. He had a terrible suspicion about where Merlin had gone, and he, James, was responsible for that. Twice Delacroix had called him her apprentice. She had influenced him somehow, and he had allowed it. He had played right into her plan, bringing the robe to her, she was right. She hadn't had to lift so much as a finger. True, things hadn't seemed to work out very well for her in the end, but that didn't mean much. A lone, rogue Merlin might be even more dangerous than a Merlin in league with people like the progressive element. At least they tried to operate under a guise of respectability. Merlin was from a different time, a more direct and deadly time. A nearly crushing weight of guilt and hopelessness pressed down on James as he plodded forward. Zane and Ralph followed quietly. Prechka was gone. James wasn't surprised, really. Her footprints were pressed into the dewy earth like dinosaur tracks. Without a word, the boys followed them, shivering and wet with dew. Mist filled the woods, reducing the world to a handful of black trees and dripping bushes. As they walked, the mist grew bright, absorbing the sun, and finally began to burn away. The forest awoke with birdsong and the scampering of unseen creatures in the brush. And then, surprisingly, there were distant voices calling for them. Hey, Zane said, stopping and listening. That's Ted and Sabrina. Ralph added. What are they doing out here? Hey! Over here! The three boys stopped and called to the two gremlins, who responded with whoops and cheers. A gigantic shape loomed out of the mist, moving almost delicately through the trees. Grow up! Zane laughed, running to meet the giant. Caw, you three look like inferior leftovers! Ted called down from Grop's shoulders. 
You spent the whole night out here? It's a long story, but yeah, Zane called up. Short version, Merlin's back. The voodoo queen's on the run, and Jackson was a good guy after all. He's after her as we speak. Results unknown. Is there room up there for three more, Grop? Ralph said, shivering. Only I think if I have to take one more step, I'll drop dead. Grop knelt, and the three boys clambered onto his back, crowding in with Sabrina and Ted. Before climbing up, James flexed the fingers and wrist of his right hand. There was no pain, and the bones of his arms seemed sturdy and straight. He stripped off the splint and jammed it carelessly into his pocket. How do you two get out? James asked Ted when he was crammed in next to him, holding handfuls of Grop's straw-like hair for support. I thought all of you were under house arrest. That was last night, Ted said simply. Things have gone pretty crazy at the school since then. Merlin showed up in the middle of the night, and let me tell you, that bloke knows how to make an entrance. He rode Prechka right into the courtyard and had her kick the front doors in, Sabrina explained. He obviously speaks giant, and he had her really wild. Then he climbs off and just puts her to sleep. She's still there, snoring next to the main entrance like the world's largest pile of laundry. We all woke up when we heard the noise of the doors being smashed in, Ted went on. After that, it was pandemonium. Students running all over the place in their pyjamas, trying to figure out what's going on. People were already pretty uptight, what with that Prescott guy still on the grounds, and nobody knowing what he's up to. And then, here's this bloke who's built like a boulder, and dressed like a cross between a druid and Father Christmas, stalking through the school, putting people to sleep with barely a look, clacking this enormous staff on the floor as he goes, loud enough to echo around the old place. Then he sees Peeves, and the weirdest thing happens. What? Zane asked hopefully. Did Peeves blow a raspberry at him, and get turned into a floor lamp or something? No, Sabrina said. Peeves joined him. He didn't seem to want to, but he did anyway. Merlin stopped when he saw Peeves, and then he spoke to him. None of us knew what he was saying. It was in some really weird, flowery language. We were worried that Peeves would do something stupid and get us all zapped with that creepy stuff. But then Peeves just grins, and it isn't like any of his normal grins. It's the kind of grin you see on a house elf when the master is just as prone to wallop the elf with a frying pan as look at it. A whole lot of teeth and not much humor, you know. And then Peeves swoops down next to the guy. They talk for a few seconds in low voices, and then Peeves moves off, slow enough for Merlin to follow. Merlin had a place in mind he wanted to go, I guess, and Peeves took him there. Peeves? Ralph said incredulously. I know, Ted replied. It ain't natural. That's when we knew we were dealing with somebody really scary. Most of us gremlins had already guessed he was Merlin, but that proved it. So where'd they go? James asked in a quiet voice. Sylvan Tower. Sabrina answered. At least that's what it used to be called. Nobody uses it for much anymore. Word came down that he was awaiting a parley with the Pendragon, whatever that means. I don't like the sound of that one bit, Zane said. Nobody does, Ted agreed. Apparently he thinks this Pendragon is the king or leader. It's some sort of medieval challenge or something. Anyway, McGonagall gathered the teachers together to go and deal with him, and that's when she realized that both Professor Jackson and Delacroix were gone. Then word comes that you've gone missing from the hospital wing, James. Next thing we know, McGonagall is sending us off to find the three of you. She was too busy to come herself, but she knew if anybody could sniff you out, we could. She seems to suspect you three might know something about this infernal mess, as she put it. Suspicious old girl, isn't she? As Ted finished speaking, Grop finally carried them out of the edge of the forest. The castle shone in the brilliant morning sunlight, its windows sparkling gaily, despite the turmoil within. The garage of the Alma Alarons was quiet, its door flaps closed and tied shut. James remembered the time difference between the Hogwarts and the Philadelphia side of the garage, and knew that those on that side would still be fast asleep. 
When Grawp turned the corner of the courtyard, Ted called for him to lower them to the ground. Great job, Grawp, Sabrina said warmly, patting the giant on his enormous shoulder. Go take a rest with Prechka, why don't you? Grawp grunted agreeably and lumbered over to the she-giant, who was indeed snoring loudly next to the steps into the castle. The massive wooden doors were hanging from one hinge each, smashed inwards and gaping. The entrance hall was eerily empty and silent. As they entered, Ralph gasped and grabbed James's arm, pointing. There, lying awkwardly on the floor near the door, were Mr. Recreant and Miss Saccharina. Both had their eyes open and were grinning unnaturally at the ceiling. Saccharina's arm was outstretched, sticking up and looking pasty white in the morning light. Are they dead? Ralph stammered. Ted lightly kicked Recreant's foot. Not lightly. They're still warm and they're breathing. Just really, really slowly. They were apparently down here in the hall when Merlin arrived. Looks like they tried to greet him and he just zapped him somehow. He put loads of students to sleep. But these two got some special freezing treatment. Anyway, we pulled them out of the way so people wouldn't trip over them. He shrugged and led them past the two prone figures into the halls beyond the staircases. Where's Sylvan Tower? James asked as they hurried through the corridors. It's the tallest tower in the old part of the castle. Narrowest, too, Ted answered, his voice uncharacteristically sombre. Not used for much any more except stargazing sometimes. It's too tall and treacherous to climb. Petra says that it was an important part of the castle a long, long time ago. Every castle had one, and it was considered neutral ground, sort of like a universal embassy or something. Meetings between warring nations and kingdoms were held there, with one king on one side and the enemy king on the other. Four advisers were allowed to accompany them, but the rest had to wait below. Occasionally, wars would be decided and ended right there, sometimes with one leader killing the other and throwing a body from the top of the tower for all to see. James felt his heart sink even lower. So who's up there with him, then? Ted shrugged. Dunno. We got sent off to find you three while McGonagall was still getting everybody together. I assumed she meant to meet him herself. She was looking pretty peaked about it, if you ask me. The five students walked through a wide, low arch, entering the oldest and least used section of the castle. After several curving, narrow corridors, they finally encountered people. Students were gathered in the corridors, lining the walls and talking in hushed voices. Finally, Ted led them into a round room with a very high ceiling, so high, in fact, that it was invisible in the dark, foggy heights of the tower. The floor was crowded with students, muttering in nervous anticipation. A rickety wooden staircase spiralled up the throat of the tower. After a cursory glance upwards, Ted began to climb the stairs. James, Zane, Ralph and Sabrina followed. McGonagall's up there with him? Ralph asked. How, uh, good is she? She's the headmistress. Sabrina answered seriously. She's good. I hope so, James said quietly. They climbed the rest of the way in silence. It took quite a long time, and James was feeling remarkably tired and achy by the time he reached the top. Ralph was wheezing behind him, pulling himself up with both hands on the thick banister. Finally, however, the stairs opened onto a room that filled the top of the tower. It was low, thick with heavy rafters and dust, and centuries of owl and pigeon droppings. Narrow windows marched around the perimeter of the room, revealing slices of morning sunlight. There were several people present, although none of them appeared to be the headmistress or Merlin. James, a thick voice said, and a hand fell on his shoulder. What are you doing here? This is no place for you, I'm afraid. He was summoned, Professor Slughorn, Sabrina said, following the others into the room. The headmistress herself asked us to bring him, as well as Ralph and Zane. They ought to go up right away. Up? Ralph wheezed. There's more? This isn't the top? Ah, Mr. Deedle, 
Slughorn said, spying Ralph. Yes, I'm afraid there is, but only a bit more. It is directly above us. Are you quite sure about this, Miss Hildegard? This is hardly the place for children. James thought Slughorn seemed a bit ruffled that he, Ralph, and Zane might be expected to go up, while Slughorn himself was not. You were in the room when the headmistress sent us to find him, Professor, Ted said, allowing a hint of sternness to creep into his voice. Mm, so I was, Slughorn acknowledged, as if the fact proved little. Let them proceed, Horace, Professor Flitwick said from a bench near the window. If they're summoned, they're summoned. They're hardly any safer with us here, if that savage prevails. Slughorn stared at James, and then, with an apparent force of will, softened his expression. He turned to Ralph and clapped him stiffly on the shoulder. Represent us well, Mr. Deedle. Ted motioned towards a short stone staircase that protruded through the wooden floor and up to a trap door in the ceiling. James, Ralph, and Zane approached and climbed the worn steps slowly. The trap door wasn't locked. James pushed it open and sunlight poured in, blinding him momentarily as he climbed onto the surface above. It was almost exactly the same size and shape as the grotto keep, made almost entirely of stone but for the wooden floor in the centre from which the trapdoor opened. Marble pillars surrounded the space, but there was no roof. The morning sunlight filled the top of the tower, dazzling on the white marble and stone terraces. Merlin sat only a few feet away, facing the three boys as they emerged into the soft wind and warm sunlight. His face was stony and immobile, only his eyes moving to watch them. Mr. Potter, the headmistress's voice rang out in the stillness. Mr. Walker and Mr. Deedle, thank you for joining us. Please find your places on my left. We will come to your tale shortly. James turned as Zane lowered the trap door closed. McGonagall was seated behind them, across from Merlin. She was dressed in a flame-red robe, both far graver and more ostentatious than James had ever seen her wear. It made her look both younger and dreadful, like a sort of tyrant queen. The chairs that she and Merlin sat upon were embedded in the stone of the lowest terrace, so that both looked at each other across the wooden floor in the centre. On McGonagall's left, arranged along the rim of the highest terrace, were four more carven seats, although they were much less ornate. Seated on them were Neville Longbottom, Professor Franklin, and Harry Potter. Dad! James breathed, a smile of relief and joy surfacing on his face. He ran up the steps towards his father. James, Harry said quietly, his face grim. I was told you'd gone missing. You had us very worried. I would have gone after the three of you myself, except that we received word you'd been found only moments after I arrived. How did you find out? Ralph asked, furrowing his brow. Harry allowed a crooked smile and held up a Weasley rubber duck. On the bottom, in Ted's handwriting, was scrawled, Found them. Be there in a jiffy. This is Petra Morganston's? But she said they got the idea from you three. Very handy. I'm sorry I took the map and your cloak, Dad, James said in a rush. I know I shouldn't have. I really made a mess of things. Merlin's back, and it's all my fault. Harry darted his eyes meaningfully at the chairs in the centre of the space. Don't be too hard on yourself, my boy. We'll have loads of time to discuss this later. For now, I think we have other matters to attend to. James turned back towards the headmistress and Merlin. He'd nearly forgotten about them in the excitement and relief of seeing his dad. Sure, sorry. The three boys remained standing along the top terrace, next to Harry, Neville and Franklin. James noticed for the first time that the opposite side of the terrace was occupied by a surprising number of birds and creatures all of which were staring hard at Merlin. There were owls and pigeons, ravens and even a few falcons, all arranged on the ledge of the railing, on the four carved seats and on the floor of the top two terraces. Sitting incongruously among them, also staring at the bearded man, 
were a variety of creatures James recognised as house animals. Frogs and rats jostled slightly among the birds. Even Zane's cat, Thumbs, was there, sitting near the front, his black and white nose twitching slightly. "'You were seeing, Professor Longbottom,' McGonagall said, her gaze still locked on the huge, unmoving form of Merlin. Neville stirred and stood. "'I simply wish to register my objection to your speaking to this... this intruder, who has violently entered this school with who knows what nefarious purpose in mind, in a language that we, your long-time associates and friends, cannot understand or follow. Between that and your, I must admit, surprising attire, well, surely you must know how this looks to us?' "'I apologise, Mr. Longbottom, and the rest of you,' McGonagall said, finally looking away from Merlin and meeting the eyes of those gathered to her left. "'I had forgotten myself. This gentleman comes from a time of formality and ritual. I am meeting him as he expects to be met, in the ceremonial robe of my station. I am afraid that when he first found us, he assumed that all of us, including myself and the staff, were peasants who had somehow managed to overrun the castle. It was extremely unbecoming in his time for the Pendragon to appear in the sort of colourless sacks that he mistook our robes for. As for the language... I can speak in the language of your servants if you wish it, Madame Pendragon, Merlin interrupted in his low, carrying voice. Although why you deign to speak to them as equals when they should be stropped for such impertinence, I cannot guess. McGonagall sighed and closed her eyes. James had the sense that these sorts of misunderstandings had been going on for some time. These are my associates, not my underlings, sir. This is a different time, as I fear I must keep reminding you. I am not the Pendragon of a kingdom. I am Pendragon only of a tiny portion of land, all of which is within sight of this tower. But yes, please do speak, so that all of us may understand. As you wish, madam, Merlin answered. I assume your counsel is fully present, then. It is. James Porter, Ralph Deedle, Zane Walker, the headmistress said, looking at each boy in turn. This man claims to be Merlinus Ambrosius, returned to the world of men from an age of nothingness by the combined arrangement of his ghostly apprentice and five other individuals. What can you tell us of this tale? James answered, explaining as well and honestly as he could how the three Merlin relics came to be combined in the island of the Grotto Keep. He was careful to proclaim, to his own shame, how Professor Jackson had meant to protect the robe and keep it from the grotto, foiling Madame Delacroix's plan, but that James had inadvertently ruined his intentions. "'It was my fault,' he explained miserably. "'Ralph and Zane only helped because I talked them into it. I wanted to—' He paused and swallowed. "'I wanted to save the day, I guess. But I ruined everything. I'm sorry.' McGonagall's face was calm but unreadable as James finished. He hung his head, but a moment later he felt his dad's hand on his shoulder, warm and heavy. He sighed. Merlin let his gaze sweep over the gathering, on and near the benches. Then he slowly filled his chest. Ostrom Maddox's plan abused the intentions of many, I see, some good and some bad. I assume, however, that after this boy's testimony there is no doubt about my identity. Allow me to repeat, then. I have been, it seems, the subject of a very dire campaign of lies and slander. It has apparently become accepted law that I was, in my own time, a capricious and dishonorable creature, a man of selfish alliances and endless guile. This is no truer than the litany of virtues embroidered into the history of this Voldemort villain you have described to me. I was no more evil than a storm is evil. I killed only when there was no hope of repentance or slavery. 
I collected dues only from those who deserved to pay, and even then a third of my purse went to the poor and the church. I am no horror to be sought after by the pathetic creatures whom you gratuitously call evil, whose own wickedness is hardly a candle to the torches of iniquity I have observed in my own time. I have no doubt you believe that, McGonagall stated, but surely you know that the legends of the dark heart of the world's most powerful wizard began even before you stepped outside of your own time. While you still walked the earth, many lived in fear of you. Only those whose wickedness or ignorance lent them to that error, Merlin rumbled, and even in their case I would more likely have approached them with the rod instead of the sword. That may be so, Melinus, but you yourself know that you dabbled in arts that, while technically allowed in your time, were not very allowed. You exposed yourself to currents of magic that separated you from the rest of humanity, currents that were, in fact, more than most human beings could touch and remain sane. You were changed by that dabbling, perhaps even warped by it. Even you must have doubted your own judgment at times. The ambiguous morality of Merlinus Ambrosius was well known, as was his cavalier attitude towards the lives of the non-magic. It was legitimately suspected that you might side with those who wished the destruction and subjugation of the Muggle realm. I cannot speak for your own time, but in ours those who wish war upon the Muggle world are our sworn enemies. Your allegiance must be decided before we can allow you to leave these halls. You dare to challenge the nobility of such as me? Merlin asked, his voice smooth and calm, and to suggest that I could not merely wipe you all from the earth with a sweep of my arm if I so wished? I dare to do both, and for good reason, McGonagall said firmly. You were of questionable motive in your own time, as even the best historians agree. You remain so in this time, and in regard to your powers, they may be formidable. But even in your time, the current from which you drew your power was waning as the earth was tamed. Don't pretend that that wasn't your greatest reason for stepping out of time. You hoped to return to an age when the current of the earth was restored, when your power would once again be uninterrupted and complete. But this is not that time. The current is more parsed than ever. Your power may still be great, and you might indeed defeat those gathered here, but you are by no means unstoppable. Choose carefully with whom you ally in this age, Merlinus. Merlin's face remained as impassive as stone as he stared at the headmistress. I have truly returned to a time of darkness if the Pendragon believes that a mere threat of doom might sway the convictions of an honourable wizard. But I see that you are honest in your motive, even if your methods are mean. I have never forsworn allegiance to any whose hearts were turned hard against the non magic I work to maintain the balance between the magical and muggle worlds, to keep the scales from tipping one towards the other, though none would have guessed my true aims. I serviced all, but always with that goal in my heart. Fairness is a myth among a fallen humankind, but equality of struggle can be maintained even if it is only a pale ghost of true fairness. You speak well, Melinus, the headmistress said, but you have not stated your purpose plainly. Are you here to overthrow us or to work alongside us? For the first time, Merlin's face showed emotion. He closed his eyes and pressed his lips together. His beard glistened with what James assumed was some sort of oil. Occasionally the scent of it, wild and spicy, wafted in the breeze of the tower's top. 
Ostra Maddox deserved the fate I dealt him, and perhaps a hundredfold for returning me to this time. He opened his eyes again and looked around at the assembly. I approach a castle of the most solid construction I've ever witnessed, filled with glittering eyes of hardened sunlight, and yet I find no sentry, no vanguard, not so much as a servant to fill my bath or demand protocol. You meet me with no recognition of my status and no blessing upon my head, wearing the clothes of jesters and field boys, and yet you are surrounded by tables of plenty on plates as round and smooth as the planets. The Pendragon herself is not revered or waited upon, but dresses like her minions in shapeless bags of tenting, and then, above all, my honour and allegiance is challenged when I myself only refrain from demanding tribute out of respect for a foreign age. Truly, my mission has become as dust. There is no age ripe for me. Selfish, Ostromadox may have been, McGonagall agreed, leaning slightly forward. But it may not be a mistake that you are returned to this time, Melinus. It was thought that you would lead the rebellion against the Muggle world. But if your claims are true, then you may have been brought here by an even greater providence, so that you might aid us in preventing just such a tragedy. Even now, the powers of chaos have set in motion events that will lead to that end. This very day, a man resides among us, a muggle man. He has been led here by agents of disorder, and he has bypassed our greatest defences using a form of unmagic called technology. He has access to an engine called the Press, by which he can make known the secrets of the magical world to the rest of humanity. It is only by maintaining that secret for the past millennium that the balance of powers has existed. If this man and his secret plotters succeed, they will abuse the recombination of the magical and muggle world. They will plot divisions, seek power, and eventually they will spawn a war. You more than anyone know what the result of such a scheme would be. You must help us. Those who plot chaos are expecting you. Let them eat the fire they intended to turn upon the world, Merlinus. Aid us. Merlin sat perfectly still for almost a minute, his beard glistening in the sun. The animals fidgeted slightly, noses twitching and feathers ruffling. Finally, Merlin stood and it was like watching a mountain rise from its foundation. He moved with slow, massive grace until he was fully erect, his staff held upright next to him, his piercing blue eyes settling on the headmistress. "'You are correct, madam,' Merlin said, his voice flat and undeniable. "'It was my selfish aim to leave my own age,' only to find a time when my power would be restored in fullness. Arrogance is my iniquity, and it has undone me. I have returned now only to find my power cut to pieces, far more than it was in my own time. I beg your forgiveness as a man of honour, but I am both unable and unwilling to rise to the post you have described for me. This is no longer my world. Perhaps you will prevail without me. Perhaps not. I cannot see any future in this time, apart from knowing that the sun will arise tomorrow and travel across the heavens as it has done for the thousand years of my absence. Whether it shines down on war or peace, truth or lies, I know not, but I do know this. It will shine upon a world that knows me not, nor I it. I take my leave of you now, madam. I bid all of you fare thee well. Merlin raised his arms, holding his staff aloft. As one, the birds on the railings and benches launched from their perches. There was a thunderous sound as hundreds of wings beat the air. 
when the mass of birds broke apart, streaming from the top of the tower in all directions, there was no sign of Merlin. James stared hard at the space where the great wizard had been standing. It was over. There was nothing left. Harry turned James around and folded him into his arms. It's all right, son, he said. James didn't believe anything was all right, but he was glad for the words anyway. He hugged his dad back. I wonder if he's really gone for good, Neville mused out loud. I've no doubt he means for us to believe that, the headmistress replied, arising from her chair on the tower platform. But the fact of the matter is that he has nowhere to go. His servant, Ostromadox, has apparently been banished to the netherworld. Thus, Merlinus has no apprentice in this age to arrange for his reappearance if he should choose to step out of time again. I fear we must assume that Merlinus is with us, for better or worse. Mr. Potter, can he be tracked? Harry thought for a moment. Mm, difficult, but not impossible. He will probably retreat to the protection of the woodlands where his power is strongest. No doubt he has many methods of surviving and hiding there, but a wizard of such abilities will always leave a detectable magical wake. I believe we can locate him, given a team of auras and enough time. The question is, what do we do with him when we find him? We must secure his intent, Franklin said somberly, slowly approaching the chair Merlin had occupied. Merlinus is a creature of mystery and confusion. Despite his words, I sense that he himself does not trust his own allegiances. Things were much clearer in his time. Did you sense it as well? He is unsure in this age. He doesn't know who to trust, whose aims most reflect his own. This is made worse by the fact that, as you pointed out, headmistress, Merlin's own morality is ambiguous at best. He retreats now in order to examine his own heart as much as to study the factions of this age. Do you really believe that, Professor? Harry asked. Franklin had produced the same brass device he'd used to examine James's broken arm on the Quidditch pitch. He was peering through it, studying the chair Merlin had occupied. He nodded slowly. I do. Merlin admitted to us that his pride is his greatest weakness. He cannot allow us to see his own lack of surety, but there is no doubt of it. He doesn't know where he stands in this age because he doesn't know where he stands in his own heart, and only now does he realize it. That doubt won't last forever, though, Neville said, stepping down the terraces towards the wooden floor. We can hardly sit back and wait until he decides whose side to join. His power may be diminished, but I'd wager he is still unmatched by any single wizard alive today. We have to assume he is with our enemies until he determines he is our ally. Harry was shaking his head. I agree that he may be unsure in this time, but I don't think he's evil or at least not willfully evil. What do you mean? Zane interjected. He's been sought after by the most evil wizards for the past thousand years or so, hasn't he? Not the most evil wizards, McGonagall said pointedly. That's true, Harry agreed. Only those who were confused or warped enough to believe their aims were good somehow. Those who knew their hearts were evil whose eyes were open to their own wickedness and embraced it, they never sought him, at least as far as we know. Let us repair to our offices for now, McGonagall said, sighing. Our day has barely begun, and we already have far more to manage than we rightly know how. Besides, I wish to alleviate myself of this unbearable costume as soon as possible. Franklin heaved the trapdoor open, and the group began to file down the steps. The animals that had gathered on the tower platform threaded down as well, scampering and hopping around the group's feet. Slughorn and the rest of the professors gathered below greeted them with worried faces and a flurry of questions. Ignoring them, James followed his dad down the spiral steps towards the far, distant floor. "'How do you get here so fast, Dad?' he asked. "'Merlin didn't get here until the middle of the night. How'd McGonagall get hold of you so quickly?' It wasn't the headmistress that brought me here, James. 
Harry replied, glancing over his shoulder at his son. It was your letter. Nobby delivered it this morning, and I came as soon as I read it. The headmistress was as surprised as anyone when I showed up in her office fireplace. But Zacharina said you were off on some special assignment and weren't to be bothered. Harry laughed humorously. It was that detail in your letter that proved I needed to get here right away, James. I'm doing nothing but desk work this week. If Sacharina says I'm on assignment, that's just because she wants to make sure I'm not here. Yeah, James nodded. The portrait of Snape told us Sacharina and Recreant are both no good. They're in on all this progressive element stuff. Harry stopped on the stairs, turning back to James, Ralph and Zane. Be careful who you mention that to, he said, lowering his voice. The ministry is riddled with people like Recreant and Sacharina these days, although for most of them it's just a way to appear a little daring and trendy. Hermione does what she can to fight the propaganda and weed out the instigators, but it's complicated. Recreant is only a tool, but Sacharina is dangerous. I think she's the mastermind behind the return of Merlin, in fact. What? James said, dropping his voice to match his dad's. That can't be. It was Madame Delacroix in the grotto last night. Yeah, Saccharina didn't even arrive until yesterday evening, Zane added. Harry's expression was grave. Saccharina isn't the kind of person to get her hands dirty with any of the actual work. She needed Delacroix for that, and Delacroix herself couldn't have got the Merlin throne out of the ministry without Saccharina on the inside helping her. Recreant and Saccharina are only here now because they claim to be escorting an expert in muggle magical relations to deal with this Prescott person. There is no such expert. They were expecting to produce Merlin himself and pass him off as that expert. So they never intended to stop Prescott from revealing the magical world to the muggle press, Ralph said, his face white. Saccharina and Merlin were supposed to work together to make sure Prescott got his story out, weren't they? Harry nodded. That's what I think. This is all no coincidence. It's exactly the sort of thing people like Saccharina have been hoping for all along. The recombination of the muggle and magical world is essential to their final plan for all-out war. But Merlin turned out to be on nobody's side but his own after all, James said. Does that ruin their plan? I don't know, Harry sighed. Things have been put in motion that will be very hard to stop now. Saccharina may no longer need Merlin for this part of the plan. Zane asked, So how are you planning to stop Prescott? Stop him? I'm not even supposed to be here, remember? Saccharina is in charge. But she's evil. James exclaimed. You can't just let her run the show. We won't, James, Harry said, putting a hand on James's shoulder, but hardening his voice. But we have to be very careful. Saccharina has a lot of influence in the ministry. I can't just defy her. She's hoping that I'll do something rash, something she can use against me. She wants the aura department shut down entirely. Keeping that from happening is of utmost importance, even more so than protecting the secrecy of the magical world. So Saccharina and Delacroix win, James said, looking his dad in the eye. In the short run, perhaps. But don't lose hope, any of you. Neville, the headmistress and I, have a few tricks up our sleeves. We will survive the day, no matter what happens with Prescott. The only question now is who led him here in the first place. Well, it would have been Saccharina, wouldn't it? Zane suggested. No, couldn't be, James sighed. She signed the vow of secrecy, just like every other witch and wizard. If she had tried to tell Prescott anything, even through a letter, the vow would have stopped her somehow. Besides, she wouldn't know anything about how a game deck worked, or how it could be used to lead somebody to Hogwarts. Voices and footsteps echoed from the spiral of stairs above them. The headmistress and the professors were descending behind them. Harry gestured for the boys to follow him the rest of the way down. "'That's the only part of this that really baffles me,' Harry said as he tromped down the stairs. "'Every witch and wizard is bound by the vow of secrecy. 
Any muggle parent of a student is bound by their own contract of non-disclosure. That means no one who knows about the magical world would be capable of spreading the secret. And yet someone obviously did. I intend to find out who. By the time they neared the last curve of the staircase, the headmistress, Neville, and the rest of the professors had caught up to them. McGonagall called down to the students who were waiting below. Ladies and gentlemen, as you can see, we are all returning to you all and well. She stopped and regarded the assembly from above. In order to dispel rumours and quell any fears, I intend to be quite forthright about what has been and still is occurring here today. Two men have found their ways rather unexpectedly into these halls over the course of the last two days. The first is still here. His name is Martin Prescott, and he is a muggle. His intentions are quite questionable, but I can assure you that we, your staff, are prepared to— Thank you, Minerva, a high, ringing voice interrupted. I have, in fact, already briefed the students on today's events. I appreciate your thoroughness, however. Do join us, won't you? Zacharina and Recreant stepped out of the crowd of students and moved to the foot of the staircase. Zacharina's smile was large and glinting in the dusty light of the tower floor. McGonagall stared down at her for a long moment and then turned to address the students again. In that case, I expect you all have classes to attend to. Your professors shall kindly lead you to your classrooms. Let us make what we can with the rest of the day, shall we? Do you really believe it is necessary for classes to go forward today, Minerva? Zacharina said when the headmistress and the rest of the troop reached the bottom of the stairs. This is rather an unusual day. Unusual days are the best days for classes, Miss Zacharina, McGonagall replied, stepping past the woman. Reminds everyone why we are here in the first place, if you'll excuse me. Harry. Mr. Recreant said, smiling a bit too enthusiastically. I admit Brenda and I hadn't expected to see you here today. Family occasion, is it? He turned his grin on James and then flashed it over Ralph and Zane as well. Harry smiled stiffly. I'm equally surprised to see the two of you here. I didn't see any paperwork about a return trip to meet with the Almoralerons. And I've been doing an awful lot of paperwork, as you know. Zacharina took Harry's arm, and he allowed her to lead him out of the tower, following the last of the students. Very unexpected, this is, she said in a confidential tone of voice. Dreadful situation. Surely Minerva told you about it. Martin Prescott, a muggle reporter, right here on the grounds. Still... The Ministry feels it is inevitable, really. Does it? Harry said, stopping near the door and facing Sacharina. So loquacious Knapp knows about this? Um, the Minister is aware of the general direction events have been heading, Recreant interjected. We hadn't chosen to bother him with the particulars per se. So he doesn't, in fact, know you are here, Harry said dropping his thin smile. Harry, Zacharina said silkily, the fact is that this sort of scenario is exactly the purview of the Department of Ambassadorial Relations. You, of course, do not require the signature of the minister for every little manoeuvre of the Aura Department, nor do we require his approval when dealing with the execution of our daily duties. Do you intend to stay for the day? I believe so, Brenda, Harry answered calmly. I'm curious to see what the Department of Ambassadorial Relations does to execute its daily duties in such a situation. Besides, surely you'd agree that an outside, objective witness might prove helpful in case of any inquiries. Suit yourself, Mr. Potter, Zacharina said, her smile snapping shut like a jewellery box. It will be all over by four o'clock this afternoon. Prescott's crew will arrive, and they will get their tour. 
There is hardly any way to prevent it, after all, considering Mr. Prescott's very ingenious fail-safes. You may accompany us, but please do not attempt to interfere. It would not go well for you, but I am sure I do not need to tell you that, do I? Did you have a nice snooze down there by the front doors? Zane said lightly as Sakarina turned away. She stopped and then very slowly turned back towards Zane. Whatever could you mean, young man? she asked. Harry was looking at Zane with a mixture of curiosity and amusement. Zane went on. You two were both down there to meet Merlin when he made his grand entrance last night, but he was apparently looking for bigger fish than you, wasn't he? He gave you both the old evil eye and froze you on the spot. Come on, that's gotta hurt. Zacharina's smile eased back onto her face, as if it was the default expression at times when her brain was working hard on something else. Her eyes moved back to Harry. I simply don't know what you've been filling these poor children's heads with, Mr. Potter, but it really doesn't do for ministry officials to tell such stories. Merlin, of all things! She shook her head vaguely, then turned and walked through the archway with Mr. Recreant following nervously. You sure have a way with people, Zane, Harry said, grinning and ruffling the boy's hair. My dad says it's a gift, Zane agreed. Mom says it's a curse. Who can tell? It looked like Miss Sacharina was more confused than angry, Ralph mused as they walked through the archway, leaving the Sylvan Tower. Could be, Harry replied. It might be that everyone Merlin put to sleep forgot about him as well. She may have no recollection of his coming last night. So she still expects him to show up when she takes Prescott and his crew on the Grand Tour? Perhaps, although it won't trip her up for long when he doesn't show. Merlin's probably halfway across the Forbidden Forest by now, getting directions from the tree sprites now that they're apparently awakened. James stopped in the middle of the corridor. A few paces later, Harry stopped as well and turned to look back at his son. James's face was wide-eyed and thoughtful. Suddenly, he blinked and looked at his dad. I need to go to the Forbidden Forest, he said. It's not too late, Dad. Will you come with me? Zane, Ralph, you too. Harry didn't ask his son any questions. He studied James's face for several seconds and then glanced down at Zane and Ralph. What do you two think? You feel like doing a bunk? James walked purposefully into the forest, followed at a short distance by Harry, Zane and Ralph. He threaded through the smaller trees at the perimeter, heading into the deeper heart of the forest, where the trees were huge and ancient, and the sun was all but blocked out by rafters of dense foliage. For several minutes the foursome walked in silence, and then, finally, James stopped. He turned on the spot, looking up into the shushing leaves and gently creaking branches. There were no other sounds. Harry, Zane, and Ralph stood twenty feet away, watching quietly. James closed his eyes for a moment, thinking, and then opened them again and spoke. I, I know a lot of you aren't awake, he began, looking up into the looming heights of the trees. And I know that some of you who are awake aren't on our side. But the ones who are will hear me, and I hope you'll help. Merlin is out there somewhere. He may be far, far away by now, but even so, I think you know where he is. He talks to you, and I bet you talk to him too. I know tree sprites can talk, because we've already met one of you. I have a message for Merlin. James stopped and took another deep breath, not entirely sure what he meant to say. It had simply occurred to him that he should try. He had been used by Delacroix to help bring Merlin into the world, despite the best efforts of those who'd wished to prevent it. The knowledge that he had allowed himself to be manipulated was horrible to him. All this time he had believed he was doing good, saving the world from evil, walking in the steps of his hero father. And yet his best intentions had been warped against him, against the world he'd hoped to protect. He had tried to do it alone, like his dad had done, but he had failed. 
He had aided evil, and now evil expected him to give up. James didn't intend to give up, though. Maybe now he could try to help in a different way. It was probably a long shot, probably utterly hopeless, but he had to try. Maybe this was his way, after all. Merlin, James said uncertainly, you said that Ostra Maddox made a mistake in bringing you to our time. You said he was selfish, that he just wanted to get out of the duty he swore to you. But Headmistress McGonagall thinks that you're wrong. She thinks that this is the very time you were meant to return to, because this world needs your help to stop a war that might destroy us all. Well, I know I'm just a kid, but I think you're both wrong. James glanced back at his dad. Harry gave a small shrug and nodded. I listened to everything you said and what everybody said after you left. And I think you were brought to this time because you need something. You don't know for sure if you've really ever done right or wrong. You don't know if you've controlled your powers or if they controlled you. I think the truth is that the world does need you now, but that you need this world too. This is your chance, maybe your last chance, to prove that you are a good wizard after all. People have wondered for centuries whether you were good or bad, but who cares what the rest of history says about you? If you know in your own heart that you did the right thing when it really mattered, then it doesn't matter what anybody else says. I don't say this because I understand it myself yet, but at least I'm trying to learn it. You're in this time no matter what, Merlin. Whoever brought you here means for you to rescue the world, but... I think you're also here to be rescued from yourself. James finished and sighed. He looked up, craning his neck and squinting, searching the trees for some sign that his message had been heard and that it might be delivered. The leaves simply continued to skirl and shush in the breeze. The branches creaked quietly to themselves. After a minute, James stuffed his hands into his pockets and walked disconsolately back to his dad, Ralph, and Zane. Zane clapped James on the shoulder as they turned to leave. That was the hookiest pile of salami I've ever heard, he said jovially. But I think you meant it. I liked it, even if it never does get to Merlin's ears. Did you come up with that all by yourself? Ralph asked. James shrugged and smiled sheepishly. Harry didn't say anything as they walked, but he put his arm around James's shoulders and kept it there the whole way back. James thought it meant his dad approved, even if it wasn't the way he himself would have done it. And then James realised with some contentment that his dad approved because it wasn't the way he would have done it. James smiled and enjoyed that moment of quiet revelation. Maybe learning this truth the sort of truth that one has to learn on his own, despite all the people who had tried to teach it with mere words, was worth everything that had happened so far. He only hoped that it was worth more than what might still be to come. Chapter 19 Secrets Unveiled Harry joined James, Zane and Ralph for a very late breakfast in the house-elf kitchens below the Great Hall. James noticed that the house-elf operating the enormous stove bellows was the grumpy house-elf who had told the three boys they were on probation. He eyed them with unguarded suspicion, but didn't say anything. They crowded at a tiny table beneath an even tinier window, and ate plates of kippers and toast, and drank pumpkin juice and black tea. Finally, Harry suggested that the boys take a break and get cleaned up, they were still dressed in the clothes they had worn during the failed broomstick caper of the day before, and they were all decidedly grubby from their night in the forest. James was weary to the bone as well, and determined that he would collapse on his bed for at least ten minutes, school crisis or not. On the way to the common room, James decided to take a detour to the hospital wing to collect his backpack. Philia Goyle and Murdoch were no longer guarding the doors, of course, but James was surprised to see Hagrid crammed onto one of the benches nearby, flipping through a thick magazine called Beasts and Boondocks. 
He glanced up, closing the magazine. James, good to see you, he said warmly, apparently trying to keep his voice quiet. Heard you was back safe and sound. Seen your father then, I wager. Yeah, just left him, James answered, peeking into the cracked doors of the hospital wing. What are you doing here, Hagrid? Well, it's obvious, isn't it? I'm keeping watch, I am. Nobody in, nobody out, lest it's by permission of the headmistress. Needs his rest and recuperation after all he's been through. Who? James asked, suddenly interested. He peered more closely into the crack between the doors. There was a shape lying still on one of the beds, but James couldn't make out any features. Why, Professor Jackson, of course, Hagrid said, standing and joining James by the doors. He peeked over James's head with one beady black eye. And you heard? Showed up in the courtyard half an hour ago, looking quite a fright, he whispered. Caused no end of commotion when the students out there caught sight of him. We brought him in here straight away, and I was given the post to keep an eye on the doors while Madame Curio tended to him. James looked up at Hagrid. He's injured? That's what we thought at first, Hagrid said, stepping back. But Madame Curio says he's all right. Set for a few broken ribs, some burns on his arms, a nasty bruise on the skull, and about a million cuts and scratches. Been in a duel, she says, and a long one at that. Happened during the night out in the forest. That's all we could get out of him before he conked out. A duel? James repeated, knitting his brow. But Delacroix broke his wand. Did she? Hagrid said, impressed. No, why she go and do a thing like that, then? She was the one he was dueling against, Hagrid, James said tiredly. He and she... Look, I'll explain later, but I saw her break his wand in two pieces. I saw the bits. He left them behind. Well, Hagrid said, resuming his seat and producing a long, pained groan from the bench. He's American, you know. They like to carry more than one wand around. Comes from all that old Wild West lore and all. They sticks them in their boots and up their sleeves and hide them in their canes and such. Everybody knows that, don't they? James peered into the crack of the hospital doors again, but he still couldn't make anything of the shape on the mattress. Sorry, Professor, he said quietly, but I hope you gave her royal hell. What's that, James? Hagrid said, glancing up. I just came for my backpack, James answered quickly. I left it in there last night. "'I don't suppose you might want to come back later for it, would you?' Hagrid asked earnestly. "'Only I've got my orders here. Nobody in nor out. "'The headmistress thinks that whoever attacked Jackson might come looking for him. "'Can't rule out it was that crazy nutter pretending to be Merlin.' "'It was Delacroix, Hagrid. But yeah, I can come back later. Good work.' "'Hagrid nodded and then flopped his magazine open onto his lap again. James turned and headed back the way he'd come. The Gryffindor common room was empty. The fire in the grate had burned down to red embers, but it had warmed up enough outside that it wasn't necessary anyway. In fact, as James headed up the stairs to the sleeping quarters, he felt a gust of cool, fresh air push past him. Someone had apparently left a window open upstairs. He was just wondering if he should shut it or not, when he topped the landing and saw Merlin reclined comfortably on his bed. "'Here is my little counsellor after all,' Merlin said, looking up and lowering James's technomancy textbook. James glanced at the open window next to his bed, then back to Merlin. "'You?' he said, his mind boggling slightly. "'Did you?' he pointed uncertainly at the window. "'Did I fly in through it?' Merlin said, laying the book aside almost reverently, lofted upon the wings of my sky-born brethren. What do you think, James Potter? James closed his mouth, realizing that this was a kind of test. He pushed his first thoughts aside and looked around. No, he answered. No, actually, I think you just opened the window because you like the air. I like the sense of the air, especially this time of year the great wizard replied, looking towards the open window. 
The essence of growth and life comes from the earth now, filling the sky. Even the non-magic feel it. They say that love is in the air in springtime. It's close enough to the truth not to matter, but it isn't love of a man and a woman. It is the love of dirt for root and leaf for sunlight, and, yes, wing for air. But you wanted me to believe that you came in through the window, didn't you? James said, feeling carefully emboldened. Merlin smiled slightly and studied James. Nine-tenths of magic happens in the mind, James Potter. The greatest trick of all is to know what your audience expects to see and making sure they do. James approached another bed and sat on it. Is this what you came to talk about? Or are you here because you got my message? I have been privy to many things since you last saw me, the wizard answered. I have moved in and out, to and fro. I have conversed with many old friends, reacquainted myself with the earth and the beasts in the air. I have met very strange things in the forest, articles of this age, and learned much of the way the world is in this time. I have studied you yourself and your people. James smiled slowly, realizing something. You never left us. You vanished from the top of the tower. Let us think you flew off with the birds, but you didn't go anywhere, did you? You just turned invisible. You have rather a talent for looking beyond the flat of the mirror, James Potter, Merlin said, his voice low and his face impassive. But I will admit that I did hear everything your professors Franklin and Longbottom and the Pendragon and, yes, your father said about me. I was amused and angered that they presumed to know me so, and yet I am no slave to arrogance. I asked myself if what they supposed was true. I left then, and I visited my old lands. I went in and out, to and fro. I studied my own deep soul as Franklin supposed I should, and I found there was a shadow of truth in their words. A shadow... Merlin paused for a long moment. James decided not to say anything, but simply watched the wizard. His face remained utterly immobile, but his eyes were distant. After no less than two minutes, Merlin spoke again. But a shadow was not enough to bring me back to the mire of double-speak and confused loyalties that pass for battle lines in this benighted age. I was far off exploring, seeking space and land and uninterrupted earth, already sinking into the deep language of the wind and the rain, when there was a new note in the Song of the Trees. Your message, James Potter. James was amazed to see that there was finally emotion on the enormous man's face. He looked at James nakedly, his eyes suddenly wet. James felt shame for the man's raw expression of anguish. He even felt a little guilty for his own words, words that had apparently, shockingly, pierced this enormous man's hidden heart. Then, as if the anguish had never been there, the massive, stony face composed itself. It was not a matter of masking the emotion, James realized. He was simply witnessing the workings of emotion in a man whose culture was utterly alien to him, where the heart was so close to the surface that deep emotion could pass over the face shamelessly and completely, like a cloud obscuring the sun but for a moment. Thus, James Potter, the wizard said, standing slowly so that he seemed to fill the room, I return. I am at your service. My soul does indeed require this. I have learned much of this world during my travels this day, and I love little of it. But there is a present evil, even though it is masked with duplicity and etiquette. Perhaps defeating that evil is secondary even to stripping that evil of its facade of respectability. James grinned and jumped up as well, not sure whether to shake Merlin's hand, hug him, or bow. He settled for pumping his fist once in the air and proclaiming, Yes! Uh, 
thank you, Merlin. Uh, Merlinus, Mr. Ambrosius. The wizard simply smiled, his ice-blue eyes twinkling. So, James said, what do we do? I mean, we only have a few hours before Prescott and his crew gather to film the school and everything. I guess I have to explain all that to you. Cor, this is going to take a while. I am Merlin, James Potter, the wizard said, sighing. I have already learned as much as I need to know about this world and how it works. You'd be quite surprised, methinks, to learn how much the trees know of your culture. Mr. Prescott is not your problem. We simply need a council of allies to aid us. All right, James said, plopping back onto the bed. What sort of allies do we need? Merlin's eyes narrowed. We require heroes of wit and cleverness, unafraid to foil convention in order to defend a higher allegiance. Battle skills matter not. What we need at this moment, James Potter, are scoundrels with honour. James nodded succinctly. I know just the group. Scoundrels with honour. Got it. Then let us have at it, my young counsellor. Merlin said, smiling a little frighteningly. Lead on! So, James said as he led Merlin down out of the portrait hole, do you think we'll win? Mr. Potter, Merlin said breezily, stepping out onto the landing and placing his fists on his hips. You won the moment I decided to join you. Is that the famous Merlin pride talking? James asked tentatively. Like I said, Merlin replied, turning to follow James with his long, slow stride. Nine-tenths of magic happens in the mind. The last tenth, Mr. Potter, is pure and unadulterated bluster. Take note of that, and you'll do very well. After the bright, misty morning, the day progressed into a hazy stillness of unseasonable warmth. Headmistress McGonagall had insisted that classes continue, even during the tour of Martin J. Prescott and his entourage, but in spite of her order, dozens of students had gathered in the courtyard to witness the arrival of the Muggle reporter's crew. Near the front of the group, James and Harry stood side by side. Only a few feet away, Tabitha Corsica and her Slytherin compatriots were looking decidedly bright-eyed and eager. On the top of the main steps, Headmistress McGonagall was flanked by Miss Saccharina and Mr. Recreant. Martin Prescott, on the lowest step, glanced at his watch. Are you sure they can get their vehicles in through the way you described, Miss Saccharina? He said, glancing up to where she stood, squinting in the sunlight. They will be driving vehicles with wheels, as I've said. You know, wheels. There aren't any magical mud bogs or bridges with trolls living under them or anything, are there? Saccharina was about to answer when the sound of automobile engines became audible in the near distance. Prescott jumped and spun on the spot, craning to catch a glimpse of his crew. James, standing near the front of the crowd of students with his dad, thought Headmistress McGonagall was handling herself pretty well, considering everything. She merely pressed her lips tightly together as the huge vehicles rumbled into the courtyard. There were two of them, and James recognised them as the sort of enormous off-road trucks Zane called Land Rovers. The first one ground to a halt directly in front of the steps. All four doors popped open and men began to emerge, blinking in the hazy sunlight and carrying large leather bags covered in thick pockets. Prescott scampered down among the men, calling them by name, pointing and yelling directions. I want lights and reflectors on the left side of the steps, angled towards the doors. That's where I'll do my final commentary and conduct interviews. Eddie, you have the chairs? No? All right, that's fine, we'll stand. Sitting might seem too, you know, established anyway. We want to keep the feeling of expose alive the whole time. Which cameras do you have, Vince? I want the 35mm handycam on everything. Double film the whole shoot with it, got it? We'll edit the footage in here and there for that hidden camera feel. Perfect. Where's Greta with the makeup? The crew completely ignored the assembly of students and the headmistress and ministry officials on the steps. 
All around the trucks was the well-oiled bustle of men assembling cameras, attaching electrical cords to lights, stringing microphones onto long poles, and saying test and check into smaller microphones meant to be clipped to Prescott's shirt. James noticed a few individuals moving among the group that didn't seem preoccupied with the technical preparations. They were dressed rather better and seemed curious about the castle and the grounds. One of them, an old, balding, friendly-looking man in a light grey suit, ambled up the stairs towards the headmistress. Quite the fuss, isn't it? <laughs> he proclaimed, glancing back towards the trucks. He bowed slightly towards the headmistress. Randolph Finney, detective, special branch. Not quite retired, but close enough not to matter. <laughs> Mr. Prescott may have mentioned me. He made rather a big deal of my being here, it seems. Between you and me, I suspect he'd hoped for someone a bit more, uh, inspiring, if you take my meaning. So, this is some sort of school, I understand. Indeed it is, Mr. Finney, Saccharina said, stretching out her hand. My name is Brenda Saccharina, head of the Department of Ambassadorial Relations for the Ministry of Magic. Today is going to be a very interesting day for you, I suspect. Ministry of Magic, how perfectly quaint, Finney said, shaking Saccharina's hand rather distantly. His gaze hadn't strayed from the headmistress. And who might you be, madam? This is, Saccharina replied, but McGonagall, long accustomed to overriding unwelcome noises, spoke easily over her. Minerva McGonagall, Mr. Finney, pleased to meet you. I am headmistress of the school. Charmed, charmed, Finney said, taking McGonagall's hand reverently and bowing again. Headmistress McGonagall, I'm delighted to meet you. Please do call me Minerva, McGonagall said, and James saw just the slightest pained look pass over her face. Indeed, and uh, call me Randolph. I insist. Finney smiled at the headmistress for several seconds, then cleared his throat and adjusted his glasses. He turned on the spot, taking in the castle and grounds. I'd never known there was a school in this area, to tell you the truth, especially one as magnificent as this. Why, it should be on the register of historic places, and no mistake, Minerva. What do you call it? Saccharina began to answer but nothing came out. She made a tiny noise, coughed a little, and then covered her mouth daintily with one hand, a look of mild puzzlement on her face. Hogwarts, Randolph, McGonagall answered, smiling carefully. Hogwarts School of Witchcraft and Wizardry. You don't say, Finney replied, glancing at her. How wonderfully whimsical. We like to think so. Detective Finney. Prescott suddenly called, trotting up the steps, his face covered in pancake makeup and tissue paper stuffed into the collar of his shirt. I see you've already met the headmistress. Miss Saccharina and Mr. Recreant are here to conduct the tour, of course. The headmistress is just along for, uh, colour, as it were. And she performs her role quite well, doesn't she? Finney said, turning back to McGonagall with a grin. James saw that the headmistress was refraining, rather heroically, from rolling her eyes. "'You have met Miss Saccharina and Mr. Recreant, then?' Prescott ploughed on, moving between Finney and McGonagall. "'Miss Saccharina, perhaps you will tell Detective Finney a bit of what it is you do here.' Saccharina smiled charmingly and stepped forward, threading her arm through Finney's in an attempt to lead him away from headmistress McGonagall. Saccharina said. She paused, then closed her mouth and tried to look down at it, which produced a rather odd expression. Finney regarded her with a slightly furrowed brow. Are you quite all right, miss? Miss Saccharina is feeling just a tad under the weather, Detective Finney, Recreant said, adopting an ingratiating grin that was no match for Saccharina's practised smile. Do allow me. This is a school of magic, as the headmistress has already mentioned. It is, in fact, a school for witches and wizards. We... Recreant's next words seemed to catch in his throat. 
He stood with his mouth open, staring at Finny and looking rather like an asphyxiating fish. After a long, awkward moment, he closed his mouth. He tried to smile again, showing far too many large, uneven teeth. Finny's brow was still furrowed. He disengaged from Saccharina's arm and glanced between both her and Recreant. Yes, spit it out then, why don't you? Are you both ill? Prescott was very nearly hopping from foot to foot. Perhaps we should just begin the tour then, shall we? Of course, I know my way around the castle a bit now. We can begin as soon as... as soon as... He realised he still had tissues jammed into the collar of his shirt. He grabbed at them and stuffed them into his trouser pockets. Miss Saccharina, you had mentioned that there would be someone else. An expert in explaining things to the uninitiated. Perhaps now would be a good time to introduce this person. Saccharina craned her head forward, her eyes bulging very slightly and her mouth open. After a few seconds of strained silence, the headmistress cleared her throat and gestured towards the open courtyard. Here he is now, I suspect. You know how Mr. Hubert tends to be rather late sometimes. Poor man will forget his own head one of these days. Still, he is a genius in his own way, isn't he, Brenda? Her mouth still open, Zacharina turned to follow McGonagall's pointing hand. At the opening of the courtyard, another vehicle was entering. It was ancient, its engine choppy and puttering a pall of blue smoke. Finney frowned a little as it chugged slowly across the courtyard. Zacharina and Recreant stared at the vehicle with twin expressions of pure bewilderment and disgust. The crowd of students gathered near the steps moved back as the vehicle squeaked to a stop in front of the first Land Rover, pointing at it. The engine coughed, sputtered, and then died slowly. "'That's a Ford Anglia, isn't it?' Finney said. "'I haven't seen one of those in decades!' <laughs> I'm amazed it still runs. Oh, our oh, Mr. Hubert is very good with engines, Randolph, McGonagall said crisply. Why, he's almost a wizard, really. The driver's door squeaked open and a figure clambered up out of it. He was very large so that the car rose perceptibly on its springs as he arose from it. The man squinted at the stairs, smiling a little vacantly. He had long, silvery-blonde hair and a matching beard, both of which were offset by a gigantic pair of black, horn-rimmed glasses. The man's hair was pulled back in a natty, almost prim ponytail. "'Mr. Terence Hubert,' McGonagall said, introducing the man. "'Chancellor of Hogwarts School of Witchcraft and Wizardry. Welcome, sir. Do come and meet our guests.' Mr. Hubert smiled and then glanced aside as the passenger's door of the Anglia screeched open. "'I hope you don't mind, everybody,' Mr. Hubert said, adjusting his glasses. "'I've brought my wife along with me. Say hello to the folks, dear.' James gasped as Madame Delacroix climbed awkwardly out of the car. She smiled very slowly and deliberately. "'Hello,' she said, in a strangely monotone voice. Hubert grinned mistily at her. She's a dearie, isn't she? Well, shall we begin, then? Zacharina coughed, her eyes widening rather alarmingly as she watched Delacroix join Mr. Hubert in front of the Anglia. She nudged recreant with her elbow, but he was as mute as she was. Chancellor! Prescott said, looking back and forth between Hubert and McGonagall. There's no Chancellor! Since when is there a Chancellor? I do apologise, sir, Hubert said, climbing the steps with Delacroix by his side. She grinned a bit wildly. I've been away for the past week. Business in Montreal, Canada of all places. Wonderful little distribution warehouse there. You know, we only use the highest quality magical supplies here, of course. I inspect all our materials by hand before ordering anything. Oh, but I shouldn't say any more, of course. <laughs> Hubert tapped the side of his nose with an index finger, grinning conspiratorially at Prescott. Prescott's face was tight with suspicion. He stared at Hubert, then at Madame Delacroix. 
Finally, he held up his hands and closed his eyes. All right, who cares? Mr. Hubert, if you are our guide, then guide away. He threw a glance over his shoulders at the camera crew, gesturing wildly with his eyebrows, and then followed Hubert into the gigantic open doors. Chancellor Hubert, can you tell us and our audience what you do here at Hogwarts School of Witchcraft and Wizardry? Why, of course, Hubert said, turning as he reached the centre of the entrance hall. We teach magic. We are, in fact, Europe's premier school of the magical arts. Hubert seemed to notice the camera for the first time. He grinned a little nervously into it. Students, sir, uh, come from the farthest reaches of the continent, and even beyond, to learn the ancient arts of the magical masters of the craft, to acquire, to absorb, to, er, uh, steep, as it were, in the secret arts of divination, illumination, prestidigitation, and, uh, etc., etc. Prescott was staring very hard at Hubert, his cheeks reddening. I see, yes. So you admit that you teach actual magic within these walls? Why, certainly, young man. Why ever would I deny it? Then you do not deny, Prescott said in a pouncing sort of voice, that these paintings which line this very room are magical, moving paintings. He gestured grandly towards the walls. The cameraman spun and walked as quickly and smoothly as he could towards a group of paintings by the doorway. The boom microphone operator lowered his apparatus so as to be sure to capture Hubert's response. M moving paintings? Hubert said in a distracted voice. Oh, 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 yes. Well, I suppose they could be said to move. Why, that painting there, no matter where you are in the room, the eyes in the painting are always upon you. Hubert raised his hands mysteriously, warming to the subject. They seem, in fact, to follow you everywhere you go. The cameraman took his eye away from the viewfinder and frowned back at Prescott. Prescott's face darkened. That's not what I mean! Make them move! You know they can! You! He spun on his heels and pointed at McGonagall. You had a conversation with a portrait in your office just yesterday! I watched you! I heard the painting talk! McGonagall made a face that was so comically surprised that James, who was standing just inside the doorway with the rest of the assembled students, had to suppress a giggle. I can't imagine what you mean, sir, the headmistress replied. Here now, you leave the lady out of this way, don't you? Finney said archly, taking half a step in front of the headmistress, who was a full head taller than him. Just you conduct your almighty investigation, Prescott, and let's get this over with. Prescott boggled for a few seconds and then composed himself. Okay, forget the moving paintings, silly me. He turned back to Hubert. I presume lessons are going on, Mr. Hubert? Hmm? Hubert said as if startled. Lessons? Well, I, I guess so. I wouldn't expect... You wouldn't expect we'd like to see, would you? Prescott interrupted. Well, we would. Our viewers have a right to know exactly what is going on here, right under our noses. Viewers? Hubert repeated, glancing back to the camera. This is, uh, live, is it? Prescott dropped his head forward and slumped a bit. No, Mr. Hubert, it isn't. Didn't any of you tell him how this works? We record it, we edit it, we broadcast it. Miss Saccharina, you understood all of this, am I correct? He glanced aside at Saccharina, who smiled and spread her arms. She mouthed a few words and then gestured vaguely at her throat. Recreant cinched his grin a notch higher. His forehead was beaded with sweat. Great, Prescott muttered. I see. Marvellous. Continuing, he straightened and glared at Hubert again. Yes, our viewers would very much like to see what happens in these so-called classrooms, Mr. Chancellor. Please lead the way. Hubert turned to Delacroix. What do you think, dear? Divination or levitation? 
They are both equally impressive, honey, Delacroix said, forming the words rather awkwardly. She seemed to want to say more, but despite the workings of her jaw, her lips clamped tightly shut. My wife is foreign, as you can see, Hubert said apologetically, but she does her best. The classrooms, please, Mr. Hubert, Prescott insisted. You can't keep the press out, sir. No, no, of course not. We appreciate the publicity, in fact, Hubert said, turning to lead the crew down a hall. Prestigious as we are sometimes, it's hard to keep our heads above water. Magic is a specialized study, to say the least. Only a certain kind of individual has the patience and grace to learn it. Ah, here we are, then. Divination. Prescott walked briskly into the open doorway of the classroom, followed by his camera crew and boom microphone operator scrambling to keep up with him. Finney remained near the back of the group, staying as close to Headmistress McGonagall as he could. Harry and James, at the head of the crowd of curious students, leaned in through the door to watch. Here our students learn the ancient art of predicting the future, Hubert said grandly. A dozen students were scattered around the room, staring grimly down at the objects on the desks in front of them. At the head of the class, as if on cue, Professor Trelawney raised her arms, producing a musical jingling from the assortment of bangles on her wrists. Seek, students, she cried in her mistiest voice. Stare deep, deep into the face of the all-knowing cosmos, represented in the swirling patterns and designs of the infinite. Find your destinies. Tea leaves, Finney said happily. Me own mammy studied fortunes and tea leaves for the tourists. Got us through some hard times back in the day. How perfectly picturesque, keeping such traditions alive. Traditions? Pah! Trelawney said, arising from her seat and swirling her gauzy robes dramatically. We find the embedded nature of perfect truth in the leaves, sir. Past, present, future. All bound together for those who bear the eyes to see. That's just what me mam used to say too, <laughs> chuckled Finney. This is how you tell the future, Prescott said, staring disgustedly into one of the students' cups. This is ridiculous. Where are the crystal balls? Where's the swirling smoke and the ghostly visions? Well, uh, we have those things too, Mr. Prescott, Hubert said. Don't we, dear? Advanced divination, second semester, two hundred pound lab fee, Delacroix replied mechanically. Covers those crystal balls, Hubert said behind his raised hand. Those things aren't cheap. We have them specially made in China. Real crystal and everything. Of course, the students get to take them home at the end of the school year. They're kind of a memento. I believe you mentioned levitation, Prescott said, marching out of the room. His entourage followed swiftly, clanking and unrolling more electrical cord. Certainly, yes, a staple of the magical arts, Hubert replied, following Prescott across the hall and into another classroom. We combine that class with basic prestidigitation. Yes, right in here. Zane stood in the centre of the classroom with a wand in his hand. A few dozen other students sat along the wall, watching in amazement as the bust of Godric Gryffindor floated and bobbed around the room, apparently at the behest of Zane's waving wand. There was a gasp and sigh of amazement from Prescott's crew. The cameraman squatted slowly, zooming in on the action. Aha! Prescott said excitedly. Real magic being performed by children! Just as promised! Hubert said proudly. Mr. Walker here is among the best in his class. Mr. Walker, what year are you, by the way? First year, sir, Zane said, grinning happily. Excellent form, my boy, Hubert replied. Try a loop, why don't you? The students applauded politely as the bust raised and spun slowly in the air. Then, suddenly, it dropped, falling onto a mattress which had been placed in the centre of the floor. 
Oh, too bad, Mr. Walker. So close, Hubert chided. It wasn't my fault, Zane yelled. It was my backstage. Ted, you dolt! You yanked when you were supposed to swoop. How many times do I have to explain that? Hey, Ted objected, bursting noisily out of a cupboard at the rear of the room. He held a handful of wires in his hand, all of which snaked up to a series of pulleys attached to the ceiling of the cupboard. You want to try coming back here and working these controls in the dark, eh? Besides, Noah is the one to blame. He was slow with the cross pulley. A voice from the depths of the cupboard yelled angrily. What? That's it. I want to be on stage next time. I've had it with this assistant role. I want to wear the hat. Nobody's wearing the hat, Noah, Zane said, rolling his eyes. Well, somebody needs to wear the hat, Noah cried, his face appearing around the doorway of the cupboard. How does anybody know who's the magician and who's the assistant? Boys, boys, Hubert placated, raising his hands. We only have one hat per classroom, and Miss Morganston is using it to practice the rabbit trick. Mr. Prescott, Mr. Finney, would you like to see the rabbit trick? Why, yes, Finney said brightly. No, Prescott yelled. Tabitha Corsica had pushed herself to the front of the students crowding in the doorway. Her face was red with anger. Mr. Prescott, she began, you... Hubert turned slowly to face Tabitha. This is hardly the time for autographs, Miss Corsica. I'm not here to get his autograph, Chancellor, Tabitha spat, raising her arm to point at Hubert. There was a small notebook and a pen clutched in her hand. She stopped in mid-sentence, staring at the two items. The cover of the notebook was pink and had the word autographs printed on it in white script. There will be plenty of time later for such things, Miss Corsica, but I'm sure Mr. Prescott is flattered by your, uh, interest. Chancellor Hubert, Petra interjected, peering into a black top hat, which was sitting atop a ridiculously glittery table. I think something might be wrong with Mr. Whiffles. Do rabbits usually lie on their backs like that? Not now, Miss Morganston, Hubert said, flapping his hand dismissively. Mr. Prescott, I believe you wanted to see our soaring in half room. But Prescott was gone, stalking past the suddenly silent Tabitha Corsica and heading down the corridor behind her. The crew scrambled to chase him as he poked his head into each room. At the end of the hall, he gave a muffled shout of triumph and waved for his crew to join him in the furthest classroom. Here! Prescott yelled, gesturing wildly with his right arm. The crowd poured into the room, followed by the watching students who were beginning to grin. Right before your eyes, a ghost professor. Make sure you get plenty of footage of this, Vince. Proof of the afterlife. There was no gasp of surprise this time. Vince moved in close, focusing carefully with one hand. Ah, oh, yes, Professor Binns, Hubert said happily. Say hello to the nice folks. Professor Binns blinked owlishly and passed his gaze over the crowd. Greetings, he said in his thin, distant voice. It's just a projection on smoke, Vince, the cameraman, announced. Well, Hubert said a bit defensively, he's not meant to be seen quite so close to like that. The students are usually well back from him creates a nice sense of mystery and the supernatural, really. Ralph was among the students seated in the classroom. He addressed the cameraman with a note of annoyance. You're ruining the effect, you know. You don't have to go and spoil it for everybody. Greetings, Bin said again, passing his gaze over the crowd. Impossible, Prescott shouted angrily, striding towards the front of the room. It's a ghost! I know it is! It's a projection, Martin, Vince said, lowering the camera. I've seen these before. It's not even a very good one. You can hear the projector running. It's right there under the desk. And see here, dry ice machine makes the smoke. Finney cleared his throat near the door. Hmm, this is getting rather embarrassing, Mr. Prescott. Greetings, said Professor Binns. Prescott turned wildly. 
He was obviously becoming rather unravelled. No! he shouted. This is all a set-up! It's his fault! He's trying to trick all of you! He pointed at Hubert. Well, that is what we do here, Hubert said, smiling politely. We're in the business of tricks, although we prefer the term illusion, if you don't mind. It's magic, Delacroix suddenly said, a bit inanely. She gave a ghastly grin. I see what you're all trying to do here. Prescott said, still pointing at Hubert, and then McGonagall, and even Saccharina and Recreant, who shook their heads vigorously. You're trying to make me look like a madman! Well, my public knows me better than that, and so do my associates. You can't hide everything. What about the moving staircases, or the giants, hmm? Or... Prescott stopped, his finger still in midpoint. His eyes went unfocused for a moment, and then he grinned maliciously. I know just the thing, just the thing indeed. Vince, Eddie, the rest of you, come with me. Hubert followed as the crew clanked and jostled through the crowd of students. Where are you going, Mr. Prescott? I'm your guide, if you recall. I'll show you whatever you wish. Yeah, Prescott said, spinning back towards Hubert. The curious students had parted for him and his crew, so that Prescott glared back between them, glancing from side to side. "'Will you show me?' He paused dramatically and tilted his head up. "'The garage?' "'The—' Hubert began. He blinked and then looked aside at Professor McGonagall. James suddenly felt Harry's hand tighten on his shoulder. Something was wrong. "'The garage?' Hubert repeated, as if he were unfamiliar with the word. Prescott's grin grew predatory. Aha! Weren't prepared for that, were you? Yes, I had myself a good long look around the grounds while you were all busy this morning, peeked here and there and got quite an eyeful. There is a garage, he said, turning to face the camera, that penetrates the very fabric of space and time, creating a magical portal between this place and another place thousands of kilometres away. America, if I may be so bold as to guess. I have seen it myself. I have been inside the structure and smelled the air of that far-off place. I have seen the sunrise of that land while the sun here was high above the horizon. It was no trick, no illusion. These people would have us believe that they are mere tricksters, while I maintain, as I have witnessed with my own eyes, that they are dabblers in a form of magic that is purely and simply supernatural. And now I will prove it. With a flourish, Prescott turned and marched away, heading back to the entrance hall. Harry fell in line next to Hubert but couldn't get his attention. Mr. Prescott? Hubert yelled over the sound of the now agitated crowd. I really must insist that you allow me. Mr. Prescott, this is highly irregular. Prescott led his crew out of the main entrance and across the courtyard. The crowd of students had grown considerably, and the noise of their passage had become quite loud. Everyone had seen the exterior of the Alma Aleron's garage, but very few had been inside or seen what it housed. The babble of worry and curiosity was a dull roar. This could be bad, James, Harry said, keeping his voice below the noise of the crowd. What can we do? Harry merely shook his head, watching Prescott turn the corner, leading the group towards the canvas structure overlooking the lake. He turned, framing himself before its canvas walls. His crew arranged themselves in position, lowering the boom microphone over him and adjusting huge white umbrellas to reflect the sunlight on his shadowed side. Prescott turned slightly, showing his best side to the camera as Vince squatted slowly, focusing. It was, James had to admit, a very dramatic moment. "'Ladies and gentlemen!' Prescott began, raising his natural orator's voice. My crew and I, and all of you, have been the victims of an elaborate hoax. This is no simple school of sleight of hand and card tricks. No, I have witnessed within these walls true magic of the most astounding and blood-chilling variety. 
I have seen ghosts and watched actual levitations. I have observed doors appearing magically in otherwise solid stone walls. I have seen beasts and giants that boggle the mind. Today we have been played for fools, deceived by a pack of wizards and witches. Yes, actual magical people who believe they can fool us with parlor tricks. But now I will reveal the truth of this place. Behind this canvas is a form of uncanny magic that will shock and astound you. When this truth is revealed, Mr. Rudolph Finney, detective for the British Special Branch, will be inclined to fulfill a full-scale official investigation into this establishment with the help of police agencies from all over Europe. After today, ladies and gentlemen, our lives will never be the same again. After today, we will be living in a world where we know without a doubt that witches and wizards are real and that they walk among us. Prescott paused, letting his words echo over the stunned crowd. Then he turned towards the area where McGonagall, Hubert, Saccharina and Recreant were gathered. Finney stood next to the headmistress, frowning slightly, his eyes wide. Mr. Hubert, Prescott called out, will you open these doors for us? This is your last chance to do the right thing. Hubert's expression was grave. He stared very directly at Prescott. I have to advise you against this course of action, Mr. Prescott. You open it or I will. You'll ruin everything, sir, Hubert said. Next to him... Delacroix was grinning even more manically. I'll ruin nothing but your secret, Mr. Hubert. The world needs to know what is behind those canvas doors. Hubert seemed frozen in place. It looked as if he wasn't going to do it, and then he moved forward, lowering his head. There was a long, collective gasp from the crowd. Prescott stepped aside, glancing triumphantly at the camera as he did so. Hubert approached the tent and stood in front of it. He sighed deeply and then reached up, grasping the knotted strips of canvas that held the tent's wide flaps closed. He turned his head to look at Prescott. After a terrible pause, he pulled. The knot came undone and the flaps dropped open, unfurling like flags, slapping the poles at either side of the broad tent opening. The crowd gasped, and then there was a long, puzzled silence. James peered in. He couldn't immediately make out what it was. The inside of the tent was rather dark, but he could see that the flying vehicles were gone. Most of the tent's interior was obscured by a large, oblong shape. A few people near the front of the crowd began to giggle, and then a wave of laughter washed over the crowd. Well, you've done it, Hubert said, still staring at Prescott. You've ruined the secret, and this was meant to be our big finish. I have to say, sir, you're no fun at all. Hubert finally stepped back, getting out of the way of the tent so that the camera crew could see directly inside. Tiny colored Christmas lights flashed in sequence around the huge papier mache flying saucer. Black letters were painted on the side, clearly visible in the flashing lights. And I hate to say it, Mr. Lupin, Hubert said, turning to Ted, but you misspelled Rocket. How dreadfully embarrassing. Chapter 20 Tale of the Traitor But I saw them! Prescott said insistently, his voice growing rather hoarse as he followed Vince between the Land Rovers. Giants! One of them was as tall as the trees! They made footprints the size of... the size of... He gestured with his arms desperately. Ignoring him, Vince packed his camera into a foam-lined suitcase. You've made quite a fiasco for yourself, Mr. Prescott, Detective Finney said, polishing his glasses on his tie. Don't make it any worse. Prescott turned to the older man, his eyes wild. You've got to investigate this establishment, Detective. It's not right. They've tricked you all. If I spearhead any investigations, Mr. Prescott, 
Finney said mildly. There'll be investigations of you and your methods. Did you have permission to trespass on these grounds in the first place? What? Are you mad? Prescott sputtered. He stopped and collected himself. Of course, as I've already told you, I was tipped off about what was happening here. Someone on the inside led me here. And you check the background of this person? Well, Prescott said, the chocolate frog was pretty convincing. I didn't really... Excuse me, did you just say the chocolate frog? Finney asked, his eyes narrowing. I, uh, well, the point is... Yes, my source was quite certain that something strange was going on here. That they were, in fact, teaching magic. Yes, uh, no, not tricks, real magic. With monsters and giants and, and vanishing doorways and flying cars. And the chocolate frog confirmed this, did he? Prescott opened his mouth to answer and then stopped. He straightened to his full height, angry and indignant. You're making fun of me. You make it hard not to, sir. Would you be willing to let me speak to this source of yours? Prescott brightened. Yes, in fact, I would. I arranged with Miss Saccharina for him to come along. He's right over. He glanced around, his brow furrowing. You arranged with Miss Saccharina? Finney asked, glancing up towards the top of the courtyard steps. Much of the school staff as well as a number of students, were watching with benign interest as the crew industriously packed their gear. Neither Miss Saccharina nor Mr. Recreant was in sight. She knows this source of yours, does she? She knows him all right, Prescott said, still scanning the crowd. Where is he? He came with a crew, Finney asked, glancing around. I don't remember meeting him. He was there. Quiet, squirrely fellow, had a twitch in his right eyebrow. Ah, him, Finney nodded. I thought he was a little odd. I'd very much like to have a word with him. So would I, Prescott agreed darkly. On the top of the steps, Mr. Hubert turned towards Headmistress McGonagall, Neville and Harry Potter. I think we can trust our friends to manage their departure from here, Madame Headmistress. I believe we have a few loose ends to attend to. McGonagall nodded, then turned and led the group inside. Harry smiled down at James. Come along, James. Ralph and Zane, you too. Are you sure? Ralph asked, glancing up at the headmistress as she strode into the hall. Mr. Hubert specially asked for you three to accompany us, Harry replied. Nice to have friends in high places, isn't it? Zane said happily. Well the headmistress said as they entered the empty silence of the great hall. That went as well as could be expected, even if Mr. Ambrosius was a little heavy-handed with his amorous charm. Mr. Finney has insisted that I join him for dinner next time I find myself in London. An offer I believe you should take him up on, madam, Merlin replied, taking off the gigantic horn-rimmed glasses and shaking his hair out of the Mr. Hubert ponytail. I enchanted him with the slightest possible charm. How could I have known that Detective Finney would have a natural predilection for tall, strong, handsome women? How, oh, indeed, McGonagall answered. I believe you are grinning, sir. James spoke up. But how do you know about the garage, Merlin? I thought we were done for. Merlin glanced back over his shoulder. I didn't know about the garage, James Potter. It was beyond the knowledge of the trees, unlike the Anglia vehicle and Madame Delacroix. Improvisation, however, has always been one of my stronger talents. But how'd you get the walkie in there? Ralph asked. That was totally brilliant. The trees knew about that, therefore I did as well, Merlin replied. It was simply a matter of encouraging an exchange of environments. Zane grinned. So the Alma Aleron cars are out there in that old barn in the field? It'll do them some good, I expect, Merlin nodded. The group walked purposefully through the great hall and climbed the stairs onto the dais. McGonagall opened a door in the rear wall and led the others through into a large antechamber with a stone floor and a dark fireplace. 
Sakarina and Recreant were there, sitting on either side of a third person James didn't recognise. This is an outrage, headmistress, Recreant said, leaping to his feet. First, you bring in this person to usurp our authority, and then you have the gall to perform the Langlock jinx on us. The minister will... Do shut up, Trenton, Sakarina said, rolling her eyes. Recreant blinked, wounded, but clamped his mouth shut. He looked back and forth from Sakarina to the headmistress. Wise advice, if ever I heard it, Harry agreed, stepping forward. And I suspect that the minister will, in fact, hear about this. We've done nothing wrong, Mr. Potter, as you know, Sakarina said, glancing idly at her fingernails. Mr. Ambrosius's appearance has secured the secrecy of the magical world. All is well. Harry nodded. I'm glad you feel that way, Brenda, although I find it interesting that you already seem to know Mr. Hubert's real name. No doubt there will be no link proven to connect him, you, and the unfortunate Madame Delacroix. What are we to make of your friend here, however? All attention turned to the man seated in the chair between Saccharina and Recreant. He was small, pudgy, with thinning black hair and a twitch in his right eyebrow. He shrunk from the gaze of everyone in the room. Ralph, who'd been the last to enter, pushed his way between Merlin and Professor Longbottom, his brow furrowed in bewilderment. Dad, he said, frowning, what are you doing here? The man grimaced miserably and covered his face with his hands. Merlin looked down at Ralph, his large, stony face sombre. He placed a hand on the boy's shoulder. This man says his name is Dennis Deedle. I was afraid you'd recognize him. What is he doing here? Neville asked. I think his role in this debacle is fairly evident, the headmistress replied, sighing. He is the man responsible for leading Mr. Prescott into our midst. What? Ralph said, rounding on McGonagall. Why would you say that? That's terrible. He came with Mr. Prescott's crew, Harry said quietly. He was trying to remain unobtrusive. Perhaps he was worried that you'd recognise him, Ralph. Later, when it was all over, it wouldn't have mattered, of course. But then again, things didn't happen as he expected. This is ridiculous, Ralph insisted. Dad's a muggle. He signed the muggle's non-disclosure contract, didn't he? He wouldn't do this, even if he could. I don't know what he's doing here, but it isn't what you all think. Merlin still had his hand on Ralph's shoulder. He patted him slowly. Perhaps you should ask him yourself then, Mr. Deedle. Ralph glanced up at the enormous wizard, his face pinched with anger and trepidation. He looked around the rest of the room from face to face, ending with his father. All right, then. Dad, why are you here? Dennis Deedle still had his hands on his face. For several seconds, he didn't move. Finally, he took a huge breath and sat back, dropping his hands. He looked at Ralph for a long moment and then glanced around at everyone assembled. All right, yeah, he said, having composed himself. I told Prescott. I sent him the chocolate frog. And the game deck. I'd used it to communicate with somebody on the school grounds. Somebody who went by the name Ostrom Maddox. Once I'd done that, I knew that Prescott could locate the school with his GPS. Ralph's face was frozen with disbelief and misery. But why, Dad? Why would you do such a thing? Oh, Ralph, I'm sorry. I know this looks bad to you, Dennis said. But it's all very, very complicated. Prescott show inside view. They offer money for proof of the supernatural. Well, we ain't been doing all that well, son. I've been looking for work ever since I got laid off, but it's been hard. We needed the money. I thought the chocolate frog would be enough. I really did. But Prescott wanted more. I knew I'd have to show him something really amazing, so he faltered, glancing nervously around the room again. But you never got the money, Merlin said in his low, rumbling voice. And that wasn't the real point, was it? Dennis's eyebrows worked furiously as he gazed up at Merlin, apparently struggling with what to say. Next to him, Sakarina cleared her throat meaningfully. 
Dennis glanced at her, taking his eyes from Merlin. The money, he said uncertainly. Prescott said we'd get it when the program aired. He promised. But there will be no program now, Merlin said quietly. You thought it'd be worth selling out the old magical world just to help us get by for a while, Dad, Ralph said, his voice not accusing, but truly questioning. It broke James's heart to hear the disappointment in the boy's voice. Nah, son, Dennis answered, but then looked away. I didn't think it'd threaten the old magical world. I mean, it's just a stupid TV program. Besides, he stopped, chewing on his words, wrestling with himself. Besides what? Merlin asked calmly. Dennis looked back at Merlin, his face tense, his right eyebrow twitching. Besides, what did the magical world ever do for me? He spat, then covered his face with his hands again. He took a deep, shuddering breath. Left me all alone, that's what. Shunned and abandoned, like some kind of... Some kind of worthless mutant, stripped of me name and me family, abandoned by me own parents because I wasn't like them. I was forbidden to ever contact them or speak of them again. They said I'd be adopted into the muggle world where I belonged. They said I'd be happier there. Well, I guess I showed them, didn't I? They didn't want me to ruin their reputation in a magical world. Well, why should I care about the secrecy of the magical world at all? Ralph's face was a mask of unhappy consternation. What are you talking about, Dad? You're not a wizard. Grandma and Grandpa died before I was born. You were as surprised as me when we got the letter from Hogwarts. Dennis tried to smile at his son. I'd almost forgotten about my own past, Ralph. It'd been so long, and I tried so hard to bury it. I'm a squib, son. Your grandparents and your uncle were witches and wizards. But I wasn't born with their powers. They raised me for as long as they could, but they hated my nature. When I came of age and they could see for sure that I didn't have any magical skills, they couldn't bear it. They hid me from the rest of the magical world. I was their ugly little secret, but they couldn't hide me forever. Finally, when I was twelve, they sent me away. I went to a muggle orphanage under the pretense that my parents had died in an accident. They made me vow never to mention them and never to try and seek them out. My mother was... she was sad. She cried and hid her face from me. But my father was hard. She couldn't budge him. He hired a muggle driver to take us to the orphanage. Mother stayed in the car when my father took me inside. She tried to embrace me, to say goodbye... But father wouldn't let her. He said it would be better for both of us. He performed memory modifications on the workers at the orphanage and made them believe I'd been delivered by the state after the deaths of my parents. I was given a bed and a set of clothes, and then my father left. I never saw my parents again. Dennis Deedle's eyes didn't leave his son's face when Merlin spoke. You were very hard done by, Mr. Deedle. I assume Deedle is not your given name, is it? Nah, me father invented that name for me, Dennis said blandly. I hate it. What is your given name, sir? Dollarhoff, Ralph's father answered, his voice growing distant, almost dead. My name is Deniston Jill Dollarhoff, son of Maximilian and Wilhelmina Dollarhoff, younger stepbrother of Antonin. There was a moment of very cold silence, and then McGonagall spoke. Mr. Dollarhoff, do you realise that what you've done could send you to Azkaban? Dennis blinked, as if coming out of a trance. What? Nah, nah, of course not. I was promised that nothing I did was against the law. Zacharina coughed lightly. Perhaps, Mr. Deedle, you prefer to refrain from answering any more questions? Until your legal representation can be present? Why? Dennis said, glancing at her in alarm. Am I in trouble? You said... It would be in your best interest, sir, Sakarina interrupted. You said I was doing the world a favour, Dennis exclaimed, getting to his feet. He glanced at Harry. She promised me that I'd be taken care of, even if Prescott and his people didn't come through with the money. She said this was more important than money anyway. When I came to them... Sit 
down, Mr. Deedle, Sakarina said, her voice icy. Don't call me that. I hate that name. Dennis backed away from her, glancing back at Harry. They told me it was all right to talk to Prescott. I told them what I was thinking of doing. I knew I had to check with the ministry. They said the contract I'd signed wasn't binding because I wasn't a muggle and I'd left the wizarding world before I was old enough to sign the wizarding vow secrecy too. So I wasn't breaking any laws. She promised me it was all right. She said it was for everybody's good and I'd be a hero. Miss Sacarina. Harry said, producing his wand, but not quite brandishing it. What do you have to say in response to this man's accusations? I have nothing to say whatsoever, she replied easily. He is clearly deranged. No one would believe the word of such a person. Mr. Recreant, Harry said, turning to the stunned man. Do you concur with Miss Sacarina's assessment? Recreant's eyes moved like flies, flicking back and forth between Sakarina and Harry. I'd, he began, and then lowered both his eyes and his voice. I'd like the chance to discuss this outside of Miss Sakarina's hearing. Mr. Recreant, as your superior, I forbid. You'll forbid nothing, madam, Neville said sternly, slipping his own wand from his robes. In the name of ambassadorial security, I have to insist, Sakarina began, but stopped as Harry pointed his wand at her. In the name of the Ministry of Magic and the Aura Department, he said, I place you, Miss Brenda Sakarina, under arrest for attempted violation of Section 2 of the International Code of Wizarding Secrecy and for the theft of Ministry of Magic property. Sakarina tried to smile, but it was a relatively poor attempt. You can't prove anything, Mr. Potter. This is a foolish and dangerous game you are playing. I will only warn you once to stand down. You should think twice about conspiring with people who despise you, Miss Sakarina, Merlin said, smiling ruefully. I had a charming and illuminating conversation with Madame Delacroix when I discovered her in the forest. She has much to say about you, I'm afraid, and very little of it is what I'd be prepared to call flattering. Neville was leading Mr. Recreant out of the room, with the headmistress following. Harry gestured with his wand. Come, Miss Sakarina. Titus Hardcastle awaits to escort you back to the Ministry, and patience is not one of his stronger suits. Sakarina's face went blank as she realised she had no choice but to follow along. No doubt she had a very good defence ready, James thought, as she stalked out of the room in front of his dad. People like her always had lots of ways to cover their tracks. Still, it didn't look good for Brenda Sakarina. As the door leading to the great hall swung open, James saw Titus Hardcastle grinning mirthlessly, his wand pointing carefully at the floor. James found himself left only with Merlin, Zane, Ralph and Dennis Dolohov. Dennis looked at his son and then touched him on the shoulder. I'm sorry, Ralph. I really am. I was confused. You should have told me, Dad, Ralph said, dropping his eyes. Dennis nodded. After a moment, he raised his eyes to Merlin. Am I going to go to wizarding prison? He asked, trying to firm his voice. I, I'll go along quietly, I guess. Somehow I suspect not, Mr. Dolohoff. Merlin said, turning to lead the group out of the chamber. He opened the door leading to the great hall. But your actions have resulted in quite a conundrum. It appears that this school's security, strong as it may once have been, is not quite prepared to meet the challenges of modern muggle technology. Perhaps you'd have some thoughts on how to improve it. Dennis frowned. What are you suggesting? You want my help? Merlin shrugged. I am simply acknowledging a rather curious coincidence. You were in need of employment, and we are in need of a revised security program. As a wizard who also happens to be an expert in muggle technology, you seem rather uniquely qualified to serve in that regard. Dennis grinned in relief. I'll think about that, sir. I am in no position to make any offers on behalf of this school, of course, Merlin said, crossing the great hall with his long, commanding stride. 
But I know the headmistress. I'll see what I can do. So, Zane said, following Ralph and James into the entrance hall. Turns out you were of solid magical stock after all, Ralph. Even if they were a bunch of cruel, heartless purebloods. Not that it matters, really, but it does sort of explain why you were made a Slytherin. Maybe, Ralph said quietly. This is all too much for me to take in in one day. Either way, none of that magic was mine. It was the staff. Merlin stopped near the stairs and then turned slowly. He gazed at Ralph speculatively. You were the keeper of my staff? Yeah, Ralph answered dejectedly. I kept it from killing anyone, I guess, but barely. Don't listen to him, Zane said. He was spectacular with it. Saved James's life once with it. Grew a peach tree out of a banana, too. So he once burned a bald stripe on a Victoire's head in D.A.D.A. All of us have thought about doing that to her from time to time, just to shut her up. Merlin approached Ralph. James was certain the wizard hadn't been carrying his staff the moment before, but as he lowered himself to one knee in front of Ralph, he now held it in his right hand. The runes along its length were dark, but James remembered how they'd pulsed with green light the night before. Mr. Deedle, or shall I call you Mr. Dollarhoff? Merlin said. I'm kind of attached to the Deedle, Ralph answered, glancing up at his father. I don't know if I'm ready to be a Dollarhoff yet. Sorry, Dad. Dennis gave a small, understanding smile. Mr. Deedle, then, Merlin said. Not just any wizard could have borne the responsibility of the staff. You have heard it said that the wand chooses the wizard, and this is true. Madame Delacroix believed you were merely a vessel to bring the staff to her, but she was mistaken. The staff chose you. A lesser wizard would have been unable even to hold the staff, much less use it. But you, without knowing it, brought the staff under your own power. You had no idea of the strength of it, and yet you managed it. It obeyed you, and that is the mark of a wizard of very, very great potential. Part of this staff now belongs to you, Mr. Deedle. I have felt it. I knew that a portion of it was no longer my own, but I knew not whose it was. Now I know. Merlin lowered his staff so that it lay across his knee. He closed his eyes and felt along the length of the staff, his hand barely touching the wood. Faint green light moved within the runes, flickering. Merlin wrapped his hand around the lower, tapered end of his staff, then, with barely a twist, broke off the last foot of its length. He opened his eyes again and held the length of wood out to Ralph. You are, I believe, in need of a wand, Mr. Deedle. Ralph took the length of wood from Merlin. As he did, the wood became his wand again, still ridiculously fat and chunky, with the lime-green painted tip. Ralph grinned, turning it over in his hands. I wouldn't expect it to be quite as powerful as it once was, of course, Merlin said, turning his staff upright and using it to stand again. The staff was noticeably shorter now. But I suspect you will still be able to do remarkable things with it. Thanks, Ralph said seriously. Don't thank me, Merlin said, raising an eyebrow. It's yours, Mr. Deedle. You made it so. So the wizard gives the cowardly lion his courage, Zane said, grinning. When does James here get some brains? Merlin cinched his eyebrow a bit higher, looking from Zane to James. Don't pay him any attention, James said, laughing and leading the group to the stairs. It's a muggle thing. We wouldn't understand. Come on, Ralph called, running up the steps. I want to show Ted and the rest of the gremlins I got my wand back. Tabitha Corsica can keep her stupid broom. The three boys scrambled up the moving staircases, followed more sedately by Merlin and the newly reborn Dennis Dollarhoff. Will he be okay with that thing? Dennis asked Merlin, frowning a little. Merlin merely smiled and clacked his staff on the steps as he climbed. Unnoticed, a jet of lime-green sparks shot from the tip, swirling and glowing like fireflies in their wake. Chapter 21 
The Gift of the Green Box The last weeks of the school year spun out before James like a blur, remarkably free of deathly peril and adventure, but packed nonetheless with the lesser stresses of schoolwork and final essays and wand practicals, all of which were relatively welcome in the wake of the Hall of Elders Crossing. To no one's great surprise, Hufflepuff was awarded the House Cup, being the only house to avoid major point deductions for involvement in the various Merlin conspiracy skullduggeries. The broomstick caper alone had cost Ravenclaw and Gryffindor fifty points each. On the morning of the last day of school, James was stuffing his books and extra school robes into his trunk when Noah pounded up the stairs calling for him. Ron Weasley's in the fireplace. He wants to talk to you. James grinned. Excellent. Tell him I'll be right there. James, look at you, Uncle Ron cried when James tromped downstairs a minute later, still tying his tie. All respectable and everything. Have a good year, did you? James nodded. I guess I did. Looks like I'll pass, after all. Spent all of Monday night getting ready for Franklin's D.A.D.A. -DA practical, then had the most horrible sensation that I'd forgotten everything five minutes before the test. I wasn't exactly talking about your schoolwork, you dunce, said the face in the embers, grinning crookedly. Your dad told me all about the Merlin conspiracy you uncovered. That's brilliant stuff, and no mistake. Yeah, well, James said sheepishly. It was all pretty exciting there for a while, but it's weird. Five weeks of schoolwork, and suddenly all of that seems like it happened to someone else. That's the way of it, Ron nodded. The dull parts of life spread out in your memory and crowd out the exciting parts until they just seem like little flashes. It's the way your brain copes with it all, I guess. Speaking of which, how's Professor Jackson doing? James rolled his eyes. Nothing can keep old Stonewall down for long. He wasn't really injured in his duel with Delacroix, even though his backup wand wasn't as powerful as the one she broke. Apparently, he chased her through the woods for hours and finally cornered her in a clearing. He says he'd have got her except that she cheated, calling on the enemy naiads and dryads to fight with her. The trees attacked him from behind, knocking him out. That's how he got the big bruise on his forehead. Still, he was back in class the day after Prescott left, and he's been raining fire on Zane and me ever since. Ron raised an eyebrow. Can't really blame him, I guess. We gave him back his briefcase and apologised and everything. I mean, I know we ruined his lifelong quest to protect the relic robe and prevent the return of the most dangerous wizard of all time and all, but come on. Merlin turned out to be all right. Delacroix got sent back to the States to stand trial in the American wizarding courts. Everything worked out in the end, didn't it? All I can say is, if I was him, I'd wish you spiders in your drawers for the rest of your life, Ron mused. But that's just me. My mind tends to go that way. Honestly, Uncle Ron, I want to make it right. I liked Professor Jackson at first. At the risk of sounding like a responsible adult, James, actions have consequences. Apologising is great, but sorry isn't a magic word. You not only ruined Jackson's plans, you took a stab at his pride. You succeeded in foiling him. In his mind, you made a fool out of him. That's a hard thing for a bloke like him to get over. Frankly, you can't blame him, can you? I guess not, James agreed sulkily. At least he didn't fail us in technomancy. It was a close thing, though. Good man. Still, don't get too wrapped up in classwork, you. You've got a reputation to live up to. Or down to. Noah's voice quipped from nearby. I heard that, Metzger, Ron said sternly. It's a proud Potter tradition, squeaking by in school. Started with James Potter the first. Besides, you're the one to talk, Mr. Gremlin. Got high marks this year all across the board, Noah said primly. Ron grinned again. Thanks to your friend Petra, no doubt. She's to you gremlins what Hermione was for Harry and me. Hold on, she wants to say hello, James. The face in the coal sank out of sight. A moment later, Hermione's pleasant smile and perpetually bushy hair formed. "'James, you look very handsome,' she said proudly. "'Don't you listen to your uncle. He studied plenty and was just as worried about marks as anyone.' "'That's not true!' a muffled voice called from the depths of the fireplace. Hermione grimaced. "'Well, almost anyone,' she conceded. 
Anyway, your mum and dad will be very proud of you, and so are your uncle and me. Oh, I just can't believe how fast the time goes. It seems like only yesterday that we were all still there. She sighed, looking around the common room. It looks almost exactly the same. We'll have to make a point of visiting next year. It'll be nice to see the old place again. Even in the embers, Aunt Hermione's eyes glistened a little. She blinked and then returned her gaze to James. Anyway, James, Ron's been talking to your father, you know, and the two of them wanted to ask you something. I thought it'd be best if someone besides either of them brought it up, though, because, frankly, they're both so silly about it that they'd influence your response. What is it? James asked, squatting down in front of the fireplace. Don't kneel, Hermione chided automatically. You'll scuff up your trousers with ash. It's about the headmistress. She's planning to retire, you know. James didn't know. She is? But what would she do with herself? Hermione gave James a look that said she'd just remembered how old he was. Minerva McGonagall has quite a life outside the walls of Hogwarts, James, as difficult as that may be for you to believe. She's even, I understand, taken Mr. Finney up on his offer of dinner in London. She did, James hooted. She did, Noah chimed almost simultaneously from the couch, looking up from a book. Hermione rolled her eyes. It was a purely professional meeting, I can assure you both. She performed a few minor memory modifications upon Mr. Finney, not really causing him to forget his visit here, but altering it. It's all a part of Mr. Dollarhoff's program to clean, as he calls it, the school's security record. Still, Hermione added, lowering her voice a bit. She did speak rather highly of Mr. Finney. It would be quite nice to think that she might find a, a companion for herself. After all, Hermione! Ron's voice barked from the depths of the fireplace again. Anyway, Hermione said, turning businesslike, yes, the headmistress does plan to retire, possibly as soon as this summer, assuming a suitable replacement could be found. Most likely she will stay on to teach Transfiguration and help the new headmaster, whoever he or she might be. Some had suggested Neville Longbottom, but the Ministry feels he might be a bit young for the post, which is just silly, but politics being what they are. Merlin, James exclaimed, you're all thinking of asking him to be the new headmaster. A whoop of happy triumph emanated from the depths of the fireplace. Hermione scowled. You can leave me out of this, thank you very much. This is all your father's and uncle's idea, but I can see you're as mad about it as they are. But how can he be the headmaster? Noah asked, jumping off the couch and crouching in front of the fireplace. Sorry, he added quickly, couldn't help overhearing and all that. Really? Hermione replied a bit archly. There I was assuming you were suitably entrenched in that arithmetic textbook. How silly of me. Please do keep it a secret, though, both of you. Oh, what am I saying? Ron, you might as well explain this. She sighed and blew her fringe out of her face in a gesture James remembered from his earliest memories of Aunt Hermione. She gave a bemused smile. James, have a good trip. We'll see you in a week. Rose and Hugo say hello and to buy them some cauldron cakes on the train. Good day, Noah. She disappeared from the embers and Uncle Ron's face appeared again. Excellent idea, eh? he announced, looking from Noah to James enthusiastically. But how? Noah asked again. I mean, the bloke was the most potentially dangerous wizard in the history of the planet a few weeks ago, wasn't he? And now you think the Ministry will put him in charge of a bunch of kids? Not without loads of supervision, Ron said quickly. He had obviously thought a lot about it. That's where McGonagall and Neville come in. They'll watch him and help out, sort of like a board of directors. McGonagall has already agreed to it, although we had to push her a bit on it. She's afraid she'll still basically be doing all the work, but with Merlin getting the credit. Might happen too, I guess, but your dad and I don't think so. Merlin seems the sort of guy born to lead, you know. Yeah, James agreed, but still, he comes from a time when leading meant telling people which guillotine had the shortest queue. I can't imagine that the Ministry will agree to put him in charge of Hogwarts. Your Merlin's a surprisingly fast learner, James, Ron said seriously. 
He's already been all over the ministry, meeting people and having big, long discussions about the way things work in this day and age. He's warming up to it, I have to say. So why wouldn't they put him somewhere there, then? Noah asked. I mean, most famous wizard in the world and all. Seems like he'd be in line for Minister of Magic, if nothing else. Ron grinned a bit maliciously. I suppose you're both too young to understand the implications of the phrase overqualified and underexperienced. Basically, no department wants him. A guy like Merlin doesn't work well behind a desk, for one thing, and it's hard to imagine that any department head who hired him would stay the department head for very long afterwards. You mean he'd take over, right? James confirmed. Take over at the very least. He's a bit of a loose cannon. Sure, he's probably the most powerful single wizard alive today, but with a thousand-year gap in his work experience. As fast as he picks things up, he's sure to be a poor fit in the red-tape world of the Ministry. Your dad can hardly stand it, James. Think about what it'd be like for a bloke who used to be able to banish his enemies to the netherworld with a glance. The fact of the matter is that the Ministry is looking for an out-of-the-way place to stick the old man. Some place prominent enough to fit a wizard of his stature, but far enough away not to threaten anyone, metaphorically speaking. Or maybe even not metaphorically speaking. One never knows. And Hogwarts just happens to be in need of a new headmaster, Noah said, grinning. Well, Ron said, meeting Noah's grin, it does seem a little too perfect, doesn't it? Even if the Ministry does agree to it, you think he'll do it? James asked. In the fireplace, Ron seemed to shrug. Who can tell? Nobody has asked him yet, but first things first, Ron grew serious and studied James. You know him best, nephew. You were there when he came out of the past. You were the one who talked him into coming and helping Hogwarts and the wizarding world. What do you think? Do you think he'd be a good headmaster? Do you think we should ask him? Noah leaned back against the base of the couch, looking at James, waiting for his response. James knew he should think about it, but he already knew his answer. Merlin was a complicated man, and he wasn't exactly what anyone could call good, not in the sense that Albus Dumbledore or even Minerva McGonagall were good. But James knew one thing for sure. Merlin wanted to be good. It was hard to tell if it was better to have a headmaster who was good by nature or one that was good because he had to try to be so every day. But James was old enough to know that it was a risk worth taking. Besides, the gremlin part of James whispered, it might be fun having a headmaster who'd banish someone like Tabitha Corsica to the netherworld with a glance. Ask him, James said, nodding once, emphatically. If the ministry goes for it, ask him, and I hope he accepts. Woohoo! Noah hooted, throwing his hands in the air. Keep it to yourselves for now, Ron said sternly. If word gets out before your dad and Hermione arrange things at the ministry, it could spoil everything, got it? Noah nodded. James smiled agreement. Your dad took back the cloak and the map, did he? Ron asked James, changing the subject. Yeah, and I'm apparently going to be grounded when I get back. Two weeks off my broom. Ron clucked his tongue. Just when you were getting pretty good on it, I hear. Ah, oh, well, you know your dad has to keep up the look of the thing, punishing you and all, but he's proud of you. Take it from me. James's smile widened and his cheeks flushed. Not that I'd try it again, mind you, Ron said, his grin vanishing. Once is a charm. If you pull something like that again, Ginny will probably decide to homeschool you in the basement. Take it from me. She's no one to mess with, James. Later that afternoon, James met Zane and Ralph outside as the Alma Alarons gathered to depart. As they watched, the three flying vehicles were driven out of the garage, and then the garage was broken down and packed inside the boot of the Dodge Hornet. There's something deep and mystical about that, but I can't quite put my finger on it, Zane said thoughtfully. What, the garage being packed into what it was housing a few minutes ago? No, the way Professor Franklin seems to get more and more popular with the girls, the closer it gets to his departure. It was true. Franklin was quite popular with the ladies, from the oldest staff matron to the first-year girls, who giggled when he passed them, touching each lightly on the head. 
The only women he seemed to have no effect on were the headmistress and Victoire, who claimed to believe he was a pompous old blowhard. Ted had explained that one of the benefits of being old was being free to flirt with any girl you wanted because none of them took you seriously enough to get offended. Zane found this remarkably instructive. When I get old, I'm going to flirt like that, he said wistfully. He's not even flirting, James said, narrowing his eyes. He's just smiling at them and acting all self-effacing, like he always does. That just shows what you know about flirting. Ralph rolled his eyes. I'm surprised you aren't taking notes. He should offer a class, Zane said seriously, watching Franklin bow and kiss Petra Morganston's hand goodbye. Petra grinned and glanced aside, her cheeks reddening a little. When Franklin straightened, she leaned in and gave him a chaste little peck on the cheek. Ladies and gentlemen of Hogwarts, he said, turning to address the crowd. It has been our distinct pleasure to serve you this year. It has been, as I knew it would be, a remarkably instructive year for us. We have strengthened our resolve to work with the European magical community to maintain fairness and equity worldwide, not only for the magical world, but for all humanity. He scanned the crowd, beaming, and then took off his glasses and sighed. We are, I suspect, at the beginning of challenging times. The winds of change are blowing. On both sides of the ocean, we face forces that would shake our culture to its foundations. But we have made friends, you and us, and united we will stand, regardless of what may come. I have been around for a very long time, and I can say with some degree of confidence that change is always in the wind. The challenge of good men is not to thwart change— but to mold it as it comes so that it may benefit rather than destroy. After this year, I am indeed confident that we may succeed in that endeavor. There was a round of applause, although it felt to James a little perfunctory. Not everyone in the crowd agreed with Franklin, and not all for the same reasons. Still, it had been a good speech, and James was glad Franklin had made it. While the crowd was still cheering... Franklin climbed into the Volkswagen Beetle. He waved once from the open door. Someone tapped James on the shoulder. He turned and then had to look up. Professor Jackson was standing behind him, tall and dressed in black. Jackson looked more imposing than ever. He looked down his nose at James, his bushy brows low. I thought you might wish to have this, Jackson said. James noticed that the man was holding a small wooden box. Jackson looked at it in his hands and then handed it to James. It was found in Madame de la Croix's quarters. I believe it belongs to you more than it does to anyone. Dispose of it as you see fit. James held the box, which was surprisingly light. It was a strange greenish color, covered in deep, carved scrollwork. It reminded him of the vines on the door of the grotto keep. He looked up to ask Professor Jackson what it was, but the man was already striding across the courtyard towards the Stutz dragonfly. He stopped when he reached the vehicle, and then turned, raising one hand to the assembly, his face as stony as his nickname. The crowd cheered, a much longer and more sustained ovation than even Franklin had received. Surprisingly, Jackson had become a favourite at Hogwarts, not so much in spite of his curmudgeon-like demeanour as because of it. Once Jackson had climbed into the vehicle, the rest of the assembly boarded quickly. The grey-cloaked delegates from the American Department of Magical Administration had arrived from London the day before to join their fellows for the trip back to the States. They filed into the vehicles, nodding goodbyes to the assembly. Last were the porters who packed the enormous pile of luggage into the apparently bottomless boots of the vehicles and then climbed into the front seats to drive. The wings unfolded from the vehicles smoothly, delicately, and began to thrash the air. The Dodge Hornet took off first. With a squeak of springs and creak of metal, it rose into the air, turning slowly. 
The Stutz Dragonfly and the Volkswagen Beetle followed, the low drone of their wings beating the air and rippling the grass of the courtyard. Then, with sudden grace and speed, they raced off, rising, their noses tilted towards the ground. In less than a minute, the noise of their departure was lost in the late spring wind that blew over the hills. Ralph, Zane and James plopped onto a bench near the courtyard entrance. "'So what's in the box Jackson gave you?' Ralph asked, peering curiously at it. "'I wouldn't even open it if I was you,' Zane warned. "'Remember what he said about making our lives interesting? "'He's the kind of guy to wait right until the moment he leaves to get his revenge on you. "'That way he's gone when the trouble starts.' "'He tapped the side of his head wisely. "'James frowned and shook his head slowly. "'He looked at the box on his lap. "'It had a brass latch on the front, holding the lid shut. "'Without a word, he flipped the catch and raised the lid. "'Zane and Ralph leaned in craning to see. The inside of the box was lined with purple velvet. There was one object inside, lying atop a piece of folded parchment. I don't get it, Ralph said, sitting back again. It's a doll. James removed it and held it up. It was indeed a small figure, roughly made of burlap and twine, with mismatched buttons for eyes. Zane peered at it, his face serious. It's... It's you, James! Sure enough, the figure did bear a striking resemblance. Black yarn on the head formed a good representation of James's unruly hair. Even the shape of the head, the line of the stitched mouth, and the placement of the button eyes made an eerie portrait. James shuddered. It's a voodoo doll, he said. He remembered the note inside the box. All three boys leaned in to read it as he unfolded it. Mr. Potter, you will surely recognize what this object is. There was no time in this year's technomancy curriculum to discuss the ancient art of representational harmonics, but I suspect you grasp the implications. This was found inside Madame de la Croix's quarters. After some discussion with the headmistress and the portraits of your Severus Snape and Albus Dumbledore, whom you should know have taken rather an interest in you, it was determined that you might benefit from knowing how Madame de la Croix used this object against you. The elegance of her manipulation was quite impressive, really. This figure was placed next to a much larger figure of your father. Harry Potter. On the other side of that was a candle. It seems apparent that she kept that candle lit at all times. The result, of course, Mr. Potter, was that your figure was always in the shadow of the representation of your father. There is always a grain of truth in the manipulations of the voodoo art. Delacroix knew that you would legitimately struggle with the expectations of your legendary father. The lesson you must learn from this, Mr. Potter, is that emotions are not bad, but they must be examined. Know yourself. Feelings always seem valid, but they can confuse, and they can, as you have seen, be used against you. I repeat, as your teacher and as your elder, know your feelings. Master them, or they will master you. Theodore Herschel Jackson. Wow, Ralph breathed. We didn't call her the voodoo queen for nothing. Zane asked, what are you going to do with it, James? I mean, if you destroy it, will you be destroyed somehow? James stared at the small, unattractive caricature of himself. I don't think so, he replied thoughtfully. I don't think Jackson would have given it to me in that case. I think he just means for me to remember what happened and to try to make sure it never happens again. So, Zane repeated, what are you going to do with it? James stood, stuffing the doll into the pocket of his jeans. I don't know. I think I'll keep it. For a while, at least. With that, the three boys meandered into the school, intent on doing as little as possible with their last day of the school year. Late that night, Unable to sleep from the excitement of the next day's departure, James got out of bed. He crept down the stairs into the common room, hoping someone else might still be up for a game of wizard chess or even winkles and augers. 
By the glow of the banked fire, the room appeared to be empty. As he was turning away, something caught James's eye, and he looked again. The ghost of Cedric Diggory sat near the fire. His silvery form was still transparent, but was noticeably more solid than the last time James had seen him. I was trying to think of a name for myself, Cedric said, smiling as James threw himself into the couch nearby. You've got a name already, haven't you? James answered. Well, not a proper ghostly name. Not like Nearly Headless Nick or The Bloody Baron. I need something with some panache. James considered it. How about The Chaser of Annoying Muggles? It's a little long. Well, can you do any better? I was thinking... You'd better not laugh, the ghost said, giving James a stern look. I was thinking of something like The Spectre of Silence. Hmm, James replied carefully. But you aren't silent. In fact, you sound a lot better now. Your voice doesn't sound like it's being blown in from the great beyond any more. Yeah, Cedric agreed. I've become quite a bit more here, sort of. I'm as ghostly as the rest of the school ghosts now. I was silent for a long time, though, wasn't I? I guess so. But still, with a name like The Spectre of Silence, James said doubtfully, it's going to be hard to make that stick if you go around chatting to people all the time. Maybe I could be all broody and quiet a lot of the time, Cedric mused, just to a lot of floating around and looking dour and everything. And then, when I passed by, people would whisper to each other, Hey, there he goes! The Spectre of Silence. James shrugged. It's worth a shot. I guess you have the summer to practice the whole brooding silence bit. I guess so. James suddenly sat up. So, do you think you'll be the new Gryffindor ghost? He asked. I mean, with nearly headless Nick gone on to wherever ghosts go, we don't have a house ghost anymore. Cedric thought for a moment. I don't think so, really. Sorry. I was a Hufflepuff, remember? James slumped back. Yeah, I forgot. A few minutes went by, and then Cedric spoke again. That was a pretty great thing you did, going out and calling Merlin back to help us out when it seemed like he'd left for good. James lifted his head and looked at the ghost. He frowned a little. That? Well, it was just a shot in the dark, really. It was all my fault Merlin was brought to this time at all. I thought I was doing the world this big favour, standing in the way of Delacroix's and Jackson's evil plan. Turns out she was using me all along, and Jackson was actually a good guy. Well, Cedric countered, you learned something then, didn't you? I don't know, James said automatically. He thought for a moment and then added, yeah, I guess I did. There is one way that you and your dad are one and the same, James, Cedric said. James laughed a little humorlessly. I can't see what it is. All I learned is that my way of doing things isn't Dad's. If I try to do it his way, I screw everything up. If I try to do it my way, I might help things scrape by on sheer luck. Dad's way was the way of the hero. My way is the way of the manager. My best talent is asking for help. No, James, Cedric said, leaning forward to look James directly in the eye. Your best talent is inspiring people to want to help. You think that's no big deal. The world needs people like you, because most of the people out there don't have the courage or the passion or the direction to be heroes. They want to be, but they need someone to tell them why and to show them how. You have that gift, James. Your dad was a hero because he was the boy who lived. He had a destiny. It wasn't an easy road for him, but it was an obvious road. There was Harry and there was Voldemort. He knew where he stood and what he had to do, even if it killed him. You, though, you're a hero because you choose to be one every day, and you have the talent to encourage others to choose that too. James stared into the banked coals of the fire. I'm no hero. Cedric smiled and sat back again. You only think that because you think heroes always win. Trust me on this one, James. A hero isn't defined by winning. Loads of heroes die in the effort. Most of them never get any recognition. No, a hero is just somebody who does the right thing when it would be far, far easier to do nothing. 
James turned to look at the ghost, smiling crookedly. Maybe we should call you the Spectre of Cheesiness. Ha ha, the ghost replied. James stood up again. Thanks, Cedric. That helps. Cedric nodded. James headed back for the stairs, but stopped with his foot on the bottom step. One thing still bothers me, though, Cedric. Maybe you know something about it, being a ghost and all. Maybe. Ask me. The dryad in the forest said that there was an heir of Voldemort. She said that this person was alive and nearby, right here on the school grounds. Cedric nodded slowly. I was there when you told Snape about it. Well, whoever that is, I think that's who took Ralph's game deck and used the name Ostromatix. If that hadn't happened, none of this would have come about. Whoever it is had to have been working with Miss Saccharina from the very beginning. Cedric looked away, out a nearby window. You think you know who it is? Tabitha Corsica, James said flatly. I thought it might be her after I talked to Snape, and I still think it could be her. So her broom wasn't the Merlin staff. There's still something scary about it, and about her in general. Cedric stood and walked through the chair, apparently without noticing he was doing so. I've felt something, James. I'll admit that to you. There is a sense of he who must not be named here still. It lingers within the halls. It's like a smell, like something rancid and oozing and purple somehow. Maybe I'm more sensitive to it than the other ghosts. After all, he was responsible for my death. Yeah, James said quietly. I hadn't forgotten. But, James, things are really as obvious as we'd like to think they are. In the real world, at least in our time, if not in Merlin's, evil wears many masks. It's confusing. You have to be very careful. Sometimes even good people can look bad. A lot of us, your father included, made that mistake when it came to Professor Snape. So did I, James admitted, with Professor Jackson. Cedric nodded. But I would have sworn that Tabitha was involved in the whole Merlin conspiracy. What do you think the real story is with her and her broom? Cedric looked at James for a long moment, studying him. Did it ever occur to you that a broom might be exactly what she says it is? What? James scoffed. A muggle artifact? That's just a ruse she came up with, isn't it? Cedric shrugged, but it looked more like the shrug of someone who knows more than he intends to tell. The scariest people in the world are not always the ones who are bent on evil, James. Sometimes the scariest person is the one who mistakes their own lies for the truth. James blinked. You mean Tabitha Corsica believes all that stuff, she said in a debate, about Voldemort actually being a good guy? That he was squashed by the Ministry and the magical ruling class because they couldn't have him changing the status quo? She can't really believe that, can she? Cedric looked back at James and then sighed. Honestly, I don't know, but I do know that lots of people do believe it, and she seems pretty sincere about it. That broom of hers may have some scary mojo built into it, but it's nothing compared to the dark magic someone might conjure if their heart is crooked enough to twist a lie into something they believe is truth. As James climbed quietly back into his bed, his mind raced. He had never even considered that Tabitha Corsica might believe the things she'd said. He had assumed that she was supporting the progressive element propaganda because she fully accepted and endorsed their ultimate dark goals. For a moment he felt vaguely sorry for her. It was awful to think that someone like her might believe that she was morally in the right, and that he, James Potter, and his father were the evil ones. It was almost unthinkable, but not entirely. Outside, the moon was full and bright. James fell asleep with its beams on his face, pale and cool, his brow still slightly furrowed. The next day, James, Zane and Ralph caught the Hogwarts Express back to Platform 9 and 3 quarters. Zane's parents were there, along with his younger sister, Greer, who watched the gigantic crimson engine with naked awe. Standing near them, James spied his mum and dad, herding Albus and Lily along with them. He grinned and waved, 
It felt like hardly a week ago that he had watched them from the train as it had pulled out of the station, carrying him to the uncertainty of his first year at Hogwarts. Now he was home again. Hogwarts was wonderful, he thought to himself, but he was glad to be back after all. Next year he'd be accompanying Albus on the train, taking him to his first year. He'd tease Albus endlessly about what house he'd end up in. It was going to be his summer's project, in fact. But he wasn't worried about it. Even if Albus wasn't a Gryffindor, he'd be okay. James knew that if Albus was indeed sent to another house, part of him, James, would even be a little jealous of him, but only just a little. As he joined the throng exiting the train, James fell in behind Ted. Ted, James noticed, was holding Victoire's hand. "'You're going to cause a lot of trouble, you know,' James said, grinning. "'It's a tough job, being this controversial,' Ted said humbly. "'But we all have our burdens to bear.' "'My parents must not see us together,' Vitoire commanded. "'Ted Lupin, you know they won't approve. "'You will keep your mouth shut too, James.' "'Her accent is much more prominent when she's arping, isn't it?' Ted asked James. "'James grinned. It was true. "'James stopped inside the open door of the train, looking about the platform.' Through the crowd of returning students, bustling porters and yelling family members, he saw Zane engulfed in the mutual hug of his pretty blonde mother and his tall, proud father. His sister was sucked into the embrace as if against her will, happy to see her brother again, but still enthralled by the crimson train. Ralph met his dad on the platform with a more restrained hug, both grinning a bit sheepishly. Ralph glanced back up at James and waved. Dad says we'll be spending the summer in London. I'll be able to come and visit. Excellent, James yelled back happily. And then, as he climbed down, James saw his own family watching for him. In the moment before they caught sight of him, James savoured his own happiness. This was indeed home. He ran towards them, patting his jeans pocket to make sure the little doll Madame Delacroix had made of him was still there. It probably wouldn't mean anything but there was no harm in it, no harm at all. "'James!' Albus cried, seeing him first. "'Did he bring us anything? You promised!' "'What am I, Father Christmas?' James answered, laughing as Albus and Lily nearly bowled him over. "'You promised! You promised us licorice ones from the cart lady!' "'And cauldron cakes for Rose and Hugo?' Harry added, grinning. Wow! Word sure travels fast. All right, all right. I've got stuff for everybody, James admitted. He emptied his pockets, filling Albus's and Lily's hands with sweets. He pulled the voodoo doll out last and looked at it a bit uncertainly. What in the world is that, James? Ginny said, embracing him and then looking at the object in her son's hands. It looks like, well, you. James's face broke into a grin. "'It's for you, Mum. I thought you'd like to keep it when I went off to school next year. You know, to remember me by.' Ginny looked at it quizzically and then glanced up at Harry. He shrugged and smiled. "'Well, it's a bit odd, but all right,' she said, taking the doll from him. "'If I hug it, will you feel it?' James shrugged, affecting disinterest as the family began to make their way into the main terminal. I don't know, whatever. It's, you know, worth a try, I suppose. Ginny nodded, smiling, and throwing a glance at Harry, she gave it a try. You have been listening to James Potter and the Hall of Elders Crossing by G. Norman Lippert. It was read by Justin Sargent and recorded and produced by Matt Brown. James Potter and the Hall of Elders Crossing is based upon the characters and worlds of J.K. Rowling and is copyright 2007 by G. Norman Lippert. J.K. Rowling and Warner Brothers were not involved with this production, but subject to limitations, had no objection to its release. This recording is copyright 2014 by Living Audio CIC. All rights reserved.
Music production by Isaias Garcia.